Rackety Packety House, Part 1. Now this is the story about the doll family I liked and the doll family I didn't. When you read it, you are to remember something I am going to tell you. This is it. If you think dolls never do anything you don't see them do, you are very much mistaken. When people are not looking at them, they can do anything they choose. They can dance and sing and play on the piano and have all sorts of fun. But they can only move about and talk when people turn their backs and are not looking. If anyone looks, they just stop. Fairies know this, and of course fairies visit in all the dolls' houses where the dolls are agreeable. They will not associate, though, with dolls who are not nice. They never call or leave their cards at a doll's house where the dolls are proud or bad-tempered. They are very particular. If you are conceited or ill-tempered yourself, you will never know a fairy as long as you live. Queen Crosspatch Rackety Packety House Rackety Packety House was in a corner of Cynthia's nursery, and it was not in the best corner either. It was in the corner behind the door, and that was not at all a fashionable neighborhood. Rackety Packety House had been pushed there to be out of the way when Tidy Castle was brought in on Cynthia's birthday. As soon as she saw Tidy Castle, Cynthia did not care for Rackety Packety House, and indeed was quite ashamed of it. She thought the corner behind the door quite good enough for such a shabby old doll's house, when there was the beautiful big new one built like a castle, and furnished with the most elegant chairs and tables and carpets and curtains and ornaments and pictures and beds and baths and lamps and bookcases, and with a knocker on the front door and a stable with a pony cart in it at the back. The minute she saw it, she called out, Oh, what a beautiful doll castle! What shall we do with that untidy old rackety packety house now? It is too shabby and old-fashioned to stand near it. In fact, that was the way in which the old doll's house got its name. It had always been called the doll's house before, but after that it was pushed into the unfashionable neighborhood behind the door, and ever afterwards, when it was spoken of at all, it was just called Rackety Packety House, and nothing else. Of course, Tidy Castle was grand, and Tidy Castle was new and had all the modern improvements in it, and Rackety Packety House was as old-fashioned as it could be. It had belonged to Cynthia's grandmamma, and had been made in the days when Queen Victoria was a little girl, and then there was no electricity, even in princesses' dollhouses. Cynthia's grandmamma had kept it very neat, because she had been a good housekeeper even when she was seven years old. But Cynthia was not a good housekeeper, and she did not recover the furniture when it got dingy, or repaper the walls, or mend the carpets and bedclothes, and she never thought of such a thing as making new clothes for the doll family. So, of course, their early Victorian frocks and capes and bonnets grew in time to be too shabby for words. You see, when Queen Victoria was a little girl, dolls wore queer frocks and long pantalettes, and boy dolls wore funny frilled trousers and coats which would almost make you laugh to look at. But the Rackety Packety House family had known better days. I and my fairies had known them when they were quite new, and had been a birthday present, just as Tidy Castle was when Cynthia turned eight years old and there was as much fuss about them when their house arrived as Cynthia made when she saw Tidy Castle. Cynthia's grandmamma had danced about and clapped her hands with delight, and she had scrambled down upon her knees and taken the dolls out one by one and thought their clothes beautiful, and she had given each of them a grand name. This one shall be Amelia, she said, and this one is Charlotte, and this one is Victoria Leopoldina, and this one is Aurelia Matilda, and this one shall be Leontine, and this one Clotilda, and these boys shall be Augustus, and Rowland, and Vincent, and Charles Edward Stuart. For a long time they led a very gay and fashionable life. They had parties and balls, and were presented at court, and went to royal christenings and weddings, and were married themselves, and had families, and scarlet fever, and whooping cough, and funerals, and every luxury. But that was long, long ago, and now all was changed. Their house had grown shabbier and shabbier, and their clothes had grown simply awful, and Aurelia Matilda and Victoria Lipoldina had been broken into bits and thrown into the dustbin, and Leontine, who had really been the beauty of the family, had been dragged out on the hearth rug one night and had nearly all her paint licked off and a leg chewed up by a Newfoundland puppy, so that she was a sight to behold. As for the boys, Rowland and Vincent had quite disappeared, and Charlotte and Amelia always believed they had run away to seek their fortunes because things were in such a state at home. So the only ones left were Clotilda and Amelia and Charlotte and poor Leontine and Augustus and Charles Edward Stuart. Even they had their names changed. After Leontine had her paint licked off so that her head had white bald spots on it and she had scarcely any features, a boy cousin of Cynthia's had put a bright red spot on each cheek and painted her turned-up nose and round saucer-blue eyes, 
and a comical mouth. He and Cynthia had called her ridiculous instead of Leontine, and she had been called that ever since. All the dolls were jointed Dutch dolls, so it was easy to paint any kind of features on them and stick out their arms and legs in any way you liked, and Leontine did look funny after Cynthia's cousin had finished. She certainly was not a beauty, but her turned-up nose and her round eyes and funny mouth always seemed to be laughing, so she really was the most good-natured-looking creature you ever saw. Charlotte and Amelia, Cynthia called Meg and Peg, and Clotilda she called Kilmanskeg, and Augustus she called Gustavus, and Charles Edward Stuart was nothing but Peter Piper. So that was the end of their grand names. The truth was, they went through all sorts of things, and if they had not been such a jolly lot of dolls, they might have all had fits and appendicitis and died of grief. But not a bit of it. If you will believe it, they got fun out of everything. They used to just scream with laughter over the new names, and they laughed so much over them that they got quite fond of them. When Meg's pink silk flounces were torn, she pinned them up and didn't mind in the least. And when Peg's lace mantilla was played with by a kitten and brought back to her in rags and tatters, she just put a few stitches in it and put it on again. And when Peter Piper lost almost the whole leg of one of his trousers, he just laughed and said it made it easier for him to kick about and turn somersaults, and he wished the other leg would tear off, too. You never saw a family have such fun. They could make up stories and pretend things and invent games out of nothing. And my fairies were so fond of them that I couldn't keep them away from the doll's house. They would go and have fun with Meg and Peg and Gilman's Keg, and Gustavus and Peter Piper, even when I had work for them to do in Fairyland. But there I was so fond of that shabby, disrespectable family myself that I never would scold much about them, and often I went to see them. That is how I know so much about them. They were so fond of each other, and so good-natured, and always in such spirits, that everybody who knew them was fond of them. And it was really only Cynthia who didn't know them and thought them only a lot of old, disreputable-looking Dutch dolls, and Dutch dolls were really quite out of fashion. The truth was that Cynthia was not a particularly nice little girl, and did not care much for anything unless it was quite new. But the kitten who had torn the lace mantilla got to know the family and simply loved them all, and the Newfoundland puppy was so sorry about Leontine's paint and her left leg that he could never do enough to make it up. He wanted to marry Leontine as soon as he grew old enough to wear a collar, but Leontine said she would never desert her family, because now that she wasn't the beauty any more, she became the useful one, and did all the kitchen work, and sat up and made poultices and beef tea when any of the rest were ill. And the Newfoundland puppy saw she was right, for the whole family simply adored Ridiculous, and could not possibly have done without her. Meg and Peg and Kilman's gang could have married any minute if they had liked. There were two cock sparrows and a gentleman mouse who proposed to them over and over again. They all three said they did not want fashionable wives, but cheerful dispositions and a happy home. But Meg and Peg were like Ridiculous, and could not bear to leave their families, besides not wanting to live in nests and hatch eggs. And Kilmanskeg said she would die of a broken heart if she couldn't be with Ridiculous, and Ridiculous did not like cheese and crumbs and mousy things, so they could never live together in a mouse hole. But neither the gentleman mouse nor the sparrows were offended, because the news was broken to them so sweetly, and they went on visiting just as before. Everything was as shabby and disrespectable and as gay and as happy as it could be, until Tidy Castle was brought into the nursery, and then the whole family had rather a fright. It happened in this way. When the doll's house was lifted by the nurse and carried into the corner behind the door, of course it was rather an exciting and shaky thing for Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg and Gustavus and Peter Piper. Ridiculous was out shopping. The furniture tumbled about and everybody had to hold on to anything they could catch hold of. As it was, Kilmanskeg slid under a table and Peter Piper sat down in the coal box, but notwithstanding all this they did not lose their tempers, and when the nurse sat down their house on the floor with a bump, they all got up and began to laugh. Then they ran and peeped out of the windows, and then they ran back and laughed again. Well, said Peter Piper, we have been called Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg and Gustavus and Peter Piper instead of our grand names, and now we live in a place called Rackety Packety House. Who cares? Let's join hands and have a dance. And they joined hands and danced round and round and kicked up their heels, and their rags and tatters flew about them, and they laughed until they fell down, one on top of the other. It was just at this minute that Ridiculous came back. The nurse had found her under a chair and stuck her in through a window. She sat on the drawing-room sofa, which had holes in its covering, and the stuffing coming out, and her one whole leg stuck out straight in front of her, and her bonnet and shawl were on one side, and her basket was on her left arm, full of things she had got cheap at market. She was out of breath, and rather pale, through being lifted up and swished through the air so suddenly, but her saucer eyes and her funny mouth looked as cheerful as ever. "'Good gracious! If you knew what I had just heard!' she said. They all scrambled up and called out together, "'Hello! What is it?' 
The nurse said the most awful thing, she answered them. When Cynthia asked what we should do with Rackety Packety House, she said, Oh, I'll put it behind the door for the present, and then it shall be carried downstairs and burned. It's too disgraceful to keep in any decent nursery. Oh, cried Peter Piper. Oh, said Gustavus. Oh, 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 said Meg and Peg and Kilman Skegg. Will they burn our dear old shabby house? Do you think they will? And actual tears began to run down their cheeks. Peter Piper sat down on the floor all at once, with his hands stuffed in his pockets. I don't care how shabby it is, he said. It's a jolly nice old place, and it's the only house we've ever had. I don't want to have any other, said Meg. Gustavus leaned against the wall, with his hands stuffed in his pockets. I wouldn't move if I was made King of England, he said. Buckingham Palace wouldn't be half as nice. We've had such fun here, said Peg. And Kilmanskeg shook her head from side to side and wiped her eyes on her ragged pocket handkerchief. There is no knowing what would have happened to them if Peter Piper hadn't cheered up, as he always did. I say, he said, do you hear that noise? They all listened and heard a rumbling. Peter Piper ran to the window and looked out and then ran back again, grinning. It's the nurse rolling up the armchair before the house to hide it, so that it won't disgrace the castle. Hooray! Hooray! If they don't see us, they will forget all about us, and we shall not be burned up at all. Our nice old rackety-packety house will be left alone, and we can enjoy ourselves more than ever, because we shan't be bothered with Cynthia. Hello! Let's all join hands and have a dance. So they all joined hands and danced round in a ring again, and they were so relieved that they laughed and laughed until they all tumbled down in a heap, just as they had done before, and rolled about giggling and squealing. It certainly seemed as if they were quite safe, for some time at least. The big easy chair hid them, and both the nurse and Cynthia seemed to forget that there was such a thing as a rackety-packety house in the neighborhood. Cynthia was so delighted with Tidy Castle that she played with nothing else for days and days. And instead of being jealous of their grand neighbors, the rackety-packety house people began to get all sorts of fun out of watching them from their own windows. Several of their windows were broken, and some had rags and paper stuffed inside the broken panes. But Meg and Peg and Peter Piper would go and peep out of one, and Gustavus and Kilmanskeg would peep out of the other, and Ridiculous could hardly get her dishes washed and her potatoes pared because she could see the castle kitchen from her scullery window. It was so exciting! The castle dolls were grand beyond words, and they were all lords and ladies. These were their names. There was Lady Gwendolen Vere de Vere. She was haughty and had dark eyes and hair and carried her head thrown back and her nose in the air. There was Lady Muriel Vere de Vere, and she was cold and lovely and indifferent and looked down the bridge of her delicate nose. And there was Lady Doris, who had fluffy golden hair and laughed mockingly at everyone. And there was Lord Hubert and Lord Rupert and Lord Francis, who were all handsome enough to make you feel as if you could faint. And there was their mother, the Duchess of Tidyshire. And, of course, there were all sorts of maids and footmen and cooks and scullery maids and even gardeners. We never thought of living to see such grand society, said Peter Piper to his brother and sisters. It's quite a kind of blessing. It's almost like being grand ourselves, just to be able to watch them, said Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg, squeezing together and flattening their noses against the attic windows. They could see bits of the sumptuous white and gold drawing room with the Duchess sitting near the fire, her golden glasses upon her nose, and Lady Gwendolen playing haughtily upon the harp, and Lady Muriel coldly listening to her. Lady Doris was having her golden hair dressed by her maid in her bedroom, and Lord Hubert was reading the newspaper with a high-bred air, while Lord Francis was writing letters to noblemen of his acquaintance, and Lord Rupert was, in an aristocratic manner, glancing over his love letters from ladies of Rackety Packety House, Part Two. Kilman Skegg and Peter Piper just pinched each other with glee and squealed with delight. Isn't it fun? said Peter Piper. I say, aren't they awful swells? But Lord Francis can't kick about in his trousers as I can in mine, and neither can the others. I'd like to see them try to do this. And he turned three somersaults in the middle of the room and stood on his head on the biggest hole in the carpet and wiggled his legs and wiggled his toes at them until they shouted so with laughing that Ridiculous ran in with a saucepan in her hand and perspiration on her forehead because she was cooking turnips, which was all they had for dinner. "'You mustn't laugh so loud,' she cried out. "'If we make so much noise, the Tidy Castle people will begin complaining of this being a low neighborhood, and they might insist on moving away.' "'Oh, scrump!' said Peter Piper, who sometimes invented dull slang, though there wasn't really a bit of harm in him. I wouldn't have them move away for anything. They are meat and drink to me. They're going to have a dinner of ten courses, sighed Ridiculous. I can see them cooking it from my scullery window. And I have nothing but turnips to give you. 
"'Who cares?' said Peter Piper. "'Let's have ten courses of turnips and pretend each course is exactly like the one they're having at the castle.' "'I like turnips almost better than anything. "'Almost, perhaps not quite,' said Gustavus. "'I can eat ten courses of turnips like a shot.' "'Let's go and find out what their courses are,' said Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg, "'and then we will write a menu on a piece of pink tissue paper.' "'And if you'll believe it, that was what they did. "'They divided their turnips into ten courses, "'and they called the first hors d'oeuvres and the last ices with a French name, "'and Peter Piper kept jumping up from the table "'and pretending he was a footman "'and flourishing about in his flapping rags of trousers "'and announcing the names of the dishes in such a grand way "'that they laughed till they nearly died "'and said they had never had such a splendid dinner in their lives "'and they would rather live behind the door "'and watch the Tidy Castle people "'than be the Tidy Castle people themselves.' And then, of course, they all joined hands and danced round and round and kicked up their heels for joy, because they always did that whenever there was the least excuse for it, and quite often when there wasn't any at all, just because it was such good exercise and worked off their high spirits, so that they could settle down for a while. This was the way things went on after that day. They almost lived at their windows. They watched the tidy castle family get up and be dressed by their maids and valets in different clothes almost every day. They saw them drive out in their carriages and have parties and go to balls. They all nearly had brain fever with delight the day they watched Lady Gwendolen and Lady Muriel and Lady Doris, dressed in their court trains and feathers, going to be presented at the first drawing-room. After the lovely creatures had gone, the whole family sat down in a circle round the rackety-packety house library fire, and Ridiculous read aloud to them about drawing-rooms, out of a scrap of the lady's pictorial she had found. And after that, they had a court drawing-room of their own, and they made tissue-paper trains and glass bead crowns of diamond tiaras, and sometimes Gustavus pretended to be the royal family, and the others were presented to him and kissed his hand, and then the others took turns and he was presented. And suddenly the most delightful thing occurred to Peter Piper. He thought it would be rather nice to make them all into lords and ladies, and he did it by touching them on the shoulder with the drawing-room poker, which he had straightened because it was so crooked it was almost meant double. It was not exactly the way such things are done at court, but Peter Piper thought it would do, and at any rate it was great fun. So he made them all kneel down in a row, and he touched each on the shoulder with the poker and said, Rise up, Lady Meg and Lady Peg and Lady Kilmanskeg and Lady Ridiculous of Rackety Packety House, and also the Right Honourable Lord Gustavus Rags. And they all jumped up at once and made bows and curtsied to each other. But they made Peter Piper into a duke, and he was called the Duke of Tags. He knelt down on the big hole in the carpet, and each one of them gave him a little thump on the shoulder with the poker, because it took more thumps to make a duke than a common or garden lord. The day after this, another much more exciting event took place. The nurse was in a bad temper, and when she was tidying the nursery, she pushed the easy chair aside and saw Rackety Packety House. Oh, she said, there is that Rackety Packety old thing still. I had forgotten it. It must be carried downstairs and burned. I will go and tell one of the footmen to come for it. Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg were in their attic, and they all rushed out in such a hurry to get downstairs that they rolled all the way down the staircase, and Peter Piper and Gustavus had to dart out of the drawing-room and pick them up. Ridiculous came staggering up from the kitchen quite out of breath. "'Oh, our house is going to be burned! Our house is going to be burned!' cried Meg and Peg, clutching their brothers. "'Let's go and throw ourselves out of the window!' cried Kilmanskeg. "'I don't see how they can have the heart to burn a person's home,' said Ridiculous, wiping her eyes with her kitchen duster. Peter Piper was rather pale, but he was extremely brave, and remembered that he was the head of the family. "'Now, Lady Meg and Lady Peg and Lady Kilmanskeg,' he said, "'let's all keep cool.' "'We shan't keep cool when they set our house on fire,' said Gustavus. Peter Piper just snapped his fingers. "Pooh," he said, "'we're only made of wood, and it won't hurt a bit. We shall just snap and crackle and go off almost like fireworks, and then we shall be ashes and fly away into the air and see all sorts of things. Perhaps it may be more fun than anything we have done yet.' "'But our nice old house! Our nice old rackety-packety house!' said Ridiculous. "'I do so love it. The kitchen is so convenient, even though the oven won't bake any more.' And things looked most serious, because the nurse was really beginning to push the armchair away. But it would not move, and I will tell you why. One of my fairies, who had come down the chimney when they were talking, had called me, and I had come in a second with a whole army of my workers, and though the nurse couldn't see them, they were all holding the chair tight down on the carpet so that it would not stir. And I, Queen Crosspatch myself, flew downstairs and made the footman remember that minute that a box had come for Cynthia, and that he must take it upstairs to her nursery. If I had not been on the spot he would have forgotten it, until it was too late. But just in the very nick of time up he came, and Cynthia sprang up as soon as she saw him. 
Oh, she cried, it must be the doll who broke her little leg and was sent to the hospital. It must be Lady Patsy. And she opened the box and gave a little scream of joy, for there lay Lady Patsy, her whole name was Patricia, in a lace-frilled nightgown with her lovely leg in bandages and a pair of tiny crutches and a trained nurse by her side. That was how I saved them that time. There was such excitement over Lady Patsy and her little crutches and her nurse that nothing else was thought of, and my fairies pushed the armchair back, and Rackety Packety House was hidden and forgotten once more. The whole Rackety Packety family gave a great gasp of joy and sat down in a ring all at once on the floor, mopping their foreheads with anything they could get hold of. Peter Piper used an antimacassar. Oh, we are obliged to you, Queen C Cross Patch, he panted out. But these alarms, a fire her upsetting. You leave them to me, I said, and I'll attend to them. Tip, I commanded the fairy nearest me. You will have to stay here and be ready to give the alarm when anything threatens to happen. And I flew away, feeling I had done a good morning's work. Well, that was the beginning of a great many things, and many of them were connected with Lady Patsy, and but for me there might have been unpleasantness. Of course, the rackety-packety dolls forgot about their fright directly, and began to enjoy themselves again as usual. That was their way. They never sat up all night with trouble, Peter Piper used to say. And I told him they were quite right. If you make a fuss over trouble, and put it to bed, and nurse it, and give it beef tea and gruel, you can never get rid of it. Their great delight now was Lady Patsy. They thought she was prettier than any of the other Tidy Castle dolls. She neither turned her nose up, nor looked down the bridge of it, nor laughed mockingly. She had dimples in the corner of her mouth, and long curly lashes, and her nose was saucy, and her eyes were bright and full of laughs. She's the clever one of the family, said Peter Piper. I'm sure of that. She was treated as an invalid at first, of course, and kept in her room, but they could see her sitting up in her frilled nightgown. After a few days, she was carried to a soft chair by the window, and there she used to sit and look out, and the rackety-packety dolls crowded round their window and adored her. After a few days, they noticed that Peter Piper was often missing, and one morning Ridiculous went up into the attic and found him sitting at a window all by himself and staring and staring. "'Oh, Duke,' she said. You see, they always tried to remember each other's titles. "'Dear me, Duke, what are you doing here?' "'I'm looking at her,' he answered. "'I'm in love.' I fell in love with her the minute Cynthia took her out of her box. I'm going to marry her. But she's a lady of high degree, said Ridiculous, quite alarmed. That's why she'll have me, said Peter Piper in his most cheerful manner. Ladies of high degree always marry the good-looking ones in rags and tatters. If I had a whole suit of clothes on, she wouldn't look at me. I'm very good-looking, you know. And he turned round and winked at Ridiculous in such a delightful saucy way that she suddenly felt as if he were very good-looking, though she had never thought of it before. Hello, he said all at once. I've just thought of something to attract her attention. Where's the ball of string? Cynthia's kitten had made them a present of a ball of string, which had been most useful. Ridiculous ran and got it, and all the others came upstairs to see what Peter Piper was going to do. They were all delighted to hear he had fallen in love with the lovely, funny Lady Patsy. They found him standing in the middle of the attic, unrolling the ball of string. What are you going to do, Duke? they all shouted. "'Just you watch,' he said, and he began to make the string into a rope ladder, as fast as lightning. When he had finished it, he fastened one end to a beam and swung the other end out of the window. "'From her window,' he said, "'she can see the rackety-packety house, and I'll tell you something. She's always looking at it. She watches us as much as we watch her, and I've seen her giggling and giggling when we were having fun. Yesterday, when I chased Lady Meg and Lady Peg and Lady Kilmanskeg round and round the front of the house and turned somersaults every five steps, she laughed until she got to stuff her handkerchief into her mouth. When we joined hands and danced and laughed until we fell in heaps, I thought she was going to have a kind of rosy, dimpled, lovely little fit. She giggled so. If I run down the side of the house on this rope ladder, it will attract her attention, and then I shall begin to do things. He ran down the ladder, and that very minute they saw Lady Patsy at her window give a start and lean forward to look. They all crowded round their window and chuckled and chuckled as they watched him. He turned three stately somersaults and stood on his feet and made a cheerful bow. The rackety packety saw Lady Patsy begin to giggle that minute. Then he took an antimacassar out of his pocket and fastened it round the edge of his torn trouser leg as if it were lace trimming and began to walk about like a duke with his arms folded over his chest and his ragged old hat cocked on one side over his ear. Then the rackety packety saw Lady Patsy begin to laugh. Then Peter Piper stood on his head and kissed his hand, and Lady Patsy covered her face and rocked backwards and forwards in her chair, laughing and laughing. Then he struck an attitude with his tattered leg put forward gracefully, and he pretended he had a guitar, and he sang right up at her window. 
From rackety packety house I come, it stands, dear lady, in a slum, a low, low slum behind the door, the stout armchair is placed before, just take a look at it, my lady. The house itself is a perfect sight, and everybody's dressed like a perfect fright, but no one cares a single jot, and each one giggles over his lot, and as for me, I'm in love with you. I can't make up another verse, and if I did, it would be worse. But I could stand and sing all day if I could think of things to say. But the fact is, I just wanted to make you look at me. And then he danced such a lively jig that his rags and tatters flew about him. And then he made another bow and kissed his hand again and ran up the ladder like a flash and jumped into the attic. After that, Lady Patsy sat at her window all the time and would not let the trained nurse put her to bed at all and Lady Gwendolen and Lady Muriel and Lady Doris could not understand it. Once Lady Gwendolen said haughtily and disdainfully and scornfully and scathingly, "'If you sit there so much, those low rackety-packety house people will think you are looking at them!' "'I am,' said Lady Patsy, showing all her dimples at once. "'They are such fun!' And Lady Gwendolen swooned haughtily away, and the trained nurse could scarcely restore her. When the castle dolls drove out or walked in their garden, the instant they caught sight of one of the rackety packeties, they turned up their noses and sniffed aloud, and several times the Duchess said she would remove, because the neighborhood was absolutely low. They all scorned the rackety packeties. They just scorned them. One moonlight night, Lady Patsy was sitting at her window, and she heard a whistle in the garden. When she peeped out carefully, there stood Peter Piper waving his ragged cap at her, and he had his rope ladder under his arm. Hello, he whispered as loud as he could. Could you catch a bit of rope if I threw it up to you? Yes, she whispered back. Then catch this, he whispered again, and he threw up the end of a string, and she caught it in the first throw. It was fastened to the rope ladder. Now pull, he said. She pulled and pulled until the rope ladder reached her window, and then she fastened it to a hook that ran under the sill, and the first thing that happened, just like lightning, was that Peter Piper ran up the ladder and leaned over her window ledge. Will you marry me, he said. I haven't anything to give you to eat, and I'm as ragged as a scarecrow, but will you? Rackety Packety House Part 3 She clapped her little hands. I eat very little, she said, and I would do without anything at all if I could only live in your funny old shabby house. It is a ridiculous tumble-down old barn, isn't it? he said, but every one of us is as nice as we can be. We are perfect Turkish delights. It's laughing that does it. Would you like to come down the ladder and see what a jolly shabby old hole the place is? Oh, do take me, said Lady Patsy. So he helped her down the ladder and took her under the armchair and into Rackety Packety House. And Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg and Ridiculous and Gustavus all crowded round her and gave little screams of joy at the sight of her. They were afraid to kiss her at first, even though she was engaged to Peter Piper. She was so pretty, and her frock had so much lace on it that they were afraid their old rags might spoil her. But she did not care about her lace, and flew at them and kissed and hugged them, every one. "'I have so wanted to come here,' she said. "'It's so dull at the castle I had to break my leg just to get a change. The Duchess sits reading near the fire with her gold eyeglasses on her nose, and Lady Gwendolen plays haughtily on the harp, and Lady Muriel coldly listens to her, and Lady Doris is always laughing mockingly, and Lord Hubert reads the newspaper with a high-bred air, and Lord Francis writes letters to noblemen of his acquaintance, and Lord Rupert glances over his love letters from ladies of title in an aristocratic manner until I could scream. Just to see you dears dancing about in your rags and tatters and laughing and inventing games as if you didn't mind anything, such a relief. She nearly laughed her little curly head off when they went all round the house with her, and Peter Piper showed her the holes in the carpet and the stuffing coming out of the sofas, and the feathers out of the beds, and the legs tumbling off the chairs. She had never seen anything like it before. At the castle nothing is funny at all, she said, and nothing ever sticks out or hangs down or tumbles off. It's so plain and new. "'But I think we ought to tell her, Duke,' Ridiculous said. "'We may have our house burned over our heads any day.' She really stopped laughing for a whole minute when she heard that, but she was rather like Peter Piper in disposition, and she said almost immediately, "'Oh, they'll never do it. They've forgotten you.' And Peter Piper said, "'Don't let's think of it. Let's all join hands and dance round and round and kick up our heels and laugh as hard as ever we can.' And they did, and Lady Patsy laughed harder than anyone else. After that she was always stealing away from Tidy Castle and coming in and having fun. Sometimes she stayed all night and slept with Meg and Peg, and everybody invented new games and stories, and they really never went to bed until daylight. 
but the castle dolls grew more and more scornful every day and tossed their heads higher and higher and sniffed louder and louder until it sounded as if they all had influenza they never lost an opportunity of saying disdainful things and once the duchess wrote a letter to cynthia saying that she insisted on removing to a decent neighborhood she laid the letter in her desk but the gentleman mouse came in the night and carried it away so cynthia never saw it and i don't believe she could have read it if she had seen it because the duchess wrote very badly even for a doll and then what do you suppose happened one morning cynthia began to play that all the tidy castle dolls had scarlet fever she said it had broken out in the night and she undressed them all and put them into bed and gave them medicine she could not find lady patsy so she escaped the contagion the truth was that Lady Patsy had stayed all night at Rackety Packety House, where they were giving an imitation court ball with Peter Piper in a tin crown and shavings for supper, because they had nothing else, and in fact the gentleman mouse had brought the shavings from his nest as a present. Cynthia played nearly all day, and the Duchess and Lady Gwendolen and Lady Muriel and Lady Doris and Lord Hubert and Lord Francis and Lord Rupert got worse and worse. By evening they were all raging in delirium, and Lord Francis and Lady Gwendolen had strong mustard plasters on their chests and right in the middle of their agony cynthia suddenly got up and went away and left them to their fate just as if it didn't matter in the least well in the middle of the night meg and peg and lady patsy wakened all at once do you hear a noise said meg lifting her head from her ragged old pillow yes i do said peg sitting up and holding her ragged blanket up to her chin lady patsy jumped up with feathers sticking up all over her hair because they had come out of the holes in the ragged old bed she ran to the window and listened oh meg and peg she cried out it comes from the castle cynthia has left them all raving in delirium and they are all shouting and groaning and screaming meg and peg jumped up too let's go and call kilmanskeg and ridiculous and gustavus and peter piper they said and they rushed down the staircase and met kilmanskeg and ridiculous and gustavus and peter piper coming scrambling up panting because the noise had wakened them as well they were all over at tidy castle in a minute they just tumbled over each other to get there the kind-hearted things the servants were every one fast asleep, though the noise was awful. The loudest groans came from Lady Gwendolen and Lord Francis, because their mustard plasters were blistering them frightfully. Ridiculous took charge, because she was the one who knew most about illness. She sent Gustavus to waken the servants, and then ordered hot water and cold water and ice and brandy and poultices, and shook the trained nurse for not attending to her business, and took off the mustard plasters, and gave gruel and broth and cough syrup and castor oil and ipecacuanha and every one of the rackety packeties massaged and soothed and patted and put wet cloths on heads until the fever was gone and the castle dolls all lay back on their pillows pale and weak but smiling faintly at every rackety packety they saw instead of turning up their noses and tossing their heads and sniffing loudly and just scorning them lady gwendolen spoke first and instead of being haughty and disdainful she was as humble as a newborn kitten oh you dear shabby disrespectable darling things she said never never will i scorn you again never never that's right said peter piper in his cheerful rather slangy way you take my tip never scorn anyone again it's a mistake just watch me stand on my head it'll cheer you up and he turned six somersaults just like lightning and stood on his head and wiggled his ragged legs at them until suddenly they heard a snort from one of the beds and it was lord hubert beginning to laugh and then Lord Francis laughed, and then Lord Hubert shouted, and then Lady Doris squealed, and Lady Muriel screamed, and Lady Gwendolen and the Duchess rolled over and over in their beds, laughing as if they would have fits. "'Oh, you delightful, funny, shabby old loves,' Lady Gwendolen kept saying, "'to think that we scorned you!' "'They'll be all right after this,' said Peter Piper. "'There's nothing cures scarlet fever like cheering up. Let's all join hands and dance round and round once for them before we go back to bed.' It'll throw them into a nice light perspiration, and they'll drop off and sleep like tops. And they did it, and before they had finished, the whole lot of them were perspiring gently and snoring as softly as lambs. When they went back to Rackety Packety House, they talked a good deal about Cynthia, and wondered and wondered why she had left her scarlet fever so suddenly. And at last, Ridiculous made up her mind to tell them something she had heard. The Duchess told me, she said rather slowly because it was bad news, the Duchess said that Cynthia went away because her mamma had sent for her, and her mamma had sent for her to tell her that a little girl princess is coming to see her tomorrow. Cynthia's mamma used to be a maid of honor to the queen, and that's why the little girl princess is coming. The Duchess said, and here Ridiculous spoke very slowly indeed, that the nurse was so excited she said she didn't know whether she stood on her head or on her heels, and she must tidy up the nursery and have that rackety-packety old doll's house carried downstairs and burned early tomorrow morning, 
That's what the Duchess said. Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg clutched at their hearts and gasped. And Gustavus groaned, and Lady Patsy caught Peter Piper by the arm to keep him from falling. Peter Piper gulped, and then he had a sudden cheerful thought. Perhaps she was raving in delirium, he said. No, she wasn't, said Ridiculous, shaking her head. I had just given her hot water, and cold, and gruel, and broth, and castor oil, and I peck a kuana, and put ice almost all over her. She was as sensible as any of us. Tomorrow morning we shall not have any house over our heads. And she put her ragged old apron over her face and cried. If she wasn't raving in delirium, said Peter Piper, we shall not have any heads. You had better go back to the castle tonight, Patsy. Rackety Packety House is no place for you. Then Lady Patsy drew herself up so straight that she nearly fell over backwards. I will never leave you, she said, and Peter Piper couldn't make her. You can just imagine what a doleful night it was. They went all over the house together and looked at every hole in the carpet and every piece of stuffing sticking out of the dear old shabby sofas and every broken window and chair leg and table and ragged blanket, and the tears ran down their faces for the first times in their lives. About six o'clock in the morning, Peter Piper made a last effort. Let's all join hands in a circle, he said quite faintly, and dance round and round once more. But it was no use. When they joined hands, they could not dance, and when they found that they could not dance, they all tumbled down in a heap and cried instead of laughing, and Lady Patsy lay with her arms round Peter Piper's neck. Now here is where I come in again, Queen Crosspatch, who is telling you this story. I always come in just at the nick of time, when people like the rackety packeties are in trouble. I walk in at seven o'clock. Get up off the floor, I said to them all, and they got up and stared at me. They actually thought I did not know what had happened. A little girl princess is coming this morning, said Peter Piper, and our house is going to be burned over our heads. This is the end of Rackety Packety House. No, it isn't, I said. You leave this to me. I told the princess to come, though she doesn't know it in the least. A whole army of my working fairies began to swarm in at the nursery window. The nurse was working very hard to put things in order, and she had not sense enough to see fairies at all. So she did not see mine, though there were hundreds of them. As soon as she made one corner tidy, they ran after her and made it untidy, they held her back by her dress and hung and swung on her apron until she could scarcely move and kept wondering why she was so slow. She could not make the nursery tidy, and she was so flurried she forgot all about Rackety Packety House again, especially as my working fairies pushed the armchair close up to it so it was quite hidden. And there it was when the little girl princess came with her ladies in waiting. My fairies had only just allowed the nurse to finish the nursery. Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg and Ridiculous and Gustavus and Peter Piper and Lady Patsy were all huddled up together, looking out one window. They could not bear to be parted. I sat on the arm of the big chair and ordered my working fairies to stand ready to obey me the instant I spoke. The princess was a nice child and very polite to Cynthia when she showed her all her dolls, and last but not least, Tidy Castle itself. She looked at all the rooms and the furniture and said polite and admiring things about each of them. But Cynthia realized she was not so much interested in it as she had thought she would be. The fact was that the princess had so many grand dolls' houses in her palace that Tidy Castle did not surprise her at all. It was just when Cynthia was finding this out that I gave the order to my working fairies. Push the armchair away, I commanded, and very slowly, so that no one will know it is being moved. So they moved it away, very, very slowly, and no one saw that it had stirred. But the next minute the little girl princess gave a delightful start. Oh! "'What is that?' she cried, hurrying towards the unfashionable neighborhood behind the door. Cynthia blushed all over, and the nurse actually turned pale. The rackety-packeties tumbled down in a heap beneath their window, and began to say their prayers very fast. "'It's only a shabby old doll's house, your highness,' Cynthia stammered out. "'It belonged to my grandmamma, and it ought not to be in the nursery. I thought you had had it burned, nurse.' "'Burned?' the little girl princess cried out in the most shocked way. "'Why?' If it was mine, I wouldn't have it burned for worlds. Oh, please push the chair away, and let me look at it. There are no doll's houses like it anywhere in these days. And when the armchair was pushed aside, she scrambled down on her knees, just as if she were not a little girl princess at all. Oh, 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 she said, how funny and dear. What a darling old doll's house. It is shabby and once mending, of course, but it's almost exactly like one my grandmamma had. She kept it among her treasures and only let me look at it as a great, great treat. Cynthia gave a gasp, for the little girl princess's grandmamma had been the queen, and people had knelt down and kissed her hand and been obliged to go out of the room backwards before her. The little girl princess was simply filled with joy. She picked up Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg and Gustavus and Peter Piper as if they had really been a queen's dolls. Oh, the darling dears, she said. Just look at their nice queer faces and their funny clothes. Just, 
just like Grandmamma's dolly's clothes. Only these poor things do want new ones so. Oh, how I should like to dress them again, just as they used to be dressed, and have the whole house all made up, just as it used to be when it was new. That old rackety packety house, said Cynthia, losing her breath. If it were mine, I should make it just like Grandmamma's, and I should love it more than any other doll's house I had. I never, never, never saw anything as nice and laughing and good-natured as these dolls' faces. They look as if they had been having fun ever since they were born. Oh, if you burn them in their home, I could never forgive you. I, I never will, your highness, stammered Cynthia, quite overwhelmed. Suddenly she started forward. Why, there is the lost doll, she cried out. There is Lady Patsy. How did she get back into Rackety Packety House? Perhaps you went there to see them because they were so poor and shabby said the little girl princess. Perhaps she likes this one, and she pointed to Peter Piper. Do you know when I picked him up their arms were about each other? Please let her stay with him. Oh, she cried out the next instant, and jumped a little. I felt as if the boy one was kicking his leg. And it was actually true, because Peter Piper could not help it, and he had kicked out his ragged leg for joy. He had to be very careful not to kick any more when he heard what happened next. As the princess liked Rackety Packety House so much, Cynthia gave it to her for a present and the princess was really happy, and before she went away she made a little speech to the whole rackety-packety family, whom she had set all in a row in the ragged old dear old shabby old drawing-room, where they had had so much fun. "'You are going to come and live with me, funny good-natured loves,' she said, "'and you shall all be dressed beautifully again, and your house shall be mended and papered and painted and made as lovely as ever it was, and I'm going to like you better than all my other dolls' houses, just as Grandmamma said she liked hers.' And then she was gone." and every bit of it came true. Rackety Packety House was carried to a splendid nursery in a palace, and Meg and Peg and Kilmanskeg and Ridiculous and Gustavus and Peter Piper were made so gorgeous that if they had not been so nice they would have grown proud. But they didn't. They only grew jollier and jollier, and Peter Piper married Lady Patsy, and Ridiculous's left leg was mended, and she was painted into a beauty again, but she always remained the useful one. And the dolls in the other dolls' houses used to make deep curtsies when a rackety-packety house doll passed them, and Peter Piper could scarcely stand it, because it always made him want to stand on his head and laugh. And so, when they were curtsied at, because they were related to the royal dolls' house, they used to run into their drawing-room and fall into fits of giggles, and they could only stop them by all joining hands together in a ring, and dancing round and round and round, and kicking up their heels and laughing until they tumbled down in a heap. And what do you think of that for a story? And doesn't it prove to you what a valuable friend a fairy is? Particularly, Surly Tim, Part One. Sorry to hear my fellow workmen speak so disparaging of me. Well, master, that's as it may be, you know. Happen my fellow workmen have made a bit of mistake. Happen what seems like crustiness to them, being so much crustiness as something else. Happen I might do my own bit of complaining too. You may not trust all you hear, mister. That's all I can say. I looked at the man's bent face quite curiously, and judging from its rather heavy but still not unprepossessing outline, I could not really call it a bad face, or even a sulky one. And yet both managers and hands had given me a bad account of Tim Hibblethwaite. Surly Tim, they called him, and each had something to say about his sullen disposition to silence, and his short answers— not that he was accused of anything like misdemeanor, but he was glum-like, the factory people said, and a sorely fellow well deserving his name, as the master of the room had told me. I had come to Lancashire to take control of my father's spinning factory a short time before, being anxious to do my best towards the hands, and I often talked to one and another in a friendly way so that I could better understand their grievances and remedy them with justice to all parties concerned. So in conversing with men, women, and children, I gradually found out that Tim Hibblethwaite was in bad odor, and that he held himself doggedly aloof from all, and this was how, in the course of time, I came to speak to him about the matter. And the opening words of my story are the words of his answer— but they did not satisfy me by any means. I wanted to do the man justice myself, and see that justice was done to him by others. And then again, when, after my curious look at him, he lifted his head from his work and drew the back of his hand across his warm face, I noticed that he gave his eyes a brush, 
and glancing at him once more, I recognized the presence of a moisture in them. In my anxiety to conceal that I had noticed anything unusual, I am afraid I spoke to him quite hurriedly. I was a young man then, and by no means as self-possessed as I ought to have been. I hope you won't misunderstand me, Hibblethwaite, I said. I don't mean to complain. Indeed, I have nothing to complain of, for Foxley tells me you're the steadiest and most orderly hand he has under him. But the fact is, I should like to make friends with you all and see that no one is treated badly. And somehow or other I found out that you were not disposed to feel friendly toward the rest, and I was sorry for it, but I suppose you have some reason of your own. The man bent down over his work again, silent for a minute to my discomfiture, but at last he spoke almost huskily. "'Thank you, mister,' he said. "'You're a kindly chap, or you wouldn't have noticed. And you're not for wrong, either. I have reasons of my own, though I like to keep them to myself most of times. The fellows as throws their slurs on me would not understand them if I were like to gab, which I never were. But happen the time will come when Surly Tim will tell his own tale, though I often think it's like it won't not come till the day of judgment. I hope it comes before then, I said cheerfully. I hope the time is not far away when we shall all understand you, Hibblethwaite. I think it's been misunderstanding so far which has separated you from the rest, and it cannot last always, you know. But he shook his head, not after a surly fashion, but as I thought a trifle sadly or heavily, so I did not ask any more questions, or try to force the subject upon him. But I noticed him pretty closely as time went on, and the more I saw of him, the more fully I was convinced that he was not so surly as people imagined. He never interfered with the most active of his enemies, nor made any reply when they taunted him, and more than once I saw him perform a silent, half-secret act of kindness. Once I caught him throwing half his dinner to a wretched little lad who had just come to the factory and worked near him, and once again as I was leaving the building on a rainy night I came upon him on the stone steps at the door bending down with an almost pathetic clumsiness to pin the woolen shawl of a poor little mite, who, like so many others, worked with her shiftless father and mother to add to their weekly earnings. It was always the poorest and least cared for of the children whom he seemed to befriend. And very often I noticed that even when he was kindest, in his awkward man-fashion, the little waifs were afraid of him, and showed their fear plainly. The factory was situated on the outskirts of a thriving country town near Manchester, and at the end of the lane that led from it to the more thickly populated part, there was a path crossing a field to the pretty church and churchyard, and this path was a shortcut homeward for me. Being so pretty and quiet, the place had a sort of attraction for me, and I was in the habit of frequently passing through it on my way, partly because it was pretty and quiet and partly because, I have no doubt, because I was inclined to be weak and melancholy at the time, my health being broken down under hard study. It so happened that in passing here one night, and glancing in among the graves and marble monuments as usual, I caught sight of a dark figure sitting upon a little mound under a tree, and resting its head upon its hands, and in this sad-looking figure I recognized the muscular outline of my friend, Surly Tim. He did not see me at first, and I was almost inclined to think it best to leave him alone, but as I half turned away he stirred with something like a faint moan, and then lifted his head and saw me standing in the bright clear moonlight. "'Who's there?' he said. "'Dost thou want out?' "'It's only Doncaster, Hibblethwaite,' I returned, as I sprang over the low stone wall to join him. What is the matter, old fellow? I thought I heard you groan just now. You might have done, mister, he answered heavily. Happen the dead? I, I don't not myself. Not's the matter, though, as I knows on. Only I'm a bit out of sorts. He turned his head aside slightly, and began to pull at the blades of grass on the mound, and all at once I saw that his hand was trembling nervously. It was almost three minutes before he spoke again. That un belongs to me, he said suddenly at last, pointing to a longer mound at his feet, and this little one, signifying with an indescribable gesture, the small one upon which he sat. 
Poor fellow, I said. I see now. A little lad of mine, he said slowly and tremulously. A little lad of mine and, and his mother. What? I exclaimed. I never knew that you were a married man, Tim. He dropped his head upon his hand again, still pulling nervously at the grass with the other. The law says I beant, mister, he answered in a painful, strained fashion. I could not tell myself what God Almighty would say about it. I don't understand, I faltered. You don't mean to say the poor girl never was your wife, Hiblethwaite? That's what the law says. Slowly. I thought different, my son, and so did the poor lass. That's what's the matter, mister. That's the trouble. The other nervous hand went up to his bent face for a minute and hid it. But I did not speak. There was so much of strange grief in his simple movement that I felt words would be out of place. It was not my dogged, inexplicable hand who was sitting before me in the bright moonlight on the baby's grave. It was a man with a hidden history of some tragic sorrow long kept secret in his homely breast. Perhaps a history very few of us could read or write. I would not question him, though I fancied he meant to explain himself. I knew that if he was willing to tell me the truth, it was best that he should choose his own time for it, and so I let him alone. And before I had waited very long, he broke the silence himself, as I had thought he would. It were welly about six year ago I come here, he said, more or less, welly about six year. I were a quiet chap then, mister, and had not many friends, but I had more I am now. Happen I were better natured, but just as loike I were lighter hearted, but that's not to do with it. I had not been here more than a week when there come a young woman to mind a loom in the next room to me, and this young woman, being pretty and modest, takes my fancy. She were not like the rest of the wenches, loud talkin and slatter ill ways. She were just quiet like and naught else. First time I see her, I says to my son, there's a lass at seed trouble, and somehow every time I seed her after her, I says to my son, there's a lass at seed trouble. It were er, er, er eye. She had a soft like brown eye, mister, and it were er voice. Her her voice were soft like too. I sometimes thought it were plain to be seed, even er, er dress. If she'd been born a lady, she'd have been one of the fine sort, and as she'd been born a factory lass, she were one of the fine sort still. So I took to watching her, and trying to make friends with her, but I never had much luck with her, till one neat I was going home through the snow, and I seed her afore tighten the drift with naught but a thin shawl o'er her head. And so I goes up behind her, and I says to her, steady and respectful, so she wouldn't be afeard, I says, Lass! Let me see thee home. It's bad weather for thee to be out in by thy sin. Take my coat and wrap thee up in it, and take hold of my arm, and let me help thee along. She looks up right straight forward in my face with her brown eyes, and I tell you, mister, I were glad I were a honest man, stead of a rascal, for them quiet eyes would have fun me out before I'd a done saying my say, if I'd a meant harm. Thank you kindly, mister Hibblethwaite, she says. But do not take off the coat for me. I'm doing pretty nicely. It is, Mr. Hibblethwaite, beant it? I, lass, I answers, it's him. Mought I ax your name? I, to be sure, said she, my name's Rosanna. Santa Brent, the folk at the mill, all yous calls me. I work at the loom in the next room to thine. I've seed thee often and often. So we walks home to her lodgings and on the way we talks together friendly and quiet-like, and the more we talks the more I sees she's had trouble, and by and by, being only common workin' folk, we're straightforward to each other in our plain way. It comes out what her trouble has been. You perhaps wouldn't think I've been a married woman, mister, she says, but I have, and I wedded and rued. I married a soldier when I were a giddy young wench four years ago and it were the worst thing as ever i did in all my days he were one of your handsome fastest chaps and he tired of me as men of his stripe always do tire o' poor lasses and then he ill-treated me he went to the crimea after we'd been wed a year and left me to shift for myself and i heard six months after he were dead 
He never writ back to me, nor sent me no help, but I could not think he were dead till the letter come. He were killed the first month he were out fighting the Russians. Poor fella, poor Phil, the law have mercy on him. And that were how I found out about her trouble, and somehow it seemed to draw me to her and make me feel kindly towards her. Twas so pitiful to hear her talk about the rascal, so sorrowful and gentle, and not give him a real hard word for what he'd done. But that's all yes the way with woman folk. The more yo harry of them, the more they pity yo and pray for yo. Why, she won a more than twenty-two then. She must have been naught but a slip of a lass when they were wed. Howsever, Rosanna Brent and me got to be good friends, and we walked home together at nights, and talked about our bits of wage and our bits of debt, and the way that wind should keep up her spirits when I were a bit downhearted about out were just a wonder. She was so quiet and steady, and when she said out, she meant it, and she never said too much or too little. Her brown eyes always reminded me of my mother, though the old woman deed when I would know but a little chap. But I never seed Santa Brent smile without thinking of how my mother looked when I were kneeling down, saying my prayers after her. And being as the last were so dear to me, I made up my mind to ax her to be somewhat dear. So once, going home along with her, I takes older her hand and lifts it up and kisses it gentle, as gentle as with somewhat the same feeling as I'd kiss the good book. Santa, I says, being as you've had so much trouble with your first chance, would you be afeard to try a second? Could you trust a mon again, such a mon as me, Santa? I wouldn't be feared to trust thee, Tim, she answers back soft and gentle, after a manner. I would not be feared to trust thee any time. I kisses her hand again, gentler still. God bless thee, lass, I says. Does that mean yes? She crept up closer to me in a sweet, quiet way. Ay, lad, she answers, it means yes, and I'll bide by it. And thou shalt never rue it, lass, said I. Thou's given thy life to me, and I'll give mine to thee, sure and true. So we were axed in the church the next Sunday, and a month for then we were wed, and if ever a god's son shone on a happy mon, it shone on one that day, when we come out of church together, me and Rosanna, and went to our bit of a home to begin life again. I could not tell thee, mister, there be no words to tell how happy and peaceful we lived for two year after that. My lass never altered her sweet ways, and I just loved her to make up to her for what had gone by. I thank God Almighty for his blessing every day, and every day I pray to be made worthy of it. And here's just where I'd like to ask a question, mister, about some that's worried me a good deal. I do not want to question the Maker, but I would like to know how it is at sometimes it seems as we're clean forgot, as if he could not fash hissen about our troubles, and most like left them to work out their sins. You see, mister, and we all see sometimes he thinks on us and gives us a lift, but has not thy thy sin seen times when thou stopped short and axed thy sin, where's God Almighty? At e isn't the straighten things out a bit? The world's e a power of snarl, the righteous is forsaken in his seeds begging bread, and the devil's topmost again. I've talked to my lass about it sometimes, and I do not think I meant harm, mister, for I felt humble enough, and when I talked, my lass, she'd listen and smile, soft and sorrowful, but she never give me but one answer. Surly Tim Part Two. Tim, she'd say, this is only the school, and we're the scholars, and he's teaching us his way. We may not be like the children o' Israel in the wilderness, and turn away from the cross, cross of the serpent. We may not say, there is a snake. We mun say, there is the cross, and the Lord's gear to us. The teacher wouldn't be of much use to him if the scholars knew as much as he did, and I always think it's the best to comfort my sin with saying, The Lord Almighty, He knows. And she always comforted me too when I were worried. Life looked smooth somehow them three year. Happened the Lord sent him to me to make up for what were coming. At the end of the first year, the child were born, the little lad here. 
touching the turf with his hand. We Watty, his mother called him, and he were a fine, lightsome little chap. He filled the whole house with music, day in and day out, crowing and crowing, and crying too sometime. But if ever you're a feather, mister, you find out at a baby's cries music often enough, and you'll find too, if you ever lose one, that you give all you'd gettin' just to hear even the worst of crying. Rosanna, she couldn't find it ear her heart to set the little one out of her arms a minute, and she'd go about the room with her eyes all lidded up and her face bloomin' like a slip o' a girl's, and if she laid him in a cradle, her head would be turned o'er her shoulder all the time, looking at him and singing bits of sweet soundin' foolish women folk songs. I thought then at them old nursery songs were the happiest music I ever heard, and when Santa sung em, they minded me of hymn tunes. Well, mister, before the spring were out, we what was toddling round, holding to his mother's gown, and by the middle of next year he was cooing like a dove and prattling words a uh, voice like hers. His eyes were big and brown and straightforward like hers, and his mouth was like hers, and his curls were the color o a brown bee's back. Happened we set too much store by him, or happened it were only the teacher again teaching us his way, but how's ever that were, I came home one sunny morning from the factory, and my dear lass met me at the door, all white and cold, but trying hard to be brave and help me to bear what she had to tell. Tim, said she, the Lord has sent us a trouble, but we can bear it together. Can we, dear lad? That were all, but I knew what it meant, though the poor little lamb had been well enough when I kissed him last. I went in and saw him lying there on his pillows, struggling and gasping in hard convulsions, and I seed all was over, and in half an hour, just as the sun crept across the room and touched his curls, the pretty little chap opens his eyes all at once. Daddy, he crows out, sit he, daddy, and he lifts himself up and catches at the floating sunshine, laughs at it, and falls back dead, mister. I've always thought at the Lord Almighty knew what he were doin' when he give the woman to Adam in the Garden of Eden. He knowed he were not but a poor chap as could not do for his'n, and I suppose that's the reason he give the woman the strength to bear trouble when it come. I'd a gin clean in if it hadn't a been for my lass when the little chap deed. I never tackled out in all my days that hurt me as heavy as losin' him did. I could not a bear the sight o' his cradle, and if ever I come across any of his bits of playthings, I'd fought a cryin' and shakin' like a baby. I kept out of the way of the neighbor's children even. I was not like Rosanna. I could not see quite clear what the Lord meant, and I could not help murmuring sad and heavy. That's just like us men, mister, just as if the dear wench as had given him her life of food day and neat had no fur the best read of the two to be weak and heavy-hearted. But I gettin' welly over it at last, and we was beginning to come round a bit and look forward to the time when we'll see him again instead of looking back to the time we shut the round bit of a face under the coffin lid. The day come when we could bear to talk about him and mind things he'd said and tried to say in his broken baby ways. And so we were creeping back again to the old happy quiet, and we had been welly for six month, when summit fresh come. I'll never forget it, mister, the neat it happened. I'd kissed Rosanna at the door and left her standing there when I went up to the village to buy some she wanted. It were a bright moonlight neat, just such a neat as this, and the lass had followed me out to see the moonshine. It was so bright and clear, and just before I starts, she folds both her hands on my shoulder and says, soft and thoughtful, Tim, I wonder if the little chap sees us. I'd like to know, dear lass, I answers back, and then she speaks again. Tim, I wonder if he'd know he was ours, if he could see, or if he'd have forgot. He was such a little fellow. Them were the last peaceful words I ever heard her speak. I went up to the village and gettin' what she sent me fur, and then I come back. The moon was shining as bright as ever, and the flowers ere a little slip of garden were a sparklin' with dew. I seed em as I went up the walk, and I thought again of what she'd said about the little lad. She was not outside, 
and I could not see a leak about the house, but I heard voices, so I walked straight in, into the entry, into the kitchen, and there she were, mister, my poor wench, crouching down by the table, hiding her face ere her hands, and close beside her were a mon, a mon in red soldier clothes. My heart leaped into my throat, and for a minute I had not a word, for I saw some wit up, though I could not tell where it were, but at last my voice came back. Good evening, mister, I says to him. I hope you had not brought an ill news. What ails thee, dear lass? She stirs a little and gives a moan like a dying child, and then she lifts up her wan, broken-hearted face and stretches out both her hands to me. Tim, she says, do not hate me, lad, do not. I thought he were dead long sin. I thought at the Russians killed him and I were free, but I am not. I never were. He never deed, Tim, and there he is, the mon as I were wed to and left by. God forgive, oh, and oh, God forgive me. There, mister, there's a story for thee. What dost thou think o't? My poor lass was not my wife at all. The little chap's mother was not his father's wife, and never had been. That there worthless fellow as beat and starved her and left her to fight the world alone had come back alive and well, ready to begin again. He could take her away from me at any hour of the day, and I could not say a word to bar him. The law said my wife, the little dead lad's mother, belonged to him, body and soul. There was no law to help us. It were awe on his side. There no use going o'er all we said to each other in that dark room there. I raved and prayed and pled with the lass to let me carry her across the seas, where I'd heard there were help for such like. But she pled back er, a broken, patient way that it would not be reet, and happen it were the Lord's will. She did not say much to the soldier. I scarce heard her speak to him more than once when she axed him to let her go away by her sin. The canna want me now, Phil, she said. The canna care for me. Thou must know I'm more this man's wife than thine, but I do not ax thee to give me to him, because I know thou would not be reet. I only ax thee to let me alone. I'll go fur enough off and never see him more. But the villain held to her. If she did not come with him, he said, he had her up before the court for bigamy. I could have done murder then, mister, and I would have done it, had not been for the last running in betwixt us and pleading with all her might. If we'd been rich folk, there might have been some help for her. At least the law might have been brought to make him leave her be. But being poor working folk, there were only one thing. The wife mun go with a husband, and there the husband stood, a scoundrel, cursing with his black heart on his tongue. Well, says the lass at last, fair wearied out with grief, I'll go with thee, Phil, and I'll do my best to please thee. But I will not promise to forget the mon has been true to me, and has stood betwixt me and the world. And then she turned round to me. Tim, she said to me, as if she were half feared, I fear to him and me standing by. Three hours or four, the Lord had let me mill any mon had feared her. Tim, she says, surely he would not refuse to let us go together to the little lad's grave for the last time. She did not speak to him but to me, and she spoke still and strained, as if she were too heartbroken to be wild. Her face was as white as the dead, but she did not cry, as any other woman would have done. Come, Tim, she said, he conna say no to that. And so out we went, without another word, and left the black-hearted rascal behind, sitting in the very room the little undeed in. His cradle stood there, in the corner. We went out into the moonlight, without speaking, and we did not say a word until we come to this very place, mister. We stood here for a minute silent, and then I sees her begin to shake, and she throws her sin down on the grass where her arms flung o'er the grave, and she cries out as if her death wound had been given to her. Little lad, she says, little lad, dost thou see thy mother? Canst not thou hear her calling thee? Little lad, get nigh to the throne and plead. I fell down beside oh, the poor crushed wench and sobbed with her. I could not comfort her, for where would there any comfort for us? 
There were none left. There were no hope. We were shamed and broke down. Our lives was lost. The past were not. The future were worse. Oh, my poor lass, how hard she tried to pray. For me, mister. Yes, for me. As she lay there with her arms round her dead baby's grave, and her cheek on the grass as grew o'er his breast. Lord God Almighty, she says, help us. Do not give us up. Do not. Do not. We cannot do without thee now. If the time ever were when we could, the little chap must be with thee. I mind the bit of comfort about gathering the lambs in his bosom. And, Lord, if thou could spare him a minute, send him down to us with a bit of leet. Oh, Father, help the poor lad here, help him. Let the weight fall on me, not on him. Just help the poor lad to bear it. If ever I did out as were worthy of thy sight, let that be my reward, dear Lord Almighty. I be willing to give up a bit of my own heavenly glory for the dear lad's sake. Well, mister, she lay there on the grass, praying and crying, wild but gentle, for nigh half an hour, and then it seemed as she got quiet like, and she got up. Happen the Lord had hearkened and sent the child, happen he had, for when she gotten up, her face looked to me all white and shining in the clear moonlight. Sit down by me, dear lad, she said, and hold my hand a minute. I sat down and took hold her hand as she bid me. Tim, she said, this were why the little chap deed. Dost now thou see now, at the Lord knew best? Yes, lass, I answers humble, and lays my face on her hand, breaking down again. Hush, dear lad, she whispers, we had not time for that. I want to talk to thee. Will to listen? Yes, wife, I says, and I heard her sob when I said it, but she catches her sin up again. I want thee to make me a promise, said she. I want thee to promise never to forget what peace we ha had. I want thee to remember it all us, and to mind him at stead, and let his little hand hold thee back from sin and hard thoughts. I pray for thee need and day, Tim, and thou shalt pray for me, and happen they'll come a leet. But if there do not, dear lad, and I do not see how there could, if there do not, and we never see each other again, I want thee to make me a promise, that if thou sees the little chap first, thou'lt mind him o' me, and watch out with him nigh the gate, and I'll promise thee, that if I see him first, I'll mind him o' thee, and watch out true and constant. I promised her, mister, as you can guess. And we kneeled down and kissed the grass, and she took a bit of the sod to put in her bosom, and then we stood up and looked at each other, and at last she put her dear face on my breast and kissed me as she had done every neat since we were mon and wife. Good-bye, dear lad, she whispers, her voice all broken. Don't come back to the house till I'm gone. Good-bye, dear, dear lad, and God bless thee. And she slipped out of my arms and were gone in a moment almost before I could cry out. There is not much more to tell, mister. The end's coming now, and happen it'll shorten off the story, so it had seemed sudden to thee. But it were not sudden to me. I lived alone here, and worked, and minded my own business, and answered no questions, for nigh about a year, here and out, and seeing out, and hoping out, and till one time, when the daisies were blowing on the little grave here, there come to me a letter from Manchester, from one of the medical chaps at the hospital. It were a short letter, with print on it, and the moment I seed it I knowed some it were up, and I opened it trembling. Mister, there were a woman lying in one of the wards, dying of some long-named heart disease, and she prayed him to send for me, and one of the young soft-hearted ones had written me a line to let me know. I started almost before I finished reading the letter, and when I get into the place, I fun just what I knowed I should. I fun her, my wife, the blessed lass, and if it had been an hour later, I would not have seen her alive, for she were nigh past knowing me then. But I knelt down by the bedside, and I plead where, as she lay there, until I brought her back to the world again for one moment, her eyes flew wide open all at once, and she seed me and smiled, her dear face quivering to death. Dear lad, she whispered, the path was not so long after all. The Lord knew. He trod it his'n once, you know. 
I knowed that come. I prayed so. I've reached the very inn now, Tim, and I shall see the little lad first. But I would not forget my promise. No, I'll look out for thee, for thee, at the gate. And her eyes shut slow and quiet, and I knowed she was dead. There, Mr. Doncaster, there it all is, for there she lies under the daisies, close by her child, for I brought her here and buried her. The fellow has come betwixt us, had tortured her for a while, and then left her again, I found out, and she was so feared of doing some harm that she would not come nigh me. It were heart disease as killed her, the medical chap said, but I knowed better. It were heartbreak, that's all. Sometimes I think o'er it till I conna stand it any longer, and then I'm fain to come here and lay my hand on the grass, and sometimes I had queer dreams about her. I had one last neat. I thought as she'd come to me all at once, just as she used to look, only with her white face shining like a star, and she says, Tim, the path is not so long after all. Thus come nigh to the end, and me and the little chap is waiting. He knows thee, dear lad, for I've taught him. That's why I come here to need, mister, and I believe that's why I've talked so free to thee. If I'm near the end, I'd like someone to know. I have meant no hurt when I seem grum and surly. It were not ill will, but a heavy heart. He stopped there, and his head drooped upon his hands again, and for a minute or so there was another dead silence. Such a story as this needed no comment. I could make none. It seemed to me that the poor fellow's sore heart could bear none. At length he rose from the turf and stood up, looking out over the graves into the soft light beyond with a strange, wistful sadness. Well, I mun go now, he said slowly. Good night, mister, good night, and thank you for listening. Good night, I returned, adding, in an impulse of pity that was almost a passion, and God help you. Thank you again, mister, he said, and then turned away, and as I sat pondering I watched his heavy drooping figure threading its way among the dark mounds and white marble and under the shadowy trees and out into the path beyond. I did not sleep well that night. The strained heavy tones of the man's voice were in my ears, and the homely yet tragic story seemed to weave itself into all my thoughts and keep me from rest. I could not get it out of my mind. In consequence of this sleeplessness, I was later than usual in going down to the factory, and when I arrived at the gates I found an unusual bustle there. Something out of the ordinary routine had plainly occurred, for the whole place was in confusion. There was a crowd of hands grouped around one corner of the yard, and as I came in, a man ran against me and showed me a terribly pale face. I ax pardon, Mr. Doncaster, he said in a wild hurry, but there's an accident happened. One of the weavers is hurt bad, and I'm going for the doctor. The loom caught and crushed him afore we could stop it. For some reason or other, my heart misgave me that very moment. I pushed forward to the group in the yard corner and made my way through it. A man was lying on a pile of coats in the middle of the bystanders, a poor fellow, crushed and torn and bruised, but lying quite quiet now, only for an occasional little moan that was scarcely more than a quick gasp for breath. It was Surly Tim. "'He's nigh the end of it now,' said one of the hands pityingly. "'He's nigh the last now, poor chap. What's that he's saying, lads?' For all at once some flickering sense seemed to have caught at one of the speaker's words, and the wounded man stirred, murmuring faintly, but not to the watchers. Ah, no, to something far, far beyond their feeble human sight, to something in the broad without. The end, he said. Aye, this is the end, dear lass, and the paths are shining or summit, and why, lass, I can see thee plain, and the little chap, too. Another flutter of the breath, one slight movement of the mangled hand, and I bent down closer to the poor fellow, closer because my eyes were so dimmed that I could not see. Lads, I said aloud a few seconds later, you can do no more for him. His pain is over. 
for with a sudden glow of light which shone upon the shortened path and the waiting figures of his child and its mother, Surly Tim's earthly trouble had ended. The Land of the Blue Flower Part 1 The Land of the Blue Flower was not called by that name until the tall, strong, beautiful King Amor came down from his castle on the mountain crag and began to reign. Before that time, it was called King Mordreth's Land, and as the first King Mordreth had been a fierce and cruel king, this seemed a gloomy name. A few weeks before Amor was born, his weak, selfish boy father, whose name was King Mordreth also, had been killed while hunting, and his fair mother, with the clear eyes, died when he was but a few hours old. But early in that day, she sent for her venerable friend and teacher, who was said to be the oldest and wisest man in the world, and who long ago had fled to a cave in the mountains, that he might see no more of the famine and disorder and hatred in the country spread out on the plains below. He was a marvelous old man, almost a giant in size, and having great blue eyes like deep sea water. They, too, were clear eyes, like the fair queen's. They seemed to see all things, and to hold in their depths no single thought which was not fine and great. The people were a little afraid of him when they saw him go striding majestically through their streets. They had no name for him but the Ancient One. The lovely queen drew aside the embroidered coverlet of her gold and ivory bed, and showed him the tiny baby sleeping by her side. "'He was born a king,' she said. "'No one can help him but you.' The Ancient One looked down at him. "'He has long limbs and strong ones. He will make a great king,' he said. "'Give him to me.' The queen held out the little newborn one in her arms. "'Take him away quickly, before he hears the people quarreling at the palace gate,' she said. "'Take him to the castle on the mountain crag. Keep him there until he is old enough to come down and be king. "'When the sun sinks behind the clouds, I shall die. But if he is with you, he will learn what kings should know.' The Ancient One took the child, folded him in his long grey robe, and strode majestically through the palace gates, through the ugly city, and out over the plains to the mountain. When he began to climb its steep sides, the sun was setting, and casting a golden rose color over the big rocks and the wild flowers and bushes which grew on every side, so that there seemed no path to be found. But the Ancient One knew his way anywhere in the world without a path to guide him. He climbed and climbed, and little King Amor slept soundly in the folds of his gray robe. He reached the summit at last, and, pushing his way through a jungle of twisted vines starred all over with pale, sweet-scented buds, he stood, looking at the castle, which was set on the very topmost crag, and looked out over the mountain's edge at the sea and the sky and the spreading plains below. The sky was dark blue now, and lit by a myriad stars, and all was so still that the world seemed to be thousands of miles away, and ugliness and squalor and people who quarreled seemed things which were not true. A sweet, cool wind blew about them as the Ancient One took King Amor from the folds of his grey robe and laid him on the carpet of scented moss. "'The stars are very near,' he said. "'Waken, young king, and see how near they are, and know they are your brothers. Your brother the wind is bringing to you the breath of your brothers the trees. You are at home.' Then King Amor opened his eyes and when he saw the stars in the dark blueness above him, he smiled, and though he was not yet a whole day old, he threw up his small hand, and it touched his forehead. "'Like a king and a soldier, he salutes them,' said the Ancient One, though he does not know he did it. The castle was huge and splendid, though it had been deserted for a hundred years. For three generations the royal owners had not cared to look out on the world from high places. They knew nothing of the wind and the trees and the stars. They lived on the plains in their cities, and hunted and rioted and levied heavy taxes on their wretched people. And the castle had lived through its summers and winters alone. It had battlements and towers which stood out clear against the sky, and there was a great banquet hall and chambers for hundreds of guests, and rooms for a thousand men at arms, and the courtyard was big enough to hold a tournament in. In the midst of its space and splendor, the little king Amor lived alone, but for the companionship of the Ancient One 
and the servant as old as himself. But they knew a secret which kept them young in spite of the years they had passed through. They knew that they were brothers of all things in the world, and that the man who never knows an angered or evil thought can never know a foe. They were strong and straight and wise, and the wildest creature stopped to give them greeting as it passed, and they understood its language when it spoke. Because they held no dark thoughts in their minds, they knew no fear, and because they knew no fear, the wild creatures knew none, and the speech of each was clear to the other. Each morning they went out on the battlements at dawn to see the splendid sun rise slowly out of the purple sea. One of the very first things the child King Amor remembered in his life, and he remembered it always, was a dawning day when the Ancient One wakened him gently, and folding him in his long grey robe, carried him up the winding and narrow stone staircase, until at last they stepped forth on the top of the huge castle, which seemed to the little creature to be so high that it was quite close to the wonderful sky itself. "'The sun is going to rise and wake the world,' said the Ancient One. "'Young King, watch the wonder of it.' Amor lifted his little head and looked. He was only just old enough to be beginning to understand things, but he loved the Ancient One and all he said and did. Far below the mountain crag lay the sea. In the night, while it slept, it had looked dark blue or violet, but now it was slowly changing its color. The sky was changing, too. It was growing paler and paler. Next it grew faintly bright. So did the sea. Then a slight flush crept over the land and water, and all the small floating clouds were rosy pink. King Amor smiled, because birds' voices were to be heard in the trees and bushes, and something golden bright was rising out of the edge of the ocean, and sparkling light danced on the waves. It rose higher and higher, and grew so dazzling and wonderful that he threw out his little hand with a shout of joy. The next moment he started back, because there rose near him a loud whirr and beating of powerful wings, as a great bird flew out of a crag nearby, and soared high into the radiant morning heavens. "'It is the eagle who is our neighbor.' said the Ancient One. He has awakened and gone to give his greeting to the sun. And as the little king sat upright, enraptured, he saw that from the dazzling brightness at the edge of the world there leapt forth a ball of living gold and fire, and even he knew that the sun had risen. At every day's dawn it leaps forth like that, said the Ancient One. Let us watch together, and I will tell you stories of it. So they sat by the battlements, and stories were told. They were stories of the small grains lying hidden in the dark earth, waiting for the golden heat of the sun to draw them forth into life, until they covered the tilled fields with waving wheat to make bread for the world. They were stories of the seeds of fair flowers, warmed and ripened until they burst into scented blossoms. They were stories of the roots of trees and the rich sap drawn upward by the heat until great branches and thick leafage waved in the summer air. They were stories of men, women, and children, walking with light step, and glad because of the gold of the sun. Every day it warms, every day it draws, and every day it ripens and gives life, and there are many who forget the wonder of it. Lift your head high as you walk, young king, and often look upward. Never forget the sun. At every dawning they rose and saw together the wonder of the day, and the first time the sky was heavy with grey clouds, and the sun did not leap upward from behind the edge of the world, the Ancient One said another thing. The burning gold is behind the lowering grey and purple. The clouds are heavy with soft rain. When they break, they will drop it in showers or splendid storms, and the thirsty earth will drink it up. The grains will drink it, and the seed, and the roots, and the world will be joyous and rich with fresh life. The springs will bubble up like crystal, and the brooks will rush babbling through the green of the forest. The drinking places for the cattle will be full and clear, and men and women will feel rested and cool. Lift your head high when you walk, young king, and often look upward. Never forget the clouds. So hearing these things every day, King Amor learned the meaning of both sun and cloud, and loved and felt himself brother to both. The first time he remembered seeing a storm, the Ancient One took him to the battlements again, and together they watched the dark clouds pour down their floods, while their purple was riven by the dazzling lances of the lightning, 
and the thunder rolled and crashed, and seemed to rend asunder things no human eye could see, and the wind roared round the castle on the mountain crag, and beat against its towers, and tossed the branches of the hugest trees, and whirled the rain sheets over the land. And King Amor stood erect and strong, like some little soldier, though he wondered where the small birds were, and if the eagle were in his nest. Through all the tumult the Ancient One stood still. He looked taller than ever in his long grey robe, and his strange eyes were deep as the sea. At last he said, in a slow, calm voice, This is the voice of the power men know not. No man has yet quite understood, though it seems to speak. Hearken to it. Let your soul stand silent. Listen, young king, hold your head high as you walk, and look often upward. Never forget the storm. So the king learned to love the storm, and to be one with it, knowing no fear. But perhaps it might be because he had been laid on the scented moss, and had, without knowing it, saluted them on the first night of his life. He felt nearest to, and loved most, his brothers the stars. Every fair night, through the king's earliest years, the Ancient One carried him to the battlements, and let him fall asleep beneath the shining myriads. But first he would walk about, bearing him in his arms, or sitting with him in the splendid silence, sometimes relating wonders to him in a low voice, sometimes uttering no word, only looking calmly into the high vault above, as if the star spoke to him and told him of perfect peace. When a man looks long at them, he said, he grows calm and forgets small things. They answer his questions and show him that his earth is only one of the million worlds. Hold your soul still and look upward often and you will understand their speech. Never forget the stars. End of part The Land of the Blue Flower, Part 2 so, as the child king grew, day by day, the world seemed to grow fuller and fuller of wonders and beauties. There were the sun and the moon, the storm and the stars, the straight falling lances of rain, the springing of the growing things, the flight of the eagle, the songs and nests of small bird creatures, the changing seasons, and the work of the great brown earth giving its harvest and its fruits. All these wonders in one world, and you a man upon it, said the Ancient One. Hold your head high when you walk, young king, and often look upward. Never forget one marvel among them all. He forgot nothing. He lived looking out on all things from great, clear, joyous eyes. Upon his mountain crag he never heard a paltry or unbeautiful word, or knew of the existence of unfriendliness or baseness in thought. As soon as he was old enough to go out alone, he roamed about the great mountain and feared neither storm nor wild beasts. Shaggy-maned lions and their mates drew near and fawned on him as their kind had fawned on the young Adam in the Garden of Eden. There had never passed through his mind the thought that they were not his friends. He did not know that there were men who killed their wild brothers. In the huge courtyard of the castle, he learned to ride, and to perform great feats of strength. Because he had not learned to be afraid, he never feared that he could not do a thing. He grew so strong and beautiful that when he was ten years old he was as tall as the youth of sixteen, and when he was sixteen he was already like a young giant. This was because he had been brother to the storm, and had lived close to the strength and splendor of the stars. Only once, when he was a boy of twelve, a strange and painful thing happened to him. From his kingdom in the plains below, there had been sent to him a beautiful young horse which had been bred for him. Never had so magnificent an animal been born in the royal stable. When he was brought into the courtyard, the boy king's eyes shone with joy. He spent the greater part of the morning in exercising and leaping him over barriers. The ancient one in his tower chamber heard his shouts of exultation and encouragement. At last the king went out, to try him on the winding mountain road. When he returned, he went at once to the tower chamber, to the Ancient One, who, when he raised his eyes from his great book, looked at him gravely. Let us climb to the battlements, the boy said. We must talk together. 
So they went, and when they stood looking out on the world below, the curving and turquoise sky above them, the eyes of the ancient one were still more grave. Tell me, young king. Something strange has happened, King Amor answered. I have felt something I have not felt before. I was riding my horse around the field on the plateau, and he saw something which he refused to pass. It was a young leopard, watching us from a tree. My horse reared and snorted. He would not listen to me, but backed and wheeled around. I tried in vain to persuade him, and suddenly, when I saw I could not make him obey me, this strange new feeling rushed through all my body. I grew hot and knew my face was scarlet. My heart beat faster, and my blood seemed to boil in my veins. I shouted out harsh, ugly words. I forgot all things our brothers. I lifted my hand and clenched it, and struck my horse again and again. I loved him no longer. I felt that he no longer loved me. I am hot and wearied and heavy from it still. I feel no more joy. Was it pain I felt? I have never felt pain and do not know. Was it pain? It was a worse thing, answered the ancient one. It was anger. When a man is overcome by anger, he has a poisoned fever. He loses his strength. He loses his power over himself and over others. He throws away time in which he might have gained the end he most desires. There is no time for anger in the world. So King Amor learned the uselessness of anger, for they sat long upon the battlements, while the Ancient One told him how its poison worked in the veins and weakened the strongest man until he was made a fool. That night Amor lay under the sky, looking at his myriad brothers, the stars, and drawing calm from them. If you lie through the night upon the battlements, and think only of the stillness and the stars, you will forget your anger, and its poison will die away. If you put into your mind a beautiful thought, it will take the place of the evil one. There is no room for darkness in the mind of him who thinks only of the stars. This had been said to him by the Ancient One. Upon the plateau at the foot of the crag on which the castle stood, there were marvellous walled gardens. The sad young queen of the first King Mordress planted them, and after her death they had been left to run wild. Since the baby King Amor had been brought to the mountain top, the ancient one and his servitor had made them bloom again. As soon as he was old enough to hold a small spade, Amor had worked in the beds. All things grew for him, as if his touch were spell. Birds and bees and butterflies flocked round him as he laboured. He knew what the bees hummed, and where they flew to load themselves with honey. Butterflies lighted upon his hands, and taught him strange things. Birds told him of their travels, and brought him seeds from far countries, which he planted in his gardens, and which bloomed into marvellous flowers. A swallow who loved him very much, and who had seen many wonderful lands, once brought him a seed from an emperor's secret garden, which none but four of his own slaves had ever seen. These slaves had been born in the garden and would never leave it while they lived. King Amor planted the seed in a pleasance of its own. It grew into the most beautiful blue flower the world had ever known. It was of a blue so pure and exquisitely intense that it was raptured to look at it. Its blossoms hung from a tall stem, and in its first years it gave a thousand seeds. Each year Amor planted more flowers, and each year they grew taller and more wonderful, and blossomed a longer time. When the summer wind blew, it shook out the clouds of delicate fragrance which sometimes floated down the mountain until the wretched dwellers in King Mordred's land forgot their quarrels and misery, and even lifted their heavy heads to inhale it, and ask each other what was being done upon the mountain. Each year King Amor gathered the seeds, and stored them in an unused tower of his castle. Taller and stronger he grew, and each day wiser and more beautiful. Each plant, each weed, each four-footed thing, each wind, each star of heaven, taught him its wonders and its wisdom. His eyes were so marvelous in their straight-glanced splendor that when he looked at a man they seemed to read his soul and command its truth to answer him. He was so powerful that he could break an iron bar in two pieces with his hands. When he was twenty years old, the Ancient One took him up on the battlements, and giving him a strong glass, told him to look down upon the capital city on the plain and see what was being done there. "'I see many people gathered in crowds,' 
Amor said, when he had looked for a few moments. I see bright colors, and waving pennants, and triumphal arches. It is as if some great ceremony were being prepared for. The people are making ready for your coronation, said the ancient one. Tomorrow you will be led in state down the mountain, and acclaimed king. It was to fit you to reign over your kingdom that I taught you to know all the wonders of the world, and have shown you that no thing is useless but folly and dishonoring thought. That which you have learned from your brothers here, you go down the mountain to teach your brothers there. You will see things which are not beautiful, and those which are unclean. But hold your head high when you walk, young king, and never forget the sun, the wind, and the stars. To himself, as he looked on him, the Ancient One said, When he stands before them, they will think he is a young god. The next morning, a splendid procession wound its glittering way up the mountain road to the castle. There were princes and nobles and chieftains. Rich colors glowed in their attire, and gorgeous banners and pennants waved over them, while music from gold and silver trumpets accompanied them as they rode, and their many followers marched behind. The Ancient One, in his long robe of grey, stood by King Amor on the broad stone terrace, guarded by its crouching carved lions. "'This is your king, O people,' he said. And when the people looked, it was as he said it would be. They drew back a little, and gazed in fear, and many of the followers fell upon their knees. They thought they saw a beautiful young giant and god. But he was only a splendid and powerful young man, who had never known a dark thought, and had lived near to his brothers, the stars. His horse, adorned with golden trappings, was brought, and he was led down the mountainside, through the gates into the capital city of his kingdom. He desired that the Ancient One should ride by his side. What he saw, as he rode to the place of coronation, he had never seen before. Notwithstanding the embroidered silk and the velvet hangings decorating the fronts of rich people's houses, he caught glimpses of filthy side streets, squalid alleys, and tumble-down tenements. He saw forlorn little children scuttle away like rats into their holes as he drew near, and wretched, vicious-looking men and women fighting with each other for places in the crowd. Sharp, miserable faces peered round corners at him, and nobody smiled because everyone hated or distrusted his neighbor, and they dreaded and disliked the young king, because all the King Mordreths had been evil and selfish, and he was their descendant. When they saw that he was so tall and powerful, and carried his handsome head so high, often looking upward, they feared him still more. As their own heads hung down, they never saw anything but the dirt and dust beneath their feet, or the quarrels about them. So their minds were full of fears and ugly thoughts, and they at once began to be afraid of him, and suspect him of being proud. He could do twice as much evil as other kings, they said, since he was twice as strong and twice as handsome. It was their nature to think an evil thought of anything or anybody, and to be afraid of all things at the outset. The princes and nobles who rode in the procession tried to prevent King Amor seeing the wretched-looking people and ill-kept streets. They pointed out the palaces and decoration and beautiful ladies throwing flowers in his path from the balconies. He praised all the splendors and saluted the balconies looked up with such radiant and smiling eyes that the ladies almost threw themselves after their flowers, and cried out that never, never had there been crowned such a beautiful young king before. "'Do not look at the rabble, your majesty,' the prime minister said. "'They are an evil, ill-tempered lot of worthless malcontents and thieves.' "'I would not look at them,' answered King Amor. "'If I knew that I could not help them.' There is no time to look at dark things if one cannot make them brighter. I look at these because there is something more to be done. I do not yet know what. There is such hatred in their eyes that they will only make you angry, sire, said a handsome young prince who rode near. There is no time for anger, said Amor, holding his crowned head high. It is a worthless thing. After sunset there was a great banquet, and after it a great ball, and the courtiers and princes were delighted by the beauty and grace of the new king. He was much brighter and more charming than any of the King Mordrets had been. His laugh was full of gaiety, and the people who stood near him felt happier, but they did not know why. But when the ball was at its height, he stepped into the center of the room and spoke aloud to the splendid company. 
I have seen the broad streets, and the palaces, and all that is beautiful in my capital, he said. Now I must go to the narrow streets, and the dark ones. I must see the miserable people, the cripples, the wretches, the drunkards, and the thieves. Everyone clamored and protested. These things they had hidden from him. They said kings should not see them. I will see them, he said, with a smile which was beautiful and strange. I go now, on foot, and unattended, except for my friend, the Ancient One. Let the ball go on. He strode through the glittering throng with the grey-clad Ancient One at his side. He still wore his crown upon his head, because he wished his people to know that their king had come to them. Through dark and loathsome places they went, through narrow streets and back alleys and courts, where people scuttled away like rats as the gutter children had done in the daytime. King Amor could not have seen them, but that he had brought with him a bright lantern, and held it up in the air above his high head. The light shining down upon his beautiful face and his crown made him look more than ever like a young god and giant, and the people cowered terrified before him, asking each other what such a king would do to wretches like themselves. But just a very few little children smiled at him, because he was so young and bright and splendid. No one in the black holes and corners could understand why a king should come walking among them on the night of his coronation day. Most of them thought that the next morning he would order them all to be killed, and their houses burned, because he would only think of them as vermin. Once, as he passed through a dark court, a madman darted out in his path, shaking his fist. We hate you! he cried. We hate you! The dwellers in the court gasped with terror, wondering what would happen. But the tall young king stood holding his lantern above his head, and gazing at the madman with deep thought in his eyes. There is no time for hatred in the world, he said. There is no time. And then he passed on. The look of deep thought was in his face throughout the hours in which he strode on, until he had seen all he had come to see. The next day he rode back up the mountain, to his castle on the crag, and when night fell, he lay out upon the battlements under the sky, as he had done on so many nights. The soft wind blew about him as he looked up at the stars. "'I do not know, my brothers,' he said to them. "'Tell me.' And he lay silent until the great sweet stillness of the night seemed to fill his soul, and when the stars began to fade he slept in rapturous peace. The people in his kingdom on the plain waited, wondering what he would do. During the next few days they quarrelled and hated each other more than ever, the rich ones because they all wanted to gain his favour, and each was jealous of the other, the poor ones because they were afraid of him, and each man feared that his neighbour would betray things he had done in the past. Only two boys, working together in a field, having stopped to wrangle and fight, one of them suddenly stood still, remembering something, and said a strange thing in a strange voice. There is no time for anger. There is no time. And as he fell to work again, his companion did the same. And when they had finished their task of weeding, they talked about the thing, and remembered that when they had quarreled the day before, they had not finished their task at all and had not been paid, and had gone home sore from the blows they had given each other, and had had no supper. No, there is no time, they decided. At the beginning of the following week, there were rumors that a strange law had been made, the strangest ever known in the world. It was something about a blue flower. What had flowers to do with laws, or what had laws to do with flowers? People quarrelled about what the meaning of such a law might be. Those who thought first of evil things and fears began to say that in the rich people's gardens was to be planted a blue flower whose perfume would poison all the poor. The only ones who did not quarrel were the two boys and their friends who had already begun to make a sort of password of there is no time for anger. One of them, who was clever, added a new idea to the saying. There is no time for fear, he cried out in the field. Let us go on with our work. And they finished their task early, and played games. At last, one morning, it was made known that the new king was to give a feast in the open air to all the people. It was to be on the plain outside the city, 
and he himself was going to proclaim to them the law of the blue flower. And now we shall know the worst, growled and shivered the afraid ones as they shuffled their way to the plain, and the boys who used the password heard them. There is no time to think of the worst, shouted the clever one at the top of his voice. There is no time. We shall be late for the feast. And a number of people actually turned to listen, because there was a high, strong, gay sound in his voice, such as had never been heard in King Mordred's land before. The plain was covered with thick, green grasses, and beautiful spreading trees grew on it. There was a richly dripped platform for King Amor's gold and ivory chair, but when the people gathered about, he stood up before them, a beautiful young giant, with eyes like fixed stars, and head held high. And he read his law in a voice which, wonderful to relate, was heard by every man, woman, and child, even by the little cripple crouching alone in the grass on the very outskirts of the crowd, not expecting to hear or see anything. This is what he read. In my pleasurance on the mountain top there grows a blue flower. One of my brothers, the birds, brought me its seed from an emperor's hidden garden. It is as beautiful as the sky at dawn. It has a strange power. It dispels evil fortune and the dark thoughts which bring it. There is no time for dark thoughts. There is no time for evil. Listen to my law. Tomorrow seeds will be given to every man, woman, and child in my kingdom, even to the newborn. Every man, woman, and child, even the newborn, is commanded by the law to plant and feed and watch over the blue flower. It is the work of each to make it grow. The mother of the newborn child can hold its little hand and make it drop the seeds into the earth. As the child grows, she must show it the green shoots and they pierce the brown soil. She must babble to it of its blue flower. By the time it is pleased by color, it will love the blossoms, and the spell of happiness and good fortune will begin to work for it. It is not one person, here and there, who must plant the flower, but each and every one. To those who have not land about them, all the land is free. You may plant by the roadside, in a cranny of a wall, in an old box, or glass, or tub, in any bare space, in any man's field or garden. But each must plant his seeds, and watch over and feed them. Next year, when the blue flower blossoms, I shall ride through my kingdom and bestow my rewards. This is my law. What will befall if some of us do not make them grow? groaned some of the afraid ones. There is no time to think of that, shouted the boy who was clever. Plant them. When the prime minister and his followers told the king that larger and stronger prisons must be built for the many criminals, and that heavier taxes must be laid upon the people to rescue the country from poverty, his answer to them was, Wait until the blooming of the blue flower. In a short time, everyone was working in the open air, digging in the soil, tiny children as well as men and women. Drunkards and thieves and idlers, who had never worked before, came out of their dark holes and corners into the light of the sun. It was not a hard thing to plant a few flower seeds, and because the King of Moor looked so much more powerful than other men, and had eyes so wonderful and commanding, they did not know what punishment he would invent for them, and were afraid to disobey him. But somehow, after they had worked in the sweet-scented earth for a while, and had seen others working, the light of the sun and the freshness of the air made them feel in better humor. The wind blew away their evil fancies and their headaches, and because there was so much talk and wondering about the magic of the blue flower, they became interested, and wanted to see what it would do for them when it blossomed. Scarcely any of them had ever tried to make a flower grow before, and they gradually thought of it a great deal. There was less quarreling, because conversation with neighbors all about a blue flower gave no reason for hard words. The worst and idlest were curious about it, and everyone tried experiments of his own. The children were delighted, and actually grew happy and rosy over their digging and watering and caretaking. Gradually, all sorts of curious things happened. People who were growing blue flowers began to keep the ground around them in order. They did not like to see bits of paper and rubbish lying about, so they cleared them away. 
one quite new thing which occurred was that sometimes people even helped each other a little cripples and those who were weak actually found that there were stronger ones who would do things for them when their backs ached and when it was hard to carry water or dig up weeds no one in king mordred's land had ever helped another before the boy who was clever did more than all the rest he gathered together all the children he could and formed them into a band using the passwords in time it became quite like a little army they called themselves the band of the blue flower and each boy and girl was bound to remember the passwords and apply them to all they did so often when a number of people were together and things began to go wrong a clear young voice would cry out somewhere like a silver battle cry there is no time for anger or there is no time for hate or there is no time to fret there is no time among the great and rich people also singular things came to pass those who had wasted their days loitering or rioting were obliged to get up in the morning to work in their gardens and finding that exercise and fresh air improved their health and spirits they began to like it court ladies found it good for their complexions and tempers busy merchants discovered that it made their heads clearer ambitious students found that after an hour spent evening and morning over their blue flower beds they could study twice as long without fatigue the children of the princes and nobles became so full of work and talk of their soil and their seeds that they quite forgot to squabble and be jealous of each other's importance at court never in one story could it be told how many unusual interesting and wonderful things occurred in the once gloomy king mordred's land just because every person in it rich and poor old and young good and bad had to plant and care for and live every day of life with the blue flower oh the corners and crannies and queer places it was planted in and oh the thrill of excitement everywhere when the first tender green shoots thrust their way through the earth and the wave of excitement which passed over the whole land when the first buds showed themselves by that time everyone was so interested that even the afraid ones had forgotten to ask each other what king Amor would do to them if they had no blue flower somehow people had gained courage and they knew the blue flower would grow and they knew there was no time to stop working while they worried and said suppose it didn't there was no time sometimes the young king was on the mountain top with the wind and the eagle and the stars and sometimes he was in his palace in the city but he was always working and thinking for his people he was not seen by the people however until a splendid summer day came when it was proclaimed by heralds in the streets that he would begin his journey through the land by riding through the capital to see the blossoming of the blue flowers and there would be a feast once more upon the plain it was a wonderful day the air was full of golden light and the sky of such a blueness as never had been seen before out of the palace gates he rode and he wore his crown and his eyes were more brilliant than the jewels in it and his smile was more radiant than a sunrise as he looked about him for every breath he drew in was fragrant every ugly place was hidden and every squalid corner filled with beauty for it seemed as if the whole world were waving with blue flowers tumble-down houses and fences were covered with them because some of them climbed like vines neglected fields and gardens had been made neat so that they would grow rubbish and dirt had been cleaned away to make room for clumps and patches of them you could not grow the blue flower among dirt and disorder any more than you could grow it while you were spending your time in drinking and quarrel by the roadsides in courts in windows in cracks in walls in broken places in roofs in great people's gardens on the window sills or about the doorways of poor people's hovels fair and fragrant and waving grew the blue flower where it waved there was no room for dirt and rubbish and suddenly even the dullest people began to see that the face of the whole land was changed as if by some strange magic and the whole population seemed changed with it everybody looked fresher and more cheerful people had actually learned to smile and keep themselves clean and there was not one who was not healthier they had in fact been noticing this for some time and they had said to each other the power of the blue flower of which the king had spoken was beginning to work the children had grown gay and rosy 
and the boy who was clever and all his companions had found time to earn themselves new clothes, because they had never forgotten their passwords. All the farmers wanted them to work in their fields, because they said there was no time to idle, no time to fight, no time to play evil tricks. On the king rode, and on, and on, and on, and the further he went, the more splendid and joyous his smile grew. But at no time during the day was it more beautiful than when he met the little cripple who had sat on the outside of the crowd on the first feast day, not expecting to see or hear anything. The cripple lived in a tiny hovel on the edge of the city, and when the glittering procession drew near it, the small patch of garden was quite bare and had not a blue flower in it. And the little cripple was sitting huddled up on his broken doorstep, sobbing softly, with his face hidden in his arms. King Amor drew up his white horse, and looked at him, and looked at his bare garden. "'What has happened here?' he said. "'This garden has not been neglected. It has been dug, and kept free of weeds. But my law has been broken. There is no blue flower.' Then the little cripple got up trembling, and hobbled through his rickety gate, and threw himself down upon the earth before the king's white horse, sobbing hopelessly and heartbrokenly. "'Oh, king!' he cried. "'I am only a cripple, and small, and I can easily be killed. I have no flowers at all. When I opened my package of seeds, I was so glad that I forgot the wind was blowing, and suddenly a great gust carried them all away forever, and I had not even one left. I was afraid to tell anybody.' And then he cried so that he could not speak. "'Go on,' said the young king gently. "'What did you do?' "'I could do nothing,' said the little cripple. "'Only I made my garden neat and kept away the weeds. "'And sometimes I asked other people to let me dig a little for them. "'And always, when I went out, I picked up the ugly things I saw lying about, "'the bits of paper and rubbish, and I dug holes for them in the earth. "'But I have broken your law.' Then the people gasped for breath, for King Amor dismounted from his horse, and lifted the little cripple up in his arms, and held him against his breast. "'You shall ride with me to-day,' he said, "'and go to my castle on the mountain crag, and live near the stars and the sun. "'When you kept the weeds from your bare little garden, and when you dug for others, and hid away ugliness and disorder, "'you planted a blue flower every day. "'You have planted more than all the rest.' and your reward shall be the sweetest, for you planted without seeds. And then the people shouted until the world seemed to ring with their joy, and somehow they knew that King Mordred's land had come into fair days, and they thought it was the blue flower magic. But the earth is full of magic, Amor said to the Ancient One, after the feast on the plain was over. Most men know nothing of it, and so it comes misery. The first law of the earth's magic is this one, if you fill your mind with a beautiful thought, there will be no room in it for an ugly one. This I learned from you, and from my brothers, the stars. So I gave my people the blue flower to think of, and work for. It led them to see beauty, and to work happily, and filled the land with bloom. I, their king, am their brother, and soon they will understand this, and I can help them, and all will be well. They shall be wise and joyous, and no good fortune. The little cripple lived near the sun, and the stars, and the castle on the mountain crag, until he grew strong and straight. Then he was the king's chief guard. The boy who was clever was made captain of his band, which became the king's own guard, and never left him. And the gloom of King Mordred's land was forgotten, because it was known throughout all the world as the land of the, the Little Hunchback Zia Part 1 The Little Hunchback Zia toiled slowly up the steep road, keeping in the deepest shadows, even though the night had long fallen. Sometimes he staggered with weariness, or struck his foot against a stone, and smothered his involuntary cry of pain. He was so full of terror that he was afraid to utter a sound which might cause any traveller to glance toward him. This he feared more than any other thing, that some man or woman might look at him too closely. If such a one knew much, and had keen eyes, 
he or she might in some way guess even at what they might not yet see. Since he had fled from the village in which his wretched short life had been spent, he had hidden himself in thickets and behind walls or rocks or bushes during the day, and had only come forth at night to stagger along his way in the darkness. If he had not managed to steal some food before he began his journey, and if he had not found in one place some beans dropped from a camel's feeding bag, he would have starved. For five nights he had been wandering on, but in his desperate fear he had lost count of time. When he had left the place he had called his home, he had not known where he was going or where he might hide himself in the end. The old woman, with whom he had lived and for whom he had begged and labored, had driven him out with a terror as great as his own. Be gone, she had cried in a smothered shriek. Get thee gone, accursed. Even now thou mayest have brought the curse upon me also. A creature, born a hunchback, comes on earth with the blight of Jehovah's wrath upon him. Go far, go as far as thy limbs will carry thee. Let no man come near enough to thee to see it. If thou go far enough away before it is known, it will be forgotten that I have harbored thee. He had stood and looked at her in the silence of the dead, his immense black Syrian eyes growing wider and wider with childish horror. He had always regarded her with slavish fear. What he was to her he did not know. Neither did he know how he had fallen into her hands. He knew only that he was not of her blood or of her country, and that he yet seemed to have always belonged to her. In his first memory of his existence, a little deformed creature rolling about on the littered floor of her uncleanly hovel, he had trembled at the sound of her voice, and had obeyed it like a beaten spaniel puppy. When he had grown older, he had seen that she lived upon alms and thievery and witch-like evil doings that made all decent folk avoid her. She had no kinsfolk or friends, and only such visitors as came to her in the dark hours of night, and seemed to consult with her as she sat and mumbled strange incantations while she stirred a boiling pot. Zia had heard of soothsayers and dealers with evil spirits, and at such hours was either asleep on his pallet in a far corner, or, if he lay awake, hid his face under his wretched covering and stopped his ears. Once, when she had drawn near and found his large eyes open and staring at her in spellbound terror, she had beaten him horribly and cast him into the storm raging outside. A strange passion in her seemed her hatred of his eyes. She could not endure that he should look at her as if he were thinking. He must not let his eyes rest on her for more than a moment when he spoke. He must keep them fixed on the ground or look away from her. From his babyhood this had been so. A hundred times she had struck him when he was too young to understand her reason. The first strange lesson he had learned was that she hated his eyes and was driven to fury when she found them resting innocently upon her. Before he was three years old he had learned this thing and had formed the habit of looking down upon the earth as he limped about. For long he thought that his eyes were as hideous as his body was distorted. In her frenzies she told him that evil spirits looked out from them, and that he was possessed of devils. Without thought of rebellion or resentment, he accepted with timorous humility, as part of his existence, her taunts at his twisted limbs. What use in rebellion or anger? With the fatalism of the East, he resigned himself to that which was. He had been born a deformity, and even his glance carried evil. This was life. He knew no other. Of his origin he knew nothing except that from the old woman's rambling outbursts he had gathered that he was of Syrian blood and a homeless outcast. But though he had so long trained himself to look downward, that it had at last become an effort to lift his heavily lashed eyelids, there came a time when he learned that his eyes were not so hideously evil as his task mistress had convinced him that they were. When he was only seven years old, she sent him out to beg alms for her, and on the first day of his going forth she said a strange thing, the meaning of which he could not understand. 
Go not forth with thine eyes bent downward on the dust. Lift them, and look long at those from whom thou askest alms. Lift them, and look as I see thee look at the sky, when thou knowest not I am near. I have seen thee, hunchback. Gaze at the passerby, as if thou sawest their souls, and asked help of them. She said it with a fierce laugh of derision. But when, in his astonishment, he involuntarily lifted his gaze to hers, she struck at him, her harsh laugh broken in two. Not at me, hunchback, not at me, at those who are ready to give, she cried out. He had gone out stunned with amazement. He wondered so greatly that when he at last sat down by the roadside under a fig tree, he sat in a dream. He looked up at the blueness above him as he always did when he was alone. His eyelids did not seem heavy when he lifted them to look at the sky. The blueness and the billows of white clouds brought rest to him and made him forget what he was. The floating clouds were his only friends. There was something, yes, there was something he did not know what. He wished he were a cloud himself and could lose himself at last in the blueness as the clouds did when they melted away. Surely the blueness was the something. The soft, dull pad of camel's feet approached upon the road without his hearing them. He was not roused from his absorption until the camel stopped its tread so near him that he started and looked up. It was necessary that he should look up a long way. He was a deformed little child, and the camel was a tall and splendid one, with rich trappings and golden bells. The man it carried was dressed richly and the expression of his dark face was at once restless and curious. He was bending down and staring at Zia as if he were something strange. "'What dost thou see, child?' he said at last, and he spoke almost in a breathless whisper. "'What art thou waiting for?' Zia stumbled to his feet and held out his bag, frightened, because he had never begged before and did not know how and if he did not carry back money and food, he would be horribly beaten again. Arms, arms, he stammered. Master, Lord, I beg for, for her who keeps me. She is poor and old. Arms, great Lord, for a woman who is old. The man with the restless face still stared. He spoke as if unaware that he uttered words, and as if he were afraid. The child's eyes, he said. I cannot pass him by. What is it? I must not be held back, but the unearthly beauty of his eyes. He caught his breath as he spoke, and then he seemed to awaken as one struggling against a spell. What is thy name? he asked. Zia also had lost his breath. What had the man meant when he spoke of his eyes? He told his name, but he could answer no further questions. He did not know who Sonny was. He had no home. Of his mistress he knew only that her name was Judith, and that she lived on arms. Even while he related these things, he remembered his lesson, and dropping his eyelids, fixed his gaze on the camel's feet. "'Why dost thou cast thine eyes downward?' the man asked in a troubled and intense voice. Zia could not speak, being stricken with fear and the dumbness of bewilderment. He stood quite silent, and as he lifted his eyes and let them rest on the stranger's own, they became large with tears, big, piteous tears. Why, persisted the man anxiously, is it because thou seest evil in my soul? No, no, sobbed Zia. One taught me to look away because I am hideous, and my, my eyes are evil. Evil, said the stranger, they have lied to thee. He was trembling as he spoke. A man who has been pondering on sin dare not pass their beauty by. They draw him and show him his own soul. Having seen them, I must turn my camel's feet backward and go no farther on this road, which was to lead me to a black deed. He bent down and dropped a purse into the child's arms bag, still staring at him and breathing hard. They have the look, he muttered, of eyes that might behold the Messiah. Who knows? Who knows? And he turned his camel's head, still shuddering a little, and he rode away back towards the place from which he had come. There was gold in the purse he had given, and when Zia carried it back to Judith, 
She snatched it from him and asked him many questions. She made him repeat word for word all that had passed. After that he was sent out to beg day after day, and in time he vaguely understood that the old woman had spoken falsely when she had said that evil spirits looked forth hideously from his eyes. People often said that they were beautiful, and gave him money because something in his gaze drew them near to him. But this was not all. At times there were those who spoke under their breath to one another of some wonder of light in them, some strange luminousness which was not earthly. He surely sees that which we cannot. Perhaps when he is a man he will be a great soothsayer and reader of the stars, he heard a woman whisper to a companion one day. Those who were evil were afraid to meet his gaze and hated it as old Judith did. Though, as he was not their servant, they dare not strike him when he lifted his soft, heavy eyelids. But Zia could not understand what people meant when they whispered about him or turned away fiercely. A weight was lifted from his soul when he realized that he was not as revolting as he had believed, and when people spoke kindly to him he began to know something like happiness for the first time in his life. He brought home so much in his arms bag that the old woman ceased to beat him and gave him more liberty. He was allowed to go out at night and sleep under the stars. At such times he used to lie and look up at the jeweled myriads until he felt himself drawn upward and floating nearer and nearer to that unknown something which he felt also in the high blueness of the day. When he first began to feel as if some mysterious ailment was creeping upon him, he kept himself out of Judith's way as much as possible. He dared not tell her that sometimes he could scarcely crawl from one place to another. A miserable, fevered weakness became his secret. As the old woman took no notice of him, except when he brought back his day's earnings, it was easy to evade her. One morning, however, she fixed her eyes upon him suddenly and keenly. "'Why art thou so white?' she said and caught him by the arm, whirling him toward the light. "'Art thou ailing?' "'No, no,' cried Zia. She held him still for a few seconds, still staring. "'Thou art too white,' she said. "'I will have no such whiteness. It is the whiteness of, of an accursed thing. Get thee gone.' He went away, feeling cold and shaken. He knew he was white. One or two almsgivers had spoken of it, and had looked at him a little fearfully. He himself could see that the flesh of his thin body was becoming an unearthly color. Now and then he had shuddered as he looked at it because, because there was one curse so horrible, beyond all others, that the strongest man would have quailed in his dread of its drawing near him. And he was a child, a twelve-year-old boy, a helpless little hunchback mendicant. When he saw the first white and red spot upon his flesh, he stood still and stared at it, gasping, and the sweat started out upon him and rolled down in great drops. Jehovah, he whispered, God of Israel, thy servant is but a child. But there broke out upon him other spots, and every time he found a new one, his flesh quaked, and he could not help looking at it in secret again and again. Every time he looked, it was because he hoped it might have faded away. But no spot faded away, and the skin on the palms of his hands began to be rough and cracked, and to show spots also. In a cave on a hillside near the road where he sat and begged, there lived a deathly being who, with face swathed in linen and with bandaged stumps of limbs, hobbled forth now and then, and came down to beg also but always keeping at a distance from all human creatures, and as he approached the pitiful, rattled loudly his wooden clappers, wailing out, Unclean! Unclean! It was the leper Barias, whose hopeless tale of awful days was almost done. Zia himself had sometimes limped up the hillside and laid some of his own poor food upon a stone near his cave so that he might find it. One day... He had also taken a branch of almond blossom in full flower, and had laid it by the food. And when he had gone away, he stood at some distance, watching to see the poor ghost come forth to take what he had given. 
and he had seen him first clutch at the blossoming branch and fall upon his face, holding it to his breast. A white, bound, shapeless thing, sobbing and uttering hoarse, croaking, unhuman cries. No almsgiver but Zia had ever dreamed of bringing a flower to him who was forever cut off from all bloom and loveliness. It was this white, shuddering creature that Zia remembered, with a sick chill of horror, when he saw the spots. Unclean! Unclean! He heard the cracked voice cry to the sound of wooden clappers. Unclean! Unclean! Judith was standing at the door of her hovel one morning, when Zia was going forth for the day. He had fearfully been aware that for days she had been watching him as he had never known her to watch him before. This morning she had followed him to the door, and had held him there a few moments in the light with some harsh speech, keeping her eyes fixed on him the while. Even as they so stood, there fell upon the clear air of the morning a hollow, far-off sound. The sound of wooden clappers rattled together, and the hopeless crying of two words, unclean, unclean, and then silence fell. Upon Zia descended a fear beyond all power of words to utter. In his quaking young torment he lifted his eyes and met the gaze of the old woman as it flamed down upon him. "'Go within,' she commanded suddenly, and pointed to the wretched room inside. He obeyed her, and she followed him, closing the door behind them. "'Tear off thy garment,' she ordered. "'Strip thyself to thy skin. To thy skin!' He shook from head to foot his trembling hands almost refusing to obey him. She did not touch him, but stood apart glaring. His garments fell from him and lay in a heap at his feet, and he stood among them naked. One look and she broke forth, shaking with fear herself into a breathless storm of fury. "'Thou hast known this thing and hidden it,' she raved. "'Leper! Leper! A cursed hunchback thing!' As he stood in his nakedness and sobbed, great, heavy, childish sobs, she did not dare to strike him and rage the more. If it were known that she had harbored him, the priests would be upon her, and all that she had would be taken from her and burned. She would not even let him put his clothes on in her house. Take thy rags and be gone in thy nakedness. Clothe thyself on the hillside. Let none see thee until thou art far away. Rot as thou wilt, but dare not to name me. Be gone, be gone, be gone. And with his rags he fled, naked through the doorway, and hid himself in the little wood beyond. Later, as he went on his way, he had hidden himself in the daytime behind bushes by the wayside or off the road. He had crouched behind rocks and boulders. He had slept in caves when he found them. He had shrunk away from all human sight. He knew it could not be long before he would be discovered, and then he would be shut up, and afterward he would be as Boreas until he died alone, like unto Boreas. To him it seemed as though surely never child had sobbed before as he sobbed, lying hidden behind his boulders among his bushes on the bare hill among the rocks. For the first four nights of his wandering he had not known where he was going. But on this fifth night he discovered he was on the way to Bethlehem, beautiful little Bethlehem, curving on the crest of the Judean mountains and smiling down upon the fairness of the fairest of sweet valleys, rich with vines and figs and olives and almond trees. He dimly recalled stories he had overheard of its loveliness and when he found that he had wandered unknowingly toward it, he was aware of a faint sense of peace. He had seen nothing of any other part of the world than the poor village outside which the hovel of his bond-mistress had clung to a low hill. Since he was near it, he vaguely desired to see Bethlehem. He had learned of its nearness as he lay hidden in the undergrowth on the mountainside that he had begun to climb the night before. Awakening from sleep, he had heard many feet passing up the climbing road, the feet of men and women and children, of camels and asses, and all had seemed to be of a procession ascending the mountainside. Lying flat upon the earth, he had parted the bushes cautiously and watched and listened to the shouts, cries, laughter, and talk of those who were near enough to be heard. So bit by bit 
he had heard the story of the passing throng. The great emperor, Augustus, who to the common herd seemed some strange omnipotent in his remote and sumptuous paradise of Rome, had issued a decree that all the world of his subjects should be enrolled, and every man, woman, and child must enroll himself in his own city. And to the little town of Bethlehem all these travelers were wending their way to the place of their nativity, in obedience to the great Caesar's command. The Little Hunchback Zia, Part 2 All through the day he watched them, men and women and children who belonged to one another, who rode together on their beasts, or walked together hand in hand. Women on camels or asses held their little ones in their arms, or walked with the youngest slung on their backs. He heard boys laugh and talk with their fathers, boys of his own age, who trudged merrily along, and now and again ran forward shouting with glee. He saw more than one strong man swing his child up to his shoulder and bear him along as if he found joy in his burden. Boy and girl companions played as they went and made holiday of their journey. Young men or women who were friends, lovers, or brothers and sisters bore one another company. No one is alone, said Zia, twisting his thin fingers together. No one, no one, and there are no lepers. The great Caesar would not count a leper. Perhaps if he saw one he would command him to be put to death. And then he writhed upon the grass and sobbed again, his bent chest almost bursting with his efforts to make no sound. He had always been alone, always, always. But this loneliness was such as no young human thing could bear. He was no longer alive. He was no longer a human being. Unclean, unclean, unclean. At last he slept exhausted, and past his piteous prostrate childhood and helplessness, the slow procession wound its way up the mountain, round toward the crescent of Bethlehem, knowing nothing of his nearness to its unburdened comfort and simple peace. When he awakened, the night had fallen, and he opened his eyes upon a high vault of blue velvet darkness, strewn with great stars. He saw this at the first moment of his consciousness, and then he realized that there was no longer to be heard the sound either of passing hooves or treading feet. The travelers who had gone by during the day had probably reached their journey's end, and gone to rest in their tents, or had found refuge in the enclosing khan that gave shelter to wayfarers and their beasts of burden. But though there was no human creature near, and no sound of human voice or human tread, a strange change had taken place in him. His loneliness had passed away, and left him lying still and calm, as though it had never existed, as though the crushed and broken child, who had plunged from a precipice of woe into deadly, exhausted sleep, was only a vague memory of a creature in a dark past dream. Had it been himself, lying upon his back, seeing only the immensity of the deep blue above him and the greatness of the stars, he scarcely dared to draw breath, lest he should arouse himself to new anguish. It had not been he who had so suffered. Surely it had been another Zia. What had come upon him? What had come upon the world? All was so still that it was as if the earth waited, as if it waited to hear some word that would be spoken out of the great space in which it hung. He was not hungry, or cold, or tired. It was as if he had never staggered and stumbled up the mountain path, and dropped shuddering to hide behind the bushes before the daylight came, and men could see his white face. Surely he had rested long. He had never felt like this before, and he had never seen so wonderful a night. The stars had never been so many and so large. What made them so soft and brilliant, that each one was almost like a sun? And he strangely felt that each looked down at him as if it said the word, though he did not know what the word was. Why had he been so terror-stricken? Why had he been so wretched? There were no lepers, there were no hunchbacks, there was only Zia, and he was at peace. 
and akin to the stars that looked down. How heavenly still the waiting world was! How heavenly still! He lay and smiled and smiled, perhaps he lay so for an hour, and then high, high above he saw, or thought he saw, in the remoteness of the vault of blue, a brilliant whiteness float. Was it a strange snowy cloud, or was he dreaming? It seemed to grow whiter, more brilliant. His breath came fast, and his heart beat trembling in his breast, because he had never seen clouds so strangely, purely brilliant. There was another higher, farther distant, and yet more dazzling still. Another and another showed its radiance, until at last an arch of splendor seemed to stream across the sky. It is like the glory of the Ark of the Covenant, he gasped, and threw his arm across his blinded eyes, shuddering with rapture. He could not uncover his face, and it was as he lay quaking with an unearthly joy that he first thought he heard sounds of music as remotely distant as the lights. Is it on earth, he panted? Is it on earth? He struggled to his knees. He had heard of miracles and wonders of old, and of the past ages when the sons of God visited the earth. Glory to God in the highest, he stammered again and again and again, glory to the great Jehovah, and he touched his forehead seven times to the earth. Then he beheld a singular thing. When he had gone to sleep, a flock of sheep had been lying near him on the grass. The flock was still there, but something seemed to be happening to it. The creatures were awakening from their sleep, as if they had heard something. First one head was raised, and then another, and then another, and another, until every head was lifted, and every one was turned toward a certain point, as if listening. What were they listening for? Zia could see nothing, though he turned his own face towards the climbing road and listened with them. The floating radiance was so increasing in the sky that at this point of the mountainside it seemed no longer to the night, and the far away peans held him breathless with mysterious awe. Was the sound on earth? Where did it come from? Where? Praised be Jehovah, he heard his weak and shaking young voice quaver. Some belated travelers were coming slowly up the road. He heard an ass's feet and low voices. The sheep heard them also. Had they been waiting for them? They rose one by one, the whole flock to their feet, and turned in a body toward the approaching sounds. Zia stood up with them. He waited also, and it was as if at this moment his soul so lifted itself that it almost broke away from his body, almost. Around the curve an ass came slowly bearing a woman and led by a man who walked by his side. He was a man of sober years, and walked wearily. Zia's eyes grew wide with awe and wondering, as he gazed, scarce breathing. The light upon the hillside was so softly radiant, and so clear, that he could see that the woman's robe was blue, and that she lifted her face to the stars as she rode. It was a young face, and pale, with the pallor of lilies, and her eyes were as stars of the morning, but this was not all. A radiance shone from her pure pallor, and bordering her blue robe and veil was a faint steady glow of light, and as she passed the standing and waiting sheep, they slowly bowed themselves upon their knees before her, and so knelt until she had passed by and was out of sight. Then they returned to their places and slept as before. When she was gone, Zia found that he also was kneeling. He did not know when his knees had bent. He was faint with ecstasy. She goes to Bethlehem, he heard himself say, as he had heard himself speak before. I too, I too. He stood a moment, listening to the sound of the ass's retreating feet as it grew fainter in the distance. His breath came quick and soft. The light had died away from the hillside, but the high floating radiance seemed to pass to and fro in the heavens, and now and again he thought he heard the faint, far sound that was like music, so distant 
that it was as a thing heard in a dream. Perhaps I behold visions, he murmured. It may be that I shall awake. But he found himself making his way through the bushes and setting his feet upon the road. He must follow. He must follow. Howsoever steep the hill, he must climb to Bethlehem. But as he went on his way, it did not seem steep, and he did not waver or toil as he usually did when walking. He felt no weariness or ache in his limbs, and the high radiance gently lighted the path and dimly revealed that many white flowers he had never seen before seemed to have sprung up by the roadside and to wave softly to and fro, giving forth a fragrance so remote and faint and yet so clear that it did not seem of earth. It was perhaps part of the vision. Of the distance he climbed, his thought took no cognizance. There was in this vision neither distance nor time. There was only faint radiance, far strange sounds, and the breathing of air which made him feel an ecstasy of lightness as he moved. The other Zia had traveled painfully, had stumbled and struck his feet against wayside stones. He seemed ten thousand miles, ten thousand years away. It was not he who went to Bethlehem, led as if by some power invisible, to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem, where went the woman whose blue robe was bordered with a glow of fair luminousness, and whose face, like an uplifted lily, softly shone. It was she he followed, knowing no reason but that his soul was called. When he reached the little town, and stood at last near the gateway of the Khan, in which the day-long procession of wayfarers had crowded to take refuge for the night. He knew that he would find no place among the multitude within its walls. Too many of the great Caesar's subjects had been born in Bethlehem, and had come back for their enrollment. The Khan was crowded to its utmost, and outside lingered many who had not been able to gain admission, and who consulted plaintively with one another, as to where they might find a place to sleep and to eat the food they carried with them. Zia had made his way to the entrance gate only because he knew the travelers he had followed would seek shelter there, and that he might chance to hear of them. He stood a little apart from the gate and waited. Something would tell him what he must do. Almost as this thought entered his mind, he heard voices speaking near him. Two women were talking together and soon he began to hear their words. Joseph of Nazareth and Mary his wife, one said, both of the line of David, there was no room for them, even as there was no room for others not of royal lineage. To the mangers in the cave they've gone, seeing the woman had sore need of rest, she thou knowest, Zia heard no more. He did not ask where the cave lay. He had not needed to ask his way to Bethlehem. That which had led him again directed his feet away from the entrance gate of the Khan, past the crowded court and the long, low wall of stone within the enclosure of which the camels and asses browsed and slept, on at last to a pathway leading to the gray of rising rocks. Beneath them was the cave he knew, though none had told him so. Only a short distance, and he saw what drew him trembling nearer. At the open entrance, through which he could see the rough mangers of stone, the heaps of fodder, and the ass munching slowly in a corner. The woman who wore the blue robe stood leaning wearily against the heavy wooden post, and the soft light bordering her garments set her in a frame of faint radiance, and glowed in a halo about her head. The light! The light! cried Zia in a breathless whisper, and he crossed his hands upon his breast. Her husband surely could not see it. He moved soberly about, unpacking the burden the ass had carried, and seeming to see naught else. He heaped straw in a corner with care, and threw his mantle upon it. Come, he said, here thou canst rest, and I can watch by thy side. The angels of the Lord be with thee. The woman turned from the door and went toward him, walking with slow steps. He gazed at her with mild, unillumined eyes. "'Does he not see the light?' panted Zia. "'Does he not see the light?' Soon he himself no longer saw it. Joseph of Nazareth came to the wooden doors and drew them together, 
and the boy stood alone on the mountainside, trembling still, and wet with the dew of the night. But not weary, not hungered, not athirst or afraid, only quaking with wonder and joy. He, the little hunchback Zia, who had known no joy before since the hour of his birth. He sank upon the earth slowly, in an exquisite peace a peace that thrilled his whole being as it stole over his limbs deepening moment by moment his head drooped softly upon a cushion of moss as his eyelids fell he saw the splendor of whiteness floating in the height of the purple vault above him the dawn was breaking and yet the stars had not faded away this was his thought when his eyes first opened on a great one greater than any other in the sky and of so pure a brilliance that it seemed as if even the sun would not be bright enough to put it out it hung high in the paling blue high as the white radiance and as he lay and gazed he thought it surely moved what new star was it that in that one night had been born he had watched the stars through so many desolate hours that he knew each great one as a friend, and this one he had never seen before. The morning was cold, and his clothes were wet with dew, but he felt no chill. He remembered. Yes, he remembered. If he had lived in a vision the day before, he was surely living in one yet. The Zia, who had been starved and beaten and driven out naked into the world, who had clutched his thin breast and sobbed, writhing upon the earth, where was he? He looked down upon his hands and saw the cracked and scaling palms, and it was as though they were not. He thrust back the covering from his chest and saw the spots there. But there were no lepers, there were no hunchbacks, there were only Zia and the light. He knelt and turned himself towards the cave and prayed. And as he so knelt and prayed, the man Joseph rolled open the heavy wooden door. Then Zia, still kneeling, beat himself softly upon the breast and prayed again, not as before to Jehovah, but to that which he beheld. The light was there, fair, radiant, wonderful. The cave was bathed in it. The woman in the blue robe sat upon the straw, and in her arms she held a newborn child. Zia touched his forehead to the earth again, again, and again, unknowing that he did so. The child was the light itself. He must rise and draw near. That which had drawn him up the mountainside drew him again. The child was the light itself. As he crept near the cave's entrance, the woman's eyes rested upon him, soft and wonderful. She spoke to him. She spoke. Be not afraid, she said. Draw nigh and behold. Her voice was not as the voice of other women. It was like her eyes. His body, through his blood, through every limb and fleshly atom of him, he felt it steal. New life, warming, thrilling, wakening in his veins, new life. As he felt it, he knelt quaking with rapture, even as he had stood the night before, gazing at the light. The newborn hand lay still. He did not know how long he knelt. He did not know that the woman leaned toward him, scarce drawing breath, her wondrous eyes resting upon him as if she waited for a sign. Even as she so gazed, she beheld it, and spoke, whispering as in awed prayer. Go forth and cleanse thy flesh in running water, she said. Go forth. He moved. He rose. He stood upright. The hunchback Zia, who had never stood upright before. His body was straight. His limbs were strong. He looked upon his hands, and there was no blemish or spot to be seen. I am made whole. He cried in ecstasy so wild that his boy's voice rang and echoed in the cave's hollowed roof. I am made whole. Go forth, she said softly. Go forth and give praise. He turned and went into the dawning day. He stood swaying and heard himself sob forth a rapturous cry of prayer. 
His flesh was fresh and pure. He stood erect and tall. He was as others whom God had not cursed. The light, the light, he stretched forth his arms to the morning sky. Some shepherds, roughly clothed in the skin of lambs and kids, were climbing the hill towards the cave. They carried their crooks, and they talked eagerly, as though in wonderment at some strange thing which had befallen them, looking up at the heavens, and one pointed with his crook. Surely it draws nearer. The star, he said, look. As they passed a thicket, where a brook flowed through the trees, a fair boy came forth, cleansed, fresh, and radiant, as if he had but just bathed in its clear waters. It was the boy Zia. Who is this one? said the oldest shepherd. How beautiful he is! How the light shines on him! He looks like a king's son. And that Part One of Esmeralda To begin, I am a Frenchman, a teacher of languages, and a poor man, necessarily a poor man, as the great world would say. Or I should not be a teacher of languages, and my wife a copyist of great pictures, selling her copies at small prices. In our own eyes, it is true, we are not so poor, my Clélie and I. Looking back upon our past, we congratulate ourselves upon our prosperous condition. There was a time when we were poorer than we are now, and were not together, and were, moreover, in London instead of in Paris. These were indeed calamities, to be poor, to teach, to live apart, not even knowing each other. And in England, in England we spent years, we instructed imbeciles of all grades, we were chilled by east winds and tortured by influenza. We vainly strove to conciliate the appalling English. We were discouraged and desolate. But this, thank le bon Dieu, is past. We are united. We have our little apartment, upon the fifth floor, it is true, but still not hopelessly far from the Champs-Élysées. Clélie paints her little pictures, or copies those of some greater artist, and finds sale for them. She is not a great artist herself, and is charmingly conscious of the fact. At fifteen, she says, I regretted that I was not a genius. At five and twenty, I rejoice that I made the discovery so early, and so gave myself time to become grateful for the small gifts bestowed upon me. Why should I eat out my heart with envy? Is not it possible that I might be a less clever woman than I am, and a less lucky one? On my part I have my pupils, French pupils who take lessons in English, German or Italian, English or American pupils who generally learn French, and upon the whole I do not suffer from lack of patrons. It is my habit when Clélie is at work upon a copy in one of the great galleries to accompany her to the scene of her labour in the morning and call for her at noon, and in accordance with this habit. I made my way to the Louvre at midday upon one occasion three years ago. I found my wife busy at her easel in the Grande Galerie, and when I approached her and laid my hand upon her shoulder, as was my wont, she looked up at me with a smile and spoke to me in a cautious undertone. I am glad, she said, that you are not ten minutes later. Look at those extraordinary people. She still leaned back in her chair and looked up at me, but made, at the same time, one of those indescribable movements of the head which a clever woman can render so significant. This slight gesture directed me at once to the extraordinary people to whom she referred. Are they not truly wonderful? she asked. There were two of them, evidently father and daughter, and they sat side by side upon a seat placed in an archway, and regarded hopelessly one of the finest works in the gallery. The father was a person undersized and elderly. His face was tanned and seamed, as if with years of rough outdoor labour. The effect produced upon him by his clothes was plainly one of actual suffering, both physical and mental. His stiff hands refused to meet the efforts of his gloves to fit them. His body shrank from his garments. If he had not been pathetic, he would have been ridiculous. But he was pathetic. It was evident he was not so attired of his own free will, that only a patient nature, 
inured by long custom to discomfort, sustained him. That he was in the gallery under protest, that he did not understand the paintings, and that they perplexed, overwhelmed him. The daughter is almost impossible to describe, and yet I must attempt to describe her. She had a slender and pretty figure. There were slight marks of the sun on her face also, and, as in her father's case, the richness of her dress was set at defiance by a strong element of incongruousness. She had black hair and grey eyes, and she sat with folded hands staring at the picture before her in dumb uninterestedness. Clelly had taken up her brush again, and was touching up her work here and there. "'They have been here two hours,' she said. "'They are waiting for someone. At first they tried to look about them, as others did. They wandered from seat to seat and sat down, and looked as you see them doing now. What do you think of them? To what nation should you ascribe them?' They are not French, I answered, and they are not English. If she were English, said Clélie, the girl would be more conscious of herself, and of what we might possibly be saying. She is only conscious that she is out of place and miserable. She does not care for us at all. I have never seen Americans like them before, but I am convinced that they are Americans. She laid aside her working materials and proceeded to draw on her gloves. We will go and look at that Tentation de Saint Antoine of Teniers, she said, and we may hear them speak. I confess I am devoured by an anxiety to hear them speak. According, a few moments later, an amiable young couple stood before La Tentation, regarding it with absorbed and critical glances. But the father and daughter did not seem to see us. They looked disconsolately about them, or at the picture before which they sat. Finally, however, we were rewarded by hearing them speak to each other. The father addressed the young lady slowly and deliberately, and with an accent which, but for my long residence in England and familiarity with some forms of its patois, I should find it impossible to transcribe. Esmeralda, he said, your ma's a long time a-comin. Yes, answered the girl, with the same accent, and in a voice wholly listless and melancholy. She's a long time. Clelie favoured me with one of her rapid side-glances. The study of character is her grand passion, and her special weakness is a fancy for the singular and incongruous. I have seen her stand in silence, and regard with positive interest one of her former patronesses, who was overwhelming her with contumelious violence, seeming entirely unconscious of all else but that the woman was of a species novel to her, and therefore worthy of delicate observation. "'It is as I said,' she whispered. "'They are Americans, but of an order entirely new.' Almost the next instant she touched my arm. "'Here is the mother,' she exclaimed. "'She is coming this way. See?' A woman advanced rapidly toward our part of the gallery, a small, angry woman, with an ungraceful figure and a keen brown eye. She began to speak aloud while still several feet distant from the waiting couple. "'Come along,' she said. "'I've found a place at last, though I've been all the morning at it, and the woman who keeps the door speaks English.' "'They call em, remarked the husband." meekly rising. Concierges! I wonder why. The girl rose also, still with her hopeless, abstracted air, and followed the mother, who led the way to the door. Seeing her move forward, my wife uttered an admiring exclamation. She is more beautiful than I thought, she said. She holds herself marvellously. She moves with the freedom of some fine, wild creature. And, as the party disappeared from view, her regret at losing them drew from her a sigh. She discussed them with characteristic enthusiasm all the way home. She even concocted a very probable little romance. One would always imagine so many things concerning Americans. They were so extraordinary a people. They acquired wealth by such peculiar means. Their country was so immense. Their resources were so remarkable. 
These persons, for instance, were evidently persons of wealth, and as plainly had risen from the people. The mother was not quite so wholly untaught as the other two, but she was more objectionable. One can bear with the large simplicity of utter ignorance, said my fair philosopher. One frequently finds it gentle and unworldly, but the other is odious because it is always aggressive and narrow. She had taken a strong feminine dislike to Madame la Mère. She makes her family miserable, she said. She drags them from place to place. Possibly there is a lover, more possibly than not. The girl's eyes wore a peculiar look, as if they searched for something far away. She had scarcely concluded her charming little harangue when we reached our destination. But as we passed through the entrance, she paused to speak to the curly headed child of the concierge, whose mother held him by the hand. We shall have new arrivals to morrow, said the good woman who was always ready for friendly gossip. The apartments upon the first floor, and she nodded to me significantly and with good natured encouragement. Perhaps you may get pupils, she added. They are Americans and speak only English, and there is a young lady, Madame says. Americans! exclaimed Clélie with sudden interest. Americans! answered the concierge. It was Madame who came. Mon Dieu! It was wonderful! So rich and so, so! filling up the blank by a shrug of deep meaning. It cannot have been long since they were peasants! her voice dropping into a cautious whisper. Why not our friends of the Louvre? said Clélie as we went on upstairs. Why not? I replied. It is very possible. The next day there arrived at the house numberless trunks of large dimensions, superintended by the small angry woman and a maid. An hour later came a carriage, from whose door emerged the young lady and her father. Both looked pale and fagged. Both were led upstairs in the midst of voluble comments and commands by the mother, and both, entering the apartment, seemed swallowed up by it, as we saw and heard nothing further of them. Clélie was indignant. "'It is plain that the mother overwhelms them,' she said. "'A girl of that age should speak and be interested in any novelty.' This one would be if she were not a wretched. And the poor little husband. My dear, I remarked, you are a feminine Bayard. You engage yourself with such ardour in everybody's wrongs. When I returned from my afternoon's work a few days later, I found Clélie again excited. She had been summoned to the first floor by Madame. I went into the room, said Clélie and found the mother and daughter together. Mademoiselle, who stood by the fire, had evidently been weeping. Madame was in an abrupt and angry mood. She wasted no words. I want you to give her lessons, she said, making an ungraceful gesture in the direction of her daughter. What do you charge a lesson? And on my telling her, she engaged me at once. It's a great deal, but I guess I can pay as well as other people, she remarked. A few of the lessons were given downstairs, and then Clélie preferred a request to Madame. If you will permit, Mademoiselle, to come to my room, you will confer a favour upon me, she said. Fortunately, her request was granted, and so I used afterward to come home to find Mademoiselle Esmeralda in our little salon, at work disconsolately and tremulously. She found it difficult to hold her pencil in the correct manner, and one morning she let it drop, and burst into tears. "'Don't you see? I'll never do it,' she answered miserably. "'Don't you see I couldn't, even if my heart was in it, and it ain't at all?' She held out her little hands piteously for Clélie to look at, they were well enough shaped, and would have been pretty if they had not been robbed of their useful suppleness by labour. 
I've been used to work," she said. "Rough work all my life, and my hands ain't like yours." But you must not be discouraged, Mademoiselle," said Clélie gently. "Time, time," interposed the girl with a frightened look in her pretty grey eyes. "That's what I can't bear to think of, the time that's to come." This was the first of many outbursts of confidence. Afterward, she related to Clélie with the greatest naivete the whole history of the family affairs. They had been the possessors of some barren mountain lands in North Carolina, and her description of their former life was wonderful indeed to the ears of the Parisian. She herself had been brought up with marvelous simplicity and hardihood, barely learning to read and write, and in absolute ignorance of society. A year ago, iron had been discovered upon their property, and the result had been wealth and misery for father and daughter. The mother, who had some vague fancies of the attractions of the great outside world, was ambitious and restless. Monsieur, who was a mild and accommodating person, could only give way before her stronger will. She always had her way with us," said Mademoiselle Esmeralda, scratching nervously upon the paper before her with her pencil at this part of the relation. We did not want to leave home. Neither me nor father, and father said more than I ever heard him say before at one time. Mother, says he, let me and Esmeralda stay at home, and you go and enjoy your tower. You've had more schooling, and you'll be more at home than we should. You're used to to city ways, having lived in Lisbethville, but it only vexed her. People in town had been talking to her about traveling and letting me learn things. And she'd set her mind on it. She was very simple and unsophisticated. To the memory of her former truly singular life, she clung with unshaken fidelity. She recurred to it constantly. The novel and luxury of her new existence seemed to have no attractions for her. One thing even my Clélie found incomprehensible, while she fancied she understood the rest. She did not appear to be moved to pleasure. Even by our beloved Paris, it is a true malady du pays," Clélie remarked to me. "And that is not all. Nor was it all. One day the whole truth was told amid a flood of tears. I, I was going to be married," cried the poor child. "I was to have been married the week the ore was found. I was all ready, and mother." Mother shut right down on us. Clélie glanced at me in amazed questioning. It is a kind of argot which belongs only to Americans, I answered in an undertone. The alliance was broken off. Ciel! Exclaimed my Clélie between her small shut teeth. The woman is a fiend. She was wholly absorbed in her study of this unworldly and untaught nature. She was full of sympathy for its trials and tenderness, and for its pain. Even the girl's peculiarities of speech were full of interest to her. She made serious and intelligent efforts to understand them, as if she studied a new language. It is not common argot, she said. It has its subtleties. One continually finds somewhere an original idea, sometimes even a bon mot, which startles one by its pointedness. As you say, however, it belongs only to the Americans and their remarkable country. A French mind can only arrive at its climaxes through a grave and occasionally tedious research, which would weary most persons, but which, however, does not weary me. The confidence of Mademoiselle Esmeralda was easily won. She became attached to us both, and particularly to Clélie. When her mother was absent or occupied, she stole upstairs to our apartment and spent with us the moments of leisure chance afforded her. She liked our rooms, she told my wife, because they were small, and our society because we were clever, which we discovered afterward meant amiable. But she was always pale and out of spirits. She would sit before our fire, silent and abstracted. "You must not mind if I don't talk," she would say. "I can't. 
and it seems to help me to get to sit and think about things. Mother won't let me do it downstairs. We became also familiar with the father. One day I met him upon the staircase, and to my amazement he stopped as if he wished to address me. I raised my hat and bade him good morning. On his part he drew forth a large handkerchief and began to rub the palms of his hands with awkward timidity. Howdy, he said. I confess that at the moment I was covered with confusion. I, who was a teacher of English, and flattered myself that I wrote and spoke it fluently, did not understand. Immediately, however, it flashed across my mind that the word was a species of salutation, which I finally discovered to be the case. I bowed again and thanked him, hazarding the reply that my health was excellent, and an inquiry as to the state of madame's. He rubbed his hands still more nervously, and answered me in the slow and deliberate manner I had observed at the Louvre. "'Thank ye,' he said. "'She's doing tolerable well, is mother, as well as common, and she's uh, enjoying herself, too. I wish we was all—' But there he checked himself, and glanced hastily about him. Then he began again. "'Esmeraldi,' he said. Esmeralda thinks a heap on you. She takes a side of comfort out of Miss De. I can't call your name, but I mean your wife. Madame de Mar, I replied, is rejoiced indeed to have won the friendship of Mademoiselle. Yes, he proceeded. She takes a side of comfort in you and all, and she needs comfort, does Esmeralda. There ensued a slight pause which somewhat embarrassed me, for at every pause he regarded me with an air of meek and hesitant appeal. "'She's a little down-spirited, is Esmeralda, he said, and, adding this suddenly in a subdued and fearful tone, "'So am I.' Having said this, he seemed to feel that he had overstepped a barrier— he seized the lapel of my coat and held me prisoner, pouring forth his confessions with a faith in my interest by which I was at once amazed and touched. "'You see, it's this way,' he said. "'It's this way, mister. We're home folks, me and Esmeraldi, and we're a long way from home, and it sort of seems like we didn't get no used to, to it than we was at first. We're not like mother. Mother, she was raised in a town. She was raised in Lisbethville. "'and she's always took to town ways. "'But me and Esmeraldi, we was raised in the mountains, "'right under the shadow of Old Bald, "'and town goes hard with us. "'Seems like we're always a-thinkin' of North Carolina. "'And Mother, she gets outed, which is likely. "'She says we ought to fit ourselves for our higher pair, "'and I dare say we'd ought. "'But you see, it goes sort of hard with us, "'and Esmeraldi, she has her trouble, "'and I can't help a-sympathizin' with her, for young folks will be young folks, and I was young folks once myself. Once, once I sought a heap of store by mother. So you see how it is. It is very sad, monsieur, I answered with gravity. Singular as it may appear, this was not so laughable to me as it might seem. It was so apparent that he did not anticipate ridicule. And my Clélie's interest in these people also rendered them sacred in my eyes. Yes, he returned. That's so, and sometimes it's worse than you'd think when mother's outed, and that's why I'm glad as Miss Dymar and Esmeralda is such friends. It struck me at this moment that he had some request to make of me. He grasped the lapel of my coat somewhat more tightly, as if requiring additional support, and finally bent forward and addressed me with caution. Do you think as Miss Dymar would mind it if and now and then I was to step in for Esmeraldi and said a little, just in a kind of neighboring way, Esmeraldi, she says, you're so sociable, and I hain't been sociable with no one for, for a right smart spell, and it seems like I kind of hanker arter it. You've no idea, mister, how lonesome a man can get when he hankers to be sociable and hain't no one to be sociable with. Mother, she says, go out on the champs, El easy and promenade, and I've done it, but some ways it don't reach the spot. I don't seem to get sociable with no one. I've spoke to, maybe, 
through us speaking different languages and not coming to understanding. I've tried it loud and I've tried it low and encouraging, but some ways we never seem to get on, and her Miss Damar wouldn't take no exceptions at me a dropping in. I feel as if I should be sort of uplifted, if she'd only allow it once a week or even fewer. Monsieur, I replied with warmth, I beg you will consider our salon at your disposal, not once a week, but at all times, and Madame de Mar would certainly join me in the invitation if she were upon the spot. He released the lapel of my coat and grasped my hand, shaking it with fervor. Now that's clever, that is, he said, and it's friendly, and I'm obligated to you. Since he appeared to have nothing further to say, we went downstairs together. At the door we parted. I'm a goin, he remarked, to the Champ Elysee, to Promenade. Where are you a goin? To the Boulevard Haussmann, monsieur, to give a lesson, I returned. I will wish you good morning. Good morning, he answered. Bon, reflecting deeply for a moment, bon jour, I'm a-trying to learn it, you see, with a view to being more sociabler. Bonjour. And thus took his departure. After this we saw him frequently. In fact, it became his habit to follow Mademoiselle Esmeralda in all her visits to our apartment. A few minutes after her arrival, we usually heard a timid knock upon the outer door, which proved to emanate from Monsieur, who always entered with a laborious Bonjour and always slipped deprecatingly into the least comfortable chair, near the fire, hurriedly concealing his hat beneath it. In him also my Clélie became much interested. On my own part, I could not cease to admire the fine feeling and delicate tact she continually exhibited in her manner toward him. In time he even appeared to lose something of his first embarrassment and discomfort, though he was always inclined to a reverent silence in her presence. He don't say much, don't father, said Mademoiselle Esmeralda, with tears in her pretty eyes. He's like me, but you don't know what comfort he's taken when he sits and listens and stirs his chocolate round and round without drinking it. He doesn't drink it because he ain't used to it, but he likes to have it when we do, because he says it makes him feel sociable. He's trying to learn to drink it too. He practices every day a little at a time. He was powerful afraid at first that you'd take exceptions to him doing nothing but stir it round. But I told him I knew you wouldn't, for you wasn't that kind. I find him, said Clélie to me, inexpressibly mournful, even though he excites one to smile upon all occasions. Is it not mournful that his very suffering should be absurd? Mon Dieu, he does not wear his clothes— he bears them about with him. He simply carries them. It was about this time that Mademoiselle Esmeralda was rendered doubly unhappy. Since their residence in Paris, Madame had been industriously occupied in making efforts to enter society. She had struggled violently and indefatigably. She was at once persistent and ambitious. She had used every means that lay in her power, and, most of all, she had used her money. Naturally, she had found people upon the outskirts of good circles who would accept her with her money. Consequently, she had obtained acquaintances of a class and was bold enough to employ them as stepping-stones. At all events, she began to receive invitations and to discover opportunities to pay visits and to take her daughter with her. Accordingly, Mademoiselle Esmeralda was placed upon exhibition. She was dressed by experienced artistes. She was forced from her seclusion and obliged to drive and call and promenade. Her condition was pitiable. While all this was torture to her inexperience and timidity, her fear of her mother rendered her wholly submissive. Each day brought with it some new trial. She was admired for many reasons, by some for her wealth, of which all had heard rumours, by others for her freshness and beauty. The silence and sensitiveness which arose from shyness, and her ignorance of all social rules, were called naivete, a 
and modesty, and people who abhorred her mother not unfrequently were charmed with her, and consequently Madame found her also an instrument of some consequence. In her determination to overcome all obstacles, Madame even condescended to apply to my wife, whose influence over Mademoiselle she was clever enough not to undervalue. "'I want you to talk to Mademoiselle,' she said. "'She thinks a great deal of you, and I want you to give her some good advice. "'You know what society is, and you know that she ought to be proud of her advantages, "'and not make a fool of herself. "'Many a girl would be glad enough of what she has before her. "'She's got money, and she's got chances, and I don't begrudge her anything.' She can spend all she likes on clothes and things, and I'll take her anywhere if she'll behave herself. They wear me out, her and her father. It's her father that's ruined her, and her living as she's done. Her father never knew anything, and he's made a pet of her, and got her into his way of thinking. It's ridiculous how little ambition they have, and she might marry as well as any girl. "'There's a marquis that's quite in love with her at this moment, "'and she's as afraid of him as death, "'and cries if I even mention him, "'though he's a nice enough man, if he is a bit elderly. "'Now I want you to reason with her.' "'This Clélie told me afterward. "'And upon going away,' she ended, "'she turned round toward me, "'setting her face into an indescribable expression "'of hardness and obstinacy.' "'I want her to understand,' she said, "'that she's cut off forever from anything that's happened before. "'There's the Atlantic Ocean and many a mile of land "'between her and North Carolina, "'and so she may as well g Part Two of Esmeralda Two or three days after this, "'Mademoiselle came to our apartment in great grief. "'She had left Madame in a violent ill temper.' They had received invitations to a ball at which they were to meet the Marquis. Madame had been elated, and the discovery of Mademoiselle's misery and trepidation had roused her indignation. There had been a painful scene, and Mademoiselle had been overwhelmed, as usual. She knelt before the fire and wept despairingly. "'I'd rather die than go,' she said. "'I can't stand it!' I can't get used to it. The light and the noise and the talk hurts me, and I don't know what I am doing, and people stare at me, and I make mistakes, and I'm not fit for it, and, and, I'd rather be dead fifty thousand times than let that man come near me. I hate him, and I'm afraid of him, and I wish I was dead. At this juncture came the timid summons upon the door, and the father entered with a disturbed and subdued air. He did not conceal his hat, but held it in his hands, and turned it round and round in an agitated manner as he seated himself beside his daughter. Esmeralda, he said, "'Don't you take it so hard, honey. Mother, she's kind of outed, and she's not at herself rightly. Don't you never mind. Mother, she means well, but—' "'But she's got a sort of curious way of showing it. "'She's got a high spirit, and we'd ought to allow for it, "'and not take it so much to heart. "'Miss Dymar here knows how high-spirited people is sometimes, I dare say. "'And, Mother, she's got a powerful high spirit.' "'But the poor child only wept more hopelessly. "'It was not only the cruelty of her mother which oppressed her, "'it was the wound she bore in her heart.' Clélie's eyes filled with tears as she regarded her. The father was also more broken in spirit than he wished it to appear. His weather-beaten face assumed an expression of deep melancholy, which at last betrayed itself in an evidently inadvertent speech. "'I wish, I wish,' he faltered. "'Lord, I'd give a heap to see Wash now. I'd give a heap to see him, Esmeraldi.' It was as if the words were the last straw. The girl turned toward him and flung herself upon his breast with a passionate cry. "'Oh, father!' she sobbed. "'We shan't never see him again, never, never, nor the mountains, nor the people that cared for us. We've lost it all, and we can't get back, and we haven't a soul that's near to us, and we're all alone, you and me, father, and Wash.' 
Wash, he thinks we don't care. I must confess to a momentary spasm of alarm. Her grief was so wild and overwhelming. One hand was flung about her father's neck, and the other pressed itself against her side, as if her heart was breaking. Clélie bent down and lifted her up, consoling her tenderly. Mademoiselle, she said, do not despair. Le bon Dieu will surely have pity. The father drew forth the large linen handkerchief, and unfolding it slowly, applied it to his eyes. Yes, Esmeralda, he said. Don't let us give out. At least don't you give out. It doesn't matter for me, Esmeralda, because, you see, I must hold on to mother, as I swore not to go back on. But you're young and likely, Esmeralda, and don't you give out yet, for the Lord's sake. But she did not cease weeping until she had wholly fatigued herself, and by this time there arrived a message from Madame, who required her presence downstairs. Monsieur was somewhat alarmed and rose precipitately, but Mademoiselle was too full of despair to admit of fear. It's only the dressmaker, she said. You can stay where you are, father, and she won't guess we've been together, and it'll be better for us both. And, accordingly, she obeyed the summons alone. Great were the preparations made by Madame for the entertainment. My wife, to whom she displayed the costumes and jewellery she had purchased, was aroused to an admiration truly feminine. She had the discretion to trust to the taste of the artistes, and had restrained them in nothing. Consequently, all that was to be desired in the appearance of Mademoiselle Esmeralda upon the eventful evening was happiness. With her mother's permission, she came to our room to display herself, Monsieur following her with an air of awe and admiration commingled. Her costume was rich and exquisite, and her beauty beyond criticism. But as she stood in the centre of our little salon to be looked at, she presented an appearance to move one's heart. The pretty young face, which had by this time lost its slight traces of the sun, had also lost some of its bloom. The slight figure was not so round nor so erect as it had been, and moved with less spirit and girlishness. It appeared that Monsieur observed this also, for he stood apart, regarding her with evident depression, and occasionally used his handkerchief with a violence that was evidently meant to conceal some secret emotion. "'You're not so pert as he was, Esmeralda,' he remarked tremulously. "'Not as pert by a light smart. And what with that, and what with your fixings, wash, I mean the home folks, hastily, they'd hardly know you.' He followed her downstairs mournfully when she took her departure, and Clélie and myself being left alone interested ourselves in various speculations concerning them, as was our habit. "'This Monsieur Walsh,' remarked Clélie, "'is clearly the lover. Poor child, how passionately she regrets him, and thousands of miles lie between them, thousands of miles!' It was not long after this that, on my way downstairs to make a trifling purchase, I met with something approaching an adventure. It so chanced that, as I descended the staircase of the second floor, the door of the first-floor apartment was thrown open, and from it issued Mademoiselle Esmeralda and her mother on their way to the waiting carriage. My interest in the appearance of Mademoiselle in her white robes and sparkling jewels so absorbed me that I inadvertently brushed against a figure which stood in the shadow regarding them also. Turning at once to apologize, I found myself confronting a young man, tall, powerful, but with a sad and haggard face, and attired in a strange and homely dress which had a foreign look. Monsieur! I exclaimed, a thousand pardons, I was so unlucky as not to see you. But he did not seem to hear. He remained silent, gazing fixedly at the ladies until they had disappeared, and then, on my addressing him again, he awakened, as it were, with a start. It doesn't matter, he answered in a heavy, bewildered voice, and in English, and turning back made his way slowly up the stairs. 
but even the utterance of this brief sentence had betrayed to my practised ear a peculiar accent, an accent which, strange to say, bore a likeness to that of our friends downstairs, and which caused me to stop a moment at the lodge of the concierge, and ask her a question or so. "'Have we a new occupant upon the fifth floor?' I inquired. "'A person who speaks English?' She answered me with a dubious expression. "'You must mean the strange young man upon the sixth, she said. "'He is a new one, and speaks English. Indeed, he does not speak anything else, or even understand a word. "'Mon Dieu! The trials one encounters with such persons, endeavouring to comprehend poor creatures, and failing always.' "'And this one is worse than the rest, and looks more wretched, as if he had not a friend in the world.' "'What is his name?' I asked. "'How can one remember their names? It is worse than impossible. This one is frightful, but he has no letters, thank heaven. If there should arrive one with an impossible name upon it, I should take it to him and run the risk.' Naturally, Clélie, to whom I related the incident, was much interested. But it was some time before either of us saw the hero of it again, though both of us confessed to having been upon the watch for him. The concierge could only tell us that he lived a secluded life, rarely leaving his room in the daytime, and seeming to be very poor. "'He does not work, and he eats next to nothing,' she said. "'Late at night he occasionally carries up a loaf, and once he treated himself to a cup of bouillon from the restaurant at the corner, but it was only once, poor young man!' He is at least very gentle and well conducted. So it was not to be wondered at that we did not see him. Clélie mentioned him to her young friend, but Mademoiselle's interest in him was only faint and ephemeral. She had not the spirit to rouse herself to any strong emotion. I dare say he's an American, she said. There are plenty of Americans in Paris, but none of them seem a bit nearer to me than if they were French. They are all rich and fine, and they all like the life here better than the life at home. This is the first poor one I have heard of. Each day brought fresh unhappiness to her. Madame was inexorable. She spent a fortune upon toilette for her, and insisted upon dragging her from place to place, and wearying her with gaieties from which her sad young heart shrank. Each afternoon their equipage was to be seen upon the Champs-Élysées, and each evening it stood before the door, waiting to bear them to some place of festivity. Mademoiselle's bête noire, the Marquis, who was a debilitated roux in search of a fortune, attached himself to them upon all occasions. Bah! said Clélie with contempt. She amazes one by her imbecility, this woman. Truly one would imagine that her vulgar sharpness would teach her that his object is to use her as a tool, and that having gained Mademoiselle's fortune, he will treat them with brutality and derision. But she did not seem to see. Possibly she fancied that having obtained him for a son-in-law, she would be bold and clever enough to outwit and control him. Consequently, he was encouraged and fawned upon, and Mademoiselle grew thin and pale and large-eyed, and wore continually an expression of secret terror. Only in her visits to our fifth floor did she dare to give way to her grief, and truly at such times both my Clélie and I were greatly affected. Upon one occasion, indeed, she filled us both with alarm. "'Do you know what I shall do?' she said, stopping suddenly in the midst of her weeping. "'I'll bear it as long as I can, and then I'll put an end to it. "'There's there's always the sand left, and I have laid awake and thought of it many a night. "'Father and me saw a man taken out of it one day, "'and the people said he was a Tyrolean, and drowned himself because he was so poor and lonely and, and so far from home.' Upon the very morning she made this speech, I saw again our friend of the sixth floor. In going downstairs I came upon him, sitting upon one of the steps as if exhausted, and when he turned his face upward, its pallor and haggardness startled me. His tall form was wasted, his eyes were hollow, the peculiarities I had before observed were doubly marked. He was even emaciated. "'Monsieur,' I said in English, you appear indisposed. 
You have been ill. Allow me to assist you to your room. No, thank you, he answered. It's only weakness. I... I sort of give out. Don't trouble yourself. I shall get over it directly. Something in his face, which was a very young and well-looking one, forced me to leave him in silence, merely bowing as I did so. I felt instinctively that to remain would be to give him additional pain. As I passed the room of the concierge, however, the excellent woman beckoned to me to approach her. "'Did you see the young man?' she inquired rather anxiously. "'He has shown himself this morning for the first time in three days. There is something wrong. It is my impression that he suffers want, that he is starving himself to death.' Her rosy countenance absolutely paled as she uttered these last words, retreating a pace from me and touching my arm with her forefinger. "'He has carried up even less bread than usual during the last few weeks,' she added. "'And there has been no bouillon whatever. "'A young man cannot live only on dry bread and too little of that. "'He will perish, and apart from the inhumanity of the thing, "'it will be unpleasant for the other locataire.' I wasted no time in returning to Clélie, having indeed some hope that I might find the poor fellow still occupying his former position upon the staircase. But in this I met with disappointment. He was gone, and I could only relate to my wife what I had heard, and trust to her discretion. As I had expected, she was deeply moved. "'It is terrible,' she said, "'and it is also a delicate and difficult matter to manage. But what can one do? There is only one thing—' I, who am a woman, and have suffered privation myself, may venture. Accordingly, she took her departure for the floor above. I heard her light summons upon the door of one of the rooms, but heard no reply. At last, however, the door was opened gently, and with a hesitance that led me to imagine that it was Clélie herself who had pushed it open, and immediately afterwards I was sure that she had uttered an alarmed exclamation. I stepped out upon the landing and called to her in a subdued tone. Clélie, I said, did I hear you speak? Yes, she returned from within the room. Come at once, and bring with you some brandy. In the shortest possible time I had joined her in the room, which was bare, cold, and unfurnished, a mere garret, in fact, containing nothing but a miserable bedstead. Upon the floor, near the window, knelt Clélie, supporting with her knee and arm the figure of the young man she had come to visit. Quick with the brandy! she exclaimed. This may be a faint, but it looks like death. She had found the door partially open, and receiving no answer to her knock, had pushed it farther ajar, and caught a glimpse of the fallen figure, and hurried to its assistance. To be as brief as possible, we both remained at the young man's side during the whole of the night. As the concierge had said, he was perishing from inanition, and the physician we called in assured us that only the most constant attention would save his life. Monsieur, Clélie explained to him upon the first occasion upon which he opened his eyes. You are ill and alone, and we wish to befriend you. And he was too weak to require from her anything more definite. Physically, he was a person to admire. In health, his muscular power must have been immense. He possessed the frame of a young giant, and yet there was in his face a look of innocence and experience amazing even when one recollected his youth. "'It is the look,' said Clélie, regarding him attentively. "'The look one sees in the faces of Monsieur and his daughter downstairs. "'The look of a person who has lived a simple life "'and who knows absolutely nothing of the world.' "'It is possible that this may have prepared the reader for the denouement which followed, "'but singular as it may appear, it did not prepare either Clélie or myself.' perhaps because we had seen the world, and, having learned to view it in a practical light, were not prepared to encounter suddenly a romance almost unparalleled. The next morning I was compelled to go out to give my lessons as usual, and left Clélie with our patient. On my return, my wife, hearing my footsteps, came out and met me upon the landing. She was moved by the strongest emotion and much excited. Her cheeks were pale, and her eyes shone "'Do not go in yet,' she said. "'I have something to tell you. "'It is almost incredible, but it is the lover.' 
For a moment we remained silent, standing looking at each other. To me it seemed incredible indeed. He could not give her up, Clelly went on, until he was sure she wished to discard him. The mother had employed all her ingenuity to force him to believe that such was the case, but he could not rest until he had seen his betrothed face to face. So he followed her, poor, inexperienced, and miserable, and when at last he saw her at distance, the luxury with which she was surrounded caused his heart to fail him, and he gave way to despair. I accompanied her into the room, and heard the rest from his own lips. He gathered together all his small savings, and made his journey in the cheapest possible way, in the steerage of the vessel, and in third-class carriages, so that he might have some trifle left to subsist upon. "'I've a little farm,' he said, "'and there's a house on it, but I wouldn't sell that. If she cared to go, it was all I had to take her to, and I'd worked hard to buy it. I'd worked hard, early and late, always thinking that some day we'd begin a life there together, Esmeralda and me.' "'Since neither sea nor land nor cruelty could separate them,' said Clélie to me during the day, "'it is not I who will help to hold them apart.' So, when Mademoiselle came for her lessons that afternoon, it was Clélie's task to break the news to her, to tell her that neither sea nor land lay between herself and her lover, and that he was faithful still.' She received the information as she might have received a blow, staggering backward and whitening, and losing her breath, but almost immediately afterwards she uttered a sad cry of disbelief and anguish. "'No, no!' she said. "'It, it isn't true. I won't believe it. I mustn't. There's half the world between us. Oh, don't try to make me believe it, when it can't be true!' "'Come with me,' replied Clélie. Never, never in my life has it been my fate to see, before or since, a sight so touching as the meeting of these two young hearts. When the door of the cold, bare room opened, and Mademoiselle Esmeralda entered, the lover held out his weak arms with a sob, a sob of rapture, and yet terrible to hear. "'I thought you'd gone back on me, Esmeralda,' he cried. I thought you'd gone back on me. Clélie and I turned away and left them as the girl fell upon her knees at his side. The effect produced upon the father, who had followed Mademoiselle as usual, and whom we found patiently seated upon the bottom step of the flight of stairs, awaiting our arrival, was almost indescribable. He sank back upon his seat with a gasp, clutching at his hat with both hands. He also disbelieved. Wash, he exclaimed weakly. Lord, no, Lord, no, not Wash. Wash, he's in North Carolina. Lord, no. He is upstairs, returned Clélie, and Mademoiselle is with him. During the recovery of Monsieur Wash, though but little was said upon the subject, it is my opinion that the minds of each of our number pointed only toward one course in the future. In Mademoiselle's demeanour there appeared a certain air of new courage and determination, though she was still pallid and anxious. It was as if she had passed a climax and had gained strength. Monsieur, the father, was alternately nervous and dejected, or in feverishly high spirits. Occasionally he sat for some time without speaking, merely gazing into the fire, with a hand upon each knee, and it was one evening, after a more than usually prolonged silence of this description, that he finally took upon himself the burden which lay upon us unitedly. Esmeralda, he remarked, tremulously, and with manifest trepidation. Esmeralda, I've been thinking, it's time, we broke it to mother. The girl lost colour, but she lifted her head steadily. "'Yes, father,' she answered. "'It's time.' "'Yes,' he echoed, rubbing his knees slowly. "'It's time, and, Esmeralda, it's a thing to—to to sort of set a man back.' "'Yes, father,' she answered again. "'Yes, 
as before, though his voice broke somewhat. And, I dare say, you know how it'll be, Esmeralda, that you'll have to choose betwixt mother and wash. She sat by her lover, and for answer she dropped her face upon his hand with a sob. And, and you've chose wash, Esmeralda. Yes, father. He hesitated a moment, and then took his hat from its place of concealment, and rose. It's natural, he said, and it's right. I wouldn't want it no other way, and you mustn't mind, Esmeralda. It's been kind of rough on me, as can't go back on mother, having swore to cherish her till death do us part. You've always been a good gal to me, and we've thought a heap on each other, and I reckon it can allers be the same way, even though we're separated, for it's natural you should have chose Wash, and, and, I wouldn't have it no other way, Esmeralda. Now, I'll go and have it out with Mother. We were all sufficiently unprepared for the announcement to be startled by it. Mademoiselle Esmeralda, who was weeping bitterly, half sprang to her feet. Tonight, she said. Oh, father! Yes, he replied. I've been thinking over it, and I don't see no other way, and it may as well be tonight as any other time. After leaving us, he was absent for about an hour. When he returned, there were traces in his appearance of the storm through which he had passed. His hands trembled with agitation. He even looked weakened as he sank into his chair. We regarded him with commiseration. It's over, he half whispered. And it was even rougher than I thought it would be. She was terrible outed, was mother. I reckon I never see her so outed before. She just raged and tore. It was more than I could stand, Esmeralda. And he dropped his head upon his hands for support. Seemed like it was the Marcus as laid heaviest upon her he proceeded. She was terrible sod on the Marcus, and every time she think of him, she'd just rear. She'd just rear. I never stood up again mother afore, and I hope I shan't never have it to do again in my time. I'm kinder wore out. Little by little we learned much of what had passed, though he evidently withheld the most for the sake of Mademoiselle, and it was some time before he broke the news to her that her mother's doors were closed against her. "'I think you'll find it pleasanter stopping here,' he said. "'If Miss Dymar'll board ye until the time for starting home, her spirit was so up that she said she didn't aim to see ye no more, and you know how she is, Esmeralda, when her spirit's up.' The girl went and clung around his neck, kneeling at his side and shedding tears. "'Oh, father!' she cried. "'You've bore a great deal for me. "'You've bore more than any one knows, and all for me.' "'He looked rather grave as he shook his head at the fire. "'That's so, Esmeralda,' he replied. "'But we always seemed nigh to each other, somehow, "'and when it come to the worst, "'I was bound to kinder to make a stand for you, "'as I couldn't have made for myself.' I couldn't have done it for myself. Lord, no. So Mademoiselle remained with us, and Clélie assisted her to prepare her simple outfit, and in the evening the tall young lover came into our apartment and sat looking on, which aspect of affairs, I will confess, was entirely new to Clélie, and yet did not displease her. Their candor moves me, she said. He openly regards her with adoration, at parting she accompanies him to the door, and he embraces her tenderly, and yet one is not repelled. It is the love of the lost Arcadia, serious and innocent. Finally, we went with them one morning to the American chapel in the Rue de Bern, and they were united in our presence and that of Monsieur, who was indescribably affected. After the completion of the ceremony, he presented Monsieur Roche with a package. "'It's papers as I've had drawed up for Esmeralda,' he said. "'It'll start you well out in the world. "'Then after me and mother's gone, "'there's no one but you and her to have rest. "'The Lord, 
May the Lord bless you. We accompanied them to Havre, and did not leave them until the last moment. Monsieur was strangely excited, and clung to the hands of his daughter and son-in-law, talking fast and nervously, and pouring out messages to be delivered to his distant friends. Tell him I'd lack powerful well to see em all, and I'd have come, only, only things were kinder inconvenient. Sometime, perhaps. But here he was obliged to clear his throat, as his voice had become extremely husky, and, having done this, he added in an undertone, You see, Esmeralda, I couldn't, because of mother, as I've swore not to go back on. Wash, he wouldn't go back on you, however high your spirit was, and I can't go back on mother. The figures of the young couple standing at the side, Monsieur Wash holding his wife to his breast with one strong arm, were the last we saw as the ship moved slowly away. It is obscurity to which they are returning, I said, half unconsciously. It is love, said Clélie. The father, who had been standing apart, came back to us, replacing in his pocket his handkerchief. They are young and likely, you see, said Monsieur, and life before them, and it's natural as she should have chose Wash, as was young too, and sought on her. Lord, it's natural, and I wouldn't have it no other ways. My Robin There came to me among the letters I received last spring, one which touched me very closely. It was a letter full of delightful things, but the delightful thing which so reached my soul was a question. The writer had been reading The Secret Garden, and her question was this. Did you own the original of the robin? He could not have been a mere creature of fantasy. I feel sure you owned him. I was thrilled to the centre of my being. Here was someone who plainly had been intimate with robins, English robins. I wrote and explained, as far as one could in a letter, what I am now going to relate in detail. I did not own the robin. He owned me, or perhaps we owned each other. He was an English robin, and he was a person, not a mere bird. An English robin differs greatly from the American one. He is much smaller and quite differently shaped. His body is daintily round and plump. His legs are delicately slender. He is a graceful little patrician with an astonishing allurement of bearing. His eye is large and dark and dewy. He wears a tight little red satin waistcoat on his full round breast, and every tilt of his head, every flirt of his wing, is instinct with dramatic significance. He is fascinatingly conceited. He burns with curiosity. He is determined to engage in social relations at almost any cost, and his raging jealousy of attention paid to less worthy objects than himself drives him at times to efforts to charm and distract, which are irresistible. An intimacy with a robin, an English robin, is a liberal education. This particular one I knew in my rose garden in Kent. I feel sure he was born there, and for a summer at least believed it to be the world. It was a lovesome, mystic place shut in partly by old red brick walls, against which fruit trees were trained, and partly by a laurel hedge with a wood behind it. It was my habit to sit and write there, under an aged writhen tree, grey with lichen and festooned with roses. The soft silence of it, the remote aloofness, were the most perfect ever dreamed of. But let me not be led astray by the garden, I must be firm and confine myself to the robin. The garden shall be another story. There were so many people in this garden, people with feathers or fur, who, because I sat so quietly, did not mind me in the least, that it was not a surprising thing when I looked up one summer morning to see a small bird hopping about the grass a yard or so away from me. The surprise was not that he was there, 
but that he stayed there. Or rather he continued to hop, with short reflective looking hops, and that while hopping he looked at me, not in a furtive flighty way, but rather as a person might tentatively regard a very new acquaintance. The absolute truth of the matter, I had reason to believe later, was that he did not know I was a person. I may have been the first of my species he had seen in this rose garden world of his, and he thought I was only another kind of robin. I was, too, though that was a secret of mine, and nobody but myself knew it. Because of this fact, I had the power of holding myself still, quite still, and filling myself with softly alluring tenderness of the tenderest, when any little wild thing came near me. "'What do you do to make him come to you like that?' someone asked me a month or so later. "'What do you do?' "'I don't know what I do exactly,' I said, "'except that I hold myself very still and feel like a robin.' "'You can only do that with a tiny wild thing by being so tender of him, "'of his little timidities and feelings.' so adoringly anxious not to startle him or suggest by any movement the possibility of your being a creature who could hurt, that your very yearning to understand his tiny hopes and fears and desires makes you for the time cease to be quite a mere human thing and give you another and more exquisite sense which speaks for you without speech. As I sat and watched him, I held myself softly still, and felt just that. I did not know he was a robin. The truth was that he was too young at that time to look like one, but I did not know that either. He was plainly not a thrush, or a linnet, or a sparrow, or a starling, or a blackbird. He was a little indeterminate coloured bird, and he had no red on his breast. And as I sat and gazed at him, he gazed at me as one quite without prejudice unless it might be with the slightest tinge of favour, and hopped, and hopped, and hopped. That was the thrill and wonder of it. No bird, however evident his acknowledgement of my harmlessness, had ever hopped and remained. Many had perched for a moment in the grass or on a nearby bough, had trilled or chirped or secured a scurrying golden green beetle and flown away but none had stayed to inquire, to reflect, even to seem, if one dared to be so bold as to hope such a thing, to make mysterious, almost occult advances towards intimacy. Also I had never before heard of such a thing happening to anyone, howsoever bird-loving. Birds are creatures who must be wooed, and it must be delicate and careful wooing which allures them into friendship. I held my soft stillness. Would he stay? Could it be that the last hop was nearer? Yes, it was. The moment was a breathless one. Dare one believe that the next was nearer still, and the next, and the next, and that the two yards of distance had become scarcely one, and that within that radius he was soberly hopping around my very feet with his quite unafraid eye full upon me? This was what was happening. It may not seem exciting, but it was. That a little wild thing should come to one unasked was of a thrillingness touched with awe. Without stirring a muscle, I began to make low, soft little sounds to him, very low and very caressing indeed, softer than one makes to a baby. I wanted to weave a spell to establish mental communication, to make magic, and as I uttered the tiny sounds he hopped nearer and nearer. Oh, to think that you will come as near as that, I whispered to him. You know, you know that nothing in the world would make me put out my hand or startle you in the least tiniest way. You know it because you are a real person as well as a lovely, lovely little bird thing. You know it because you are a soul. Because of this first morning, I knew, years later, 
that this was what Mistress Mary thought when she bent down in the long walk and tried to make robin sounds. I said it all in a whisper, and I think the words must have sounded like robin sounds because he listened with interest, and at last, miracle of miracles as it seemed to me, he actually fluttered up onto a small shrub not two yards away from my knee, and sat there as one who was pleased with the topic of conversation. I did not move, of course. I sat still and waited his pleasure. Not for mines of rubies would I have lifted a finger. I think he stayed near me altogether about half an hour. Then he disappeared. Where or even exactly when I did not know. One moment he was hopping among some of the rose bushes, and then he was gone. This, in fact, was his little mysterious way from first to last. Through all the months of our delicious intimacy, he never let me know where he lived. I knew it was in the rose garden, but that was all. His extraordinary freedom from timorousness was something to think over. After reflecting upon him a good deal, I thought I had reached an explanation. He had been born in the rose garden, and being of a home-loving nature, he had declined to follow the rest of his family when they had made their first flight over the wall into the rose walk or over the laurel hedge into the pheasant cover behind. He had stayed in the rose world and then had felt lonely, without father or mother or sisters or brothers, desolateness of spirit fell upon him. He saw a creature, I insist on believing that he thought it another order of Robin, and approached to see what it would say. Its whole bearing was confidence-inspiring. It made softly alluring, if unexplainable, sounds. He felt its friendliness and affection. It was curious to look at, and far too large for any ordinary nest. It plainly could not fly but there was not a shadow of inimical sentiment in it. Instinct told him that. It admired him. It wanted him to remain near. There was a certain comfort in its caressing atmosphere. He liked it and felt less desolate. He would return to it again. The next day summer rains kept me in the house. The next I went to the rose garden in the morning and sat down under my tree to work. I had not been there half an hour when I felt I must lift my eyes and look. A little indeterminate coloured bird was hopping quietly about in the grass, quite aware of me as his dew-bright eye manifested. He had come again, of intention, because we were mates. It was the beginning of an intimacy not to be described unless one filled a small volume. From that moment we never doubted each other for one second. He knew, and I knew. Each morning when I came into the rose garden, he came to call on me and discover things he wanted to know concerning robins of my size and unusual physical conformation. He did not understand, but he was attracted by me. Each day I held myself still and tried to make robin sounds expressive of adoring tenderness and he came each day a little nearer. At last arrived a day when, as I softly left my seat and moved about the garden, he actually quietly hopped after me. I wish I could remember exactly what length of time elapsed before I knew he was really a robin. An ornithologist would doubtless know, but I do not. But one morning I was bending over a bed of Lorette Messimi roses, and I became aware that he had arrived in his usual mysterious way, without warning. He was standing in the grass, and when I turned my eyes upon him, I only just saved myself from starting, which would have meant disaster. I saw upon his breast the first dawning of a flush of colour, more tawny than actual red at that stage, but it hinted at revelations. Further subterfuge is useless, I said to him. You are betrayed. You are a robin. And he did not attempt to deny it either then or at any future time. In less than two weeks he revealed a tight, glossy little bright red satin waistcoat and with it a certain youthful maturity such as one beholds in the wearer 
of a first dress suit. His movements were more brisk and certain. He began to make little flights and little sounds, though for some time he made no attempt to sing. Instead of appearing suddenly in the grass at my feet, a heavenly little rush of wings would bring him to a bough over my head, or a twig quite near me, where he would tilt daintily, taking his silent but quite responsive part in the conversations which always took place between us. It was I who talked, telling him how I loved him, how satin-red his waistcoat was, how large and bright his eyes, how delicate and elegant his slender legs. I flattered him a great deal. He adored flattery, and I am sure he loved me most when I told him that it was impossible to say anything which could flatter him. It gave him confidence in my good taste. One morning, a heavenly sunny one, I was conversing with him by the Lorette Messimis again, and he was evidently much pleased with the things I said. Perhaps he liked my hat, which was a large white one with a wreath of roses round its crown. I saw him look at it, and I gently hinted that I had worn it in the hope that he would approve. I had broken off a handful of coral pink lorettes, and was arranging them idly when he spread his wings in a sudden upward flight, a tiny swift flight which ended among the roses on my hat, the very hat on my head. Did I make myself still then? Did I stir by a single hair's breath? Who does not know? I scarcely let myself breathe. I could not believe that such a thing of pure joy could be true. But in a minute I realized that he at least was not afraid to move. He was perfectly at home. He hopped about the brim and examined the roses with delicate pecks. That I was under the hat apparently only gave him confidence. He knew me as well as that. He stayed until he had learnt all he wished to know about garden hats, and then he lightly flew away. From that time each day drew us closer to each other. He began to perch on twigs only a few inches from my face, and listen while I whispered to him. Yes, he listened, and made answer with chirps. Nothing else would describe it. As I wrote, he would alight on my manuscript paper and try to read. Sometimes I thought he was a little offended because he found my handwriting so bad that he could not understand it. He would take crumbs out of my hand. He would alight on my chair or my shoulder. The instant I opened the little door in the leaf-covered garden wall, I would be greeted by the darling little rush of wings, and he was beside me. And he always came from nowhere and disappeared into space. That, through the whole summer, was his rarest fascination. Perhaps he was not a real robin. Perhaps he was a fairy. Who knows? Among the many house parties staying with me, he was a subject of thrilled interest. People knew of him who had not seen him, and it became a custom with callers to say, May we go into the rose garden and see the robin? One of my American guests said he was uncanny, and called him the goblin robin. No one had ever seen a thing so curiously human, so much more than mere bird. When I took callers to the rose garden, he was exquisitely polite. He always came when I stood under my tree and called, but he never at such times met me with his rush to the little door. He would perch near me and talk, but there was a difference. Certain exquisite intimate charms he kept for me alone. I wondered when he would begin to sing. One morning, the sun being strong enough to pierce through the leaves of my tree, I had a large Japanese tent umbrella arranged so that it shaded my table as I wrote. Suddenly I heard a robin's song, which sounded as if it were being trilled from some tree at a little distance from where I sat. It was so pretty that I leaned forward to see exactly where the singer perched. I made a delicious discovery. He was not on a tree at all. He was perched upon the very end of one of the bamboo ribs of my big flowery umbrella. He was my own robin, and there he sat singing to me his first tiny song, showing me that he had found out how to do it. The effect of singing at a distance was produced by the curious fact that he was singing 
with his bill closed, his darling scarlet throat puffed out and tremulous with the captive trills. Perhaps a robin's first song is always of this order, I do not know. I only know that this was his earlier manner. My enraptured delight I expressed to him in my most eloquent phrases. I praised him, I flattered him, I made him believe that no robin had really ever sung before. He was much pleased and flew down onto the table to hear all about it and incite me to further effort. In a few days he had learnt to sing perfectly, not with the low, distant-sounding note, but with open breek and clear, brilliant little roulades and trills. He grew prouder and prouder. When he saw I was busy, he would tilt on a nearby bough and call me with flirtatious, provocative outbreaking of song. He knew that it was impossible for anyone to resist him, anyone in the world. Of course I would get up and stand beneath his tree with my face upturned and tell him that his charm, his beauty, his fascination and my love were beyond the power of words to express. He knew that would happen and reveled in it. His tiny airs and graces, his devices to attract and absorb attention, was unending. He invented new ones every day, and each was more enslaving than the last. Could it be that he was guilty, when he met other robins, of boasting of his conquest of me and of my utter subjugation? I cannot believe it possible. Also, I never saw other robins accost him or linger in their passage through the rose garden to exchange civilities. And yet a very strange thing occurred on one occasion. I was sitting at my table expecting him and heard a familiar chirp. When I looked up, he was a tilt upon the branch of an apple tree nearby. I greeted him with little whistles and twitters, thinking of course that he would fly down to me for our usual conversation. But though he chirped a reply and put his head on one side engagingly, he did not move from his bow. What is the matter with you? I said. Come down, come down, little brother. But he did not come. He only sidled and twittered and stayed where he was. This was so extraordinary that I got up and went to him. As I looked, a curious doubt came upon me. He looked like Tweety, which had become his baptismal name. He tilted his head and flirted and twittered after the manner of Tweety. But could it be that he was not what he pretended to be? Could he be a stranger bird? That seemed out of the question, as no stranger bird would have comported himself with such familiarity. No stranger surely would have come so near and addressed me with such intimate twitterings and well-known airs and graces. I was mystified beyond measure. I exerted all my powers to lure him from his branch, but descend from it he would not. He listened and smiled and flirted his tail, but he stayed where he was. Listen, I said at last, I don't believe in you. There is a mystery here. You pretend you know me, and yet you act as if you were afraid of me, just like a common bird who is made of nothing but feathers. I don't believe you are Tweety at all. You are an impostor. Believable or not, just at that moment when I stood there under the bough arguing, reproaching and beguiling by turns and puzzled beyond measure, out of the nowhere darted a little scarlet flame of frenzy, Tweety himself, with his feathers ruffled and on fire with fury. The robin on the branch actually was an impostor, and Tweety had discovered him red-breasted, if not red-handed, with crime. Oh, the sight it was to behold him in his tiny berserker rage at his impudent rival. He flew at him, he beat him, he smacked him, he pecked him, he shrieked bad language at him. He drove him from the branch, from the tree, from one tree after another, as the little traitor tried to take refuge. He drove him from the rose garden, over the laurel hedge, and into the pheasant cover in the wood. Perhaps he killed him and left him slain in the bracken, I could not see. But having beaten him once and forever, he came back to me, panting, all fluffed up, and with bloodthirst only just dying in his eye. 
He came down onto my table, out of breath as he agitatedly rearranged his untidy feathers, and indignant, almost unreconcilable because I had been such an undiscriminating and feeble-minded imbecile as to be for one moment deceived. His righteous wrath was awful to behold. I was so frightened that I felt quite pale, with those wiles of the serpent which every noble woman finds herself forced to employ at times, I endeavoured to pacify him. Of course I did not really believe he was you, I said tremulously. He was your inferior in every respect. His waistcoat was not nearly so beautiful as yours. His eyes were not so soul-compelling. His legs were not nearly so elegant and slender and there was an expression about his beak which I distrusted from the first. You heard me tell him he was an impostor. He began to listen. He became calmer. He relented. He kindly ate a crumb out of my hand. We began mutually to understand the infamy of the situation. The impostor had been secretly watching us. He had envied us our happiness. Into his degenerate mind had stolen the darkling and criminal thought that he, audacious scoundrel, might impose upon me by pretending he was not merely a Robin, but the Robin, Tweety himself, and that he might supplant him in my affections. But he had been confounded and cast into outer darkness, and again we were one. I will not attempt to deceive. He was jealous beyond bounds. It was necessary for me to be most discreet in my demeanour towards the head gardener, with whom I was obliged to consult frequently. When he came into the rose garden for orders, Tweety at once appeared. He followed us, hopping in the grass or from rosebush to rosebush. No word of ours escaped him. If our conversation on the enthralling subjects of fertiliser and aphids seemed in its earnest absorption to verge upon the emotional and tender, he interfered at once. He commanded my attention. He perched on nearby boughs and endeavoured to distract me. He fluttered about and called me with chirps. His last resource was always to fly to the topmost twig of an apple tree and begin to sing his most brilliant song in his most thrilling tone and with an affected manner. Naturally, we were obliged to listen and talk about him. Even old Barton's weather-beaten apple face would wrinkle into smiles. He's doing that to make us look at him, he would say. That's what he's doing it for. He can't abide not to be noticed. But it was not only his vanity which drew him to me. He loved me. The low song trilled in his little pulsating scarlet throat was mine. He sang it only to me and he would never sing it when anyone else was there to hear. When we were quite alone, with only roses and bees and sunshine and silence about us, when he swung on some spray quite close to me, and I stood and talked to him in whispers, then he would answer me, each time I paused, with the little far-away sounding trills, the sweetest, most wonderful little sounds in the world. A clever person who knew more of the habits of birds than I did told me a most curious thing. That is his little mating song, he said. You have inspired a hopeless passion in a robin. Perhaps so. He thought the rose garden was the world, and it seemed to me he never went out of it during the summer months. At whatsoever hour I appeared and called him, he came out of bushes, but from a different point each time. In late autumn, however, one afternoon, I saw him fly to me from over a wall dividing the enclosed garden from the open ones. I thought he looked guilty and fluttered when he alighted near me. I think he did not want me to know. You have been making the acquaintance of a young lady, Robin, I said to him. Perhaps you are already engaged to her for the next season. He tried to persuade me that it was not true but I felt he was not entirely frank. After that it was plain that he had discovered that the rose garden was not all the world. He knew about the other side of the wall, but it did not absorb him altogether. He was seldom absent when I came, and he never failed to answer my call. 
I talked to him often about the young Lady Robin, but though he showed a gentlemanly reticence on the subject, I knew quite well he loved me best. He loved my Robin sounds, he loved my whispers, his dewy dark eyes looked into mine, as if he knew we two understood strange tender things others did not. I was only a mere tenant of the beautiful place I had had for nine years, and that winter the owner sold the estate. In December I was to go to Montreux for a couple of months. In March I was to return to Maytham and close it before leaving it finally. Until I left for Switzerland, I saw my robin every day. Before I went away, I called him to me and told him where I was going. He was such a little thing. Two or three months might seem a lifetime to him. He might not remember me so long. I was not a real robin. I was only a human being. I said a great many things to him, wondering if he would even be in the garden when I came back. I went away wondering. When I returned from the world of winter sports, of mountain snows, of tobogganing and skis, I felt as if I had been absent a long time. There had been snow even in Kent, and the park and gardens were white. I arrived in the evening. The next morning I threw on my red frieze garden cloak and went down the flagged terrace and the long walk through the wall gardens to the beloved place where the rose bushes stood dark and slender and leafless among the whiteness. I went to my own tree, and stood under it and called. Are you gone? I said in my heart. Are you gone, little soul? Shall I never see you again? After the call I waited, and I had never waited before. The roses were gone, and he was not in the rose world. I called again. The call was sometimes a soft whistle, as near a robin sound as I could make it. Sometimes it was a chirp. Sometimes it was a quick, clear repetition of sweet, sweet, sweetie, which I fancied he liked best. I made one after the other, and then something scarlet flashed across the lawn, across the rose walk, over the wall, and he was there. He had not forgotten. It had not been too long. He alighted on the snowy brown grass at my feet. Then I knew he was a little soul, and not only a bird, and the real parting which must come in a few weeks' time loomed up before me a strange, tragic thing. I do not often allow myself to think of it. It was too final, and there was nothing to be done. I was going thousands of miles across the sea, a little warm thing of scarlet and brown feathers and pulsating, trilling throat lives such a brief life. The little soul, in its black dewdrop eye, one knows nothing about it. For myself I sometimes believe strange things. We two were something weirdly near to each other. At the end I went down to the bare world of roses one soft, damp day, and stood under the tree and called him for the last time. He did not keep me waiting, and he flew to a twig very near my face. I could not write all I said to him. I tried with all my heart to explain, and he answered me, between his listenings, with the faraway love note. I talked to him as if he knew all I knew. He put his head on one side and listened so intently that I felt that he understood. I told him that I must go away and that we should not see each other again, and I told him why. But you must not think when I do not come back it is because I have forgotten you, I said. Never since I was born have I loved anything as I have loved you, except my two babies. Never shall I love anything so much again, so long as I am in the world. You are a little soul, and I am a little soul, and we shall love each other forever and ever. We won't say good-bye. We have been too near to each other, nearer than human beings are. I love you, and love you, and love you, little soul. Then I went out of the rose garden. Nair Giraud's Little Daughter
Prue, said Anno, her sabots clattering loudly on the brick floor, as she moved more rapidly in her wrath. Prue, Madame Giraud indeed, there was a time, and it was but two years ago, that she was but plain Mère Giraud, and no better than the rest of us. And it seems to me, neighbours, that it is not well to show pride because one has the luck to be favoured by fortune. Where, forsooth, would our madam Giraud stand, if luck had not given her a daughter pretty enough to win a rich husband? True indeed, echoed two of the gossips, who were her admiring listeners. True beyond doubt. Where, indeed? But the third, a comely fresh-skinned matron, who leaned against the door, and knitted a stout grey stocking with fast clashing needles, did not acquiesce so readily. "'Well, well, neighbours,' she said, "'for my part I do not see much to complain of. Mère Giraud, she is still Mère Giraud to me, is as honest and kindly a soul as ever. It is not she who has called herself Madame Giraud. It is others who are foolish enough to fancy that good luck must change one's old ways. If she had the wish to be a grand personage, she would not have left our village before this, and have joined Madame Le Grand in Paris. On the contrary, however, she remains in her cottage, and is as good a neighbour as ever, even though she is fond of talking of the carriages and jewels in Madame Le Grand, and her establishment on the boulevard Malcherbes. In fact, I ask you, who of us would not rejoice also to be the mother of a daughter whose fortune had been so good? That is also true, commented the amiable couple, nodding their white-capped heads with a sagacious air. True without doubt. But Anno replied with a contemptuous shrug of her shoulders, Wait until Madame Giraud is invited to visit the boulevard Malcherbes, she said. We have not heard that this has happened yet. She would not go if she were, at least not to remain. Her heart has grown to the old place she bore her children in, and she has herself said to me most sensibly, Law is young and will learn easily the ways of the great world. I am old and cannot. I am better at home among my neighbours. Doubtless, however, in course of time she will pay Madame Legrand a visit at her home in Paris or at the chateau which Monsieur Legrand, of course, possesses, as the rich and aristocratic always do. Doubtless, said Anno grimly, doubtless. Honest Jean Tallow passed us nearby, and went on with stout gravity of demeanour. There is only one thing for which I somewhat blamed Mère Giraud, and that is that, I think, she has scarcely done her duty toward Valentin. He disappointed her by being an ugly lad instead of a pretty girl and she had not patience with him. Law was the favourite. Whatever Law did was right, and it was not so with the other. Though I myself know that Valentin was a good lad and tender-hearted. Once, put in a white cap, I saw her beat him severely because he fell with the little girl in his arms and scratched her cheek. And it was not his fault. His foot slipped upon a stone, he was carrying the child carefully and tenderly enough. You are right in calling him a good lad, neighbour Tallow. He was a good lad, Valentin Giraud, and fond of his mother, notwithstanding that she was not fond of him. Yes, added her companion, but it is a truth that he was a great contrast to the girl. Mon Dieu! His long limbs and awkward body, his great sad eyes and ugly face. While Law, was she not tall and slender and white? like a lily in a garden, and her voice was like the ringing of silver and her eyes so soft and large. As an infant she reminded one of little Jésus, as one sees him in the churches. No wonder that Mère Giraud fretted at the difference between the two, and Valentin was her first. And what mother does not look for great things in her first? We cannot help feeling that something must come of one's own charms, if one has any. And Mère Giraud was a handsome bride. An ugly bantling seems to offer one a sort of insult, particularly at first, when one is young and vain. There was no more beautiful young girl than Lord Giraud at sixteen, said Jean Tallow. And none more useless, said Anno loudly. 
Give me a young girl who is industrious and honest. My Margot is better provided for than Lord Giraud was before her marriage, but her hands are not white, nor is her waist but a span around. She has too much work to do. She is not a tall, white, swaying creature, who is too good to churn and tender creatures who give her food. I have heard it said that Law would have worked if her mother had permitted it, but I don't believe it. She had not a working luck. Mademoiselle Law was too good for the labour of humble people. She must go to Paris and learn a fine, delicate trade. But good came of it, put in Jean Tallow. It proved all the better for her. Let her mother thank the Virgin, then, cried Anno contemptuously. It might not have proved the better. It might have proved the worse. Evil might have come of it instead of good. Who among us has not heard of such things? Did not Mary Gautier go to Paris, too? Ah, poor little one indeed, sighed the white cups. And in two years, added Anno, her mother died of a broken heart. But, said cheerful Jean, somewhat dryly, Law's mother is not dead yet, so let us congratulate ourselves that to go to Paris has brought luck to one of our number at least. And let us deal charitably with Mère Giraud, who certainly means well, and is only naturally proud of her daughter's grandeur. For my part, I can afford to rejoice with her. She rolled up her stout stocking into a ball and stuck her needles through it nodding at the free women. "'I promised I would drop in and spend a few minutes with her this morning,' she said. "'So I'll bid you good day.' And she stepped across the threshold and trudged off in the sunshine, her wooden shoes sounding bravely on the path. It was only a little place, St. Croix, as we shall call it for want of a better name, a little village of one street and of many vines and roses, and orchards and of much gossip. Simple people inhabited it, simple ignorant folk, who knew one another, and discussed one another's faults and grape crops with equal frankness, worked hard, lived frugally, confessed regularly, and slept well. Devout people and ignorant, who believed that the little shrines they erected in their vineyards brought blessings upon their grapes, and who knew nothing of the great world beyond, and spoke of Paris with awe and even with a shade of doubt living the same lives generation after generation, tilling the same crops, and praying before the same stone altar in the small quaint church. It is not to be wondered at that when a change occurred to any one of their number, it was regarded as a sort of social era. There were those in St. Croix who had known Mère Giraud's grandfather, a slow-spoken, kindly old peasant who had drunk his van ordinaire and smoked his pipe with the poorest and there was not one who did not well know Mère Giraud herself, and who had not watched the growth of the little law, who had bloomed into a beauty, not unlike the beauty of the white Provence roses, which climbed over and around her mother's cottage door. Mère Giraud's little daughter, she had been called, even after she grew into the wonderfully tall and wonderfully fair creature she became before she left the village, accompanying her brother Valentin to Paris. Ma foi, said the man, but she is truly a beauty, Mère Giraud's little daughter. She would be well looked to, said the wiseacres, Mère Giraud's little daughter. There is one we must always give way before, said the best-natured among the girls, and that one is Mère Giraud's little daughter. The old curé, the parish, took interest in her, and gave her lessons, and, as Mère Giraud, would have held her strictly to them, even if she had not been tractable and studious by nature, she was better educated and more gently trained than her companions. The fact was, however, that she had not many companions. Some element in her grace and beauty seemed to separate her from the rest of her class. Village sports and festivities had little attraction for her, and, upon the whole, she seemed out of place among them. Her stature, her fair still face, and her slow quiet movements suggested, rather embarrassingly, to the humble feasters, the presence of some young princess far above them. Poof! said a sharp-tongued bell one day. I have no patience with her. 
She is so tall, this law, that one must be forever looking up to her, and I, for one, do not care to be forever looking up. The hint of refined pride in her demeanour was Mere Giraud's greatest glory. She is not like the rest, my law, she would say to her son. One can see it in the way in which she holds her head. She has the quiet grave air of a great personage. There were many who wondered that Valentin showed no jealousy or distaste at hearing his sister's praises sounded so frequently to his own detriment. There was no praise for him. The poor, fond mother's heart, was full of law. Her son had been a bitter disappointment to her, and to her mind was fitted for nothing but to make himself an adoring slave to his sister's beauty, and this the gentle, generous fellow certainly was. He was always ready to serve her, always affectionate, always faithful, and Mère Giraud, who was blind to, or careless of, all his loving, constant labour for her own comfort, deigned to see that he did his duty toward law. He has at least the sense to appreciate her as far as he is able, she said. So, when Valentin, who had a talent for engraving, was discovered by someone who understood his genius and could make use of it, and was offered a place in the great gay city, Mère Giraud formed an ambitious plan. He should take law and find her a position also. She had the fingers of a fair magician and could embroider marvellously. So she trusted law to him, and the two bade farewell to St. Croix and departed together. A month passed, and then there came a letter containing good news. Valentin was doing well, and Law also. She had found a place in a great family, where she was to embroider and wait upon a young lady. They were rich people, and were kind, and paid her well, and she was happy. When they first saw her, they were astonished, wrote the simple, tender Valentin. I went with her to present herself. My employer had recommended her. There is a son who is past his youth, and who has evidently seen the world. He is aristocratic, and fair, and slightly bald, but extremely handsome still. He sat holding a newspaper in his long white fingers, and when we entered, he raised his eyes above it, and looked at Law, and I heard him exclaim under his breath, Mon Dieu! as if her beauty fairly startled him. When the curé, to whom the proud mother showed the letter, read this part, he did not seem as rejoiced as Mère Giraud had expected. On the contrary, he looked a little grave, and rubbed his forehead. Ah, ah, he said, there lies the danger. Danger, exclaimed Mère Giraud, starting. He turned and regarded her with a rather hesitant air, as if he were at once puzzled and fearful, puzzled by her simplicity and fearful of grieving her unnecessarily. Valentin is a good lad, he said. Valentin will be watchful, though perhaps he is too good to suspect evil. Mère Giraud put her hand to her heart. You are not afraid, she said quite proudly, beginning at last to comprehend. You are not afraid of evil to law? No, 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 he answered. Surely not. He said no more then, but he always asked to see the letters, and read them with great care. Sometimes over and over again, they came very regularly, for six or seven months, and then there was a gap of a few weeks, and then came a strange, almost incomprehensible letter from Valentin, containing news which almost caused Mère Giraud's heart to burst with joy and gratitude. Law was married and had made such a marriage as could scarcely have been dreamed of. A rich aristocrat, who had visited her employers, had fallen in love with her, and married her. He had no family to restrain him, and her beauty had won him completely from the first hour. He had carried her away with him to make a prolonged tour. The family with whom she had lived had been lavish in their gifts and kindness, but they had left Paris also, and were voyaging. The name of Law's bridegroom was Le Grand, and there came messages from Law, and enclosed was a handsome present of money. Mère Giraud was overwhelmed with joy. 
before three hours had passed, all Saint Croix knew the marvellous news. She went from house to house showing the letter and the money, and it was not until night that she had cooled down sufficiently to labour through a long epistle to Valentin. It was a year before Law returned to Paris, and during that time she wrote but seldom. But Valentin wrote often and answered all his mother's questions, though not as fluently, nor with so many words, as she often wished. Law was rich and beautiful as ever. Her husband adored her, and showered gifts and luxuries upon her. She had equipages and jewels. She wore her velvet and satin and lace every day. She was a great lady, and had a house like a palace. Law herself did not say so much. In her secret heart, Mère Giraud often longed for more, but she was a discreet, unfarseeing woman. "'What would you do?' she said. "'She must drive out in her equipage, and she must dress and receive great people, and I am not so blind a mother as not to see she will have many things to learn. "'She has not time to write long letters, and see how she cares for me. "'Money, see you, by every letter, and a silk dress and lace cap, she herself has chosen in the boulevard Capuchins, and I must care for myself, and furnish the cottage prettily, and keep a servant. Her wealth and great fortune have not rendered her undutiful, my law. So she talked of Madame Legrand, and so all Saint Croix talked of Madame Legrand. And some, of course, were envious, and prophesied that the end had not come yet, and Mère Giraud would find herself forgotten some fine day, and others rejoiced with her, and congratulated themselves that they knew so aristocratic a person as Madame Legrand. Jean Tallow was one of those who sympathised with her, in all warm-heartedness and candour. With her knitting in her hand ready for action, and friendly unceremoniousness, she presented herself at the cottage door one morning, nodding and speaking before she had crossed the threshold. "'Good day, neighbour Giraud. Any letter from Law this morning?' Mère Giraud, who sat before the window under the swinging cage of her bird, looked up with an air a little more serious than usual. "'Ah,' she said, "'I am glad it is you, Jean. I have been wishing to see you.' Jean seated herself, smiling. "'Then,' said she, "'it is well I came.' But suddenly she noticed the absent look of her friend, and commented upon it. "'You do not look your best this morning,' she said. "'How does it occur?' "'I am thinking,' said Mère Giraud, with some importance of manner, "'I am thinking of going to Paris.' "'To Paris?' "'I am anxious,' shaking her head seriously. "'I had last night a bad dream, and I wish to see Law.' Then she turned and looked at Jeanne most wistfully. "'It is a long time since I have seen her.' "'Yes,' answered Jeanne in a little doubt, but Paris is a long way off. Yes, said Mère Giraud, but it appears that all at once I realise how long it is since I have seen my child. I am getting old, you see. I was not very young when she was born, and as one grows older one becomes more uneasy and obstinate in one's fancies. This morning I feel that I must see my law. My heart yearns for her, and, hastily, she will undoubtedly be rejoiced to see me. She has often said that she wished she might lay her head upon my breast again. It seemed that she was resolved upon the journey. She was in a singular uneasy mood, and restless beyond measure. She, who had never been twenty miles from St. Croix, had made up her mind to leave it at once, and confront all the terrors of a journey to Paris. For there were terrors in such a journey to the mind of a simple peasant, who had so far travelled but in one groove. She would not even wait to consult Monsieur Le Curé, who was unfortunately absent. Jeanne discovered to her astonishment that she had already made her small preparations, had packed her best garments in a little wooden box, laying the silk gown and lace cap at the top, that they might be in readiness. "'I will not interfere at all, and I shall not remain long,' she said only long enough to see my law, and spend a few days with her quietly. It is not Paris I care for, or the great sights, it is that I must see my child. 
St. Croix was fairly bewildered at the news. It heard the next day. Mère Giraud had gone to Paris to visit Madame Legrand, had actually gone, sending her little servant home and shutting up her small trim cottage. Let us hope that Madame Legrand will receive her as she expects to be received, said Anno. For my part, I should have preferred to remain in St. Croix. Only yesterday, Jean Tallow told us that she had no intention of going. She will see wonderful things, said the more simple and amiable. It is possible that she may be invited to the Tuileries, and without doubt, she will drive to the Bois de Boulogne in Madame Legrand's carriage with servants in livery to attend her. My uncle's son, who is a valet de place in a great family, tells us that the aristocracy drives up and down the Champs-Élysées every afternoon, and the sight is magnificent. But Mère Giraud did not look forward to such splendours as these. I shall see my law as a great lady, she said to herself. I shall hold her white hands and kiss her cheeks. The roar of vehicles and the rush and crowd and bustle bewildered her. The brightness and the rolling wheels dazzled her old eyes, but she held herself bravely. People to whom she spoke smiled at her patois and innocent questions, but she did not care. She found a fiacre which took her to her destination, and when, after she had paid the driver, he left her, she entered the wide doors with a beating heart, the blood rising on her cheek and glowing through the withered skin. Madame Legrand, she said a little proudly to the concierge, and the woman stared at her as she led up the staircase. She was so eager that she scarcely saw the beauty around her, the thick, soft carpets, the carved balustrades, the superb lamps. But when they stopped before a door, she touched the concierge upon the arm. Do not say my name, she said. I am her mother. The woman stared at her more than ever. It is not my place to announce you, she said. I only came up because I thought you would not find a way. She could not have told why it was, or how it happened, but when at last she was ushered into the salon, a strange sense of oppression fell upon her. The room was long and lofty, and so shadowed by the heavy curtains falling across the windows that it was almost dark. And then, all at once, someone rose from a reclining chair at the farther end of the apartment and advanced a few steps toward her, a tall and stately figure moving slowly. Who? she heard a cold, soft voice say. And then came a sharp cry, and laurel white hands were thrown out in a strange, desperate gesture, and she stopped and stood like a statue of stone. Mother! 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 she repeated again and again as if some indescribable pain shook her. If she had been beautiful before, now she was more beautiful still. She was even taller than ever. She was like a queen. Her long robe was of delicate grey velvet, and her hair and throat and wrists were bound with pearls and gold. She was so lovely and stately that for a moment Mère Giraud was half awed. But the next... It was as if her strong mother heart broke loose. My law, she cried out. Yes, it is I, my child, it is I, law. And she almost fell upon her knees as she embraced her, trembling for ecstasy. But law scarcely spoke. She was white and cold, and at last she gasped forth three words. Where is Valentin? But Mère Giraud did not know. It was not Valentin she cared to see. Valentin could wait, since she had her law. She sat down beside her in one of the velvet chairs. She held the fair hand in her own. It was covered with jewels, but she did not notice them. Her affection only told her that it was cold and tremulous. You are not well, law, she said. It was well that my dream warned me to come. Something is wrong. I am quite well, said law. I do not suffer at all. She was so silent that, if Mère Giraud had not had so much to say, she would have been troubled. As it was, however, she was content to pour forth her affectionate speeches, 
one after another, without waiting to be answered. "'Where is Monsieur Legrand?' she ventured at last. "'He is,' said Law, in a hesitant voice. "'He is in Normandy.' "'Shall I not see him?' asked Mère Giraud. "'I'm afraid not, unless your visit is a long one. "'He'll be absent for months.' She did not speak with any warmth. It was as if she did not care to speak of him at all, as if the mention of him even embarrassed her a little. Mère Giraud felt a secret misgiving. "'I shall not stay long,' she said, "'but I could not remain anyway. "'I wished so eagerly to see you, and know that you were happy. "'You are happy, my law?' Law turned toward her and gave her a long look, a look which seemed unconsciously to ask her a question. "'Happy?' she answered slowly and deliberately. I suppose so. Yes. Mère Giraud caressed her hand again and again. Yes, she said, it must be so. The good days are always happy, and you, my law, have always been dutiful and virtuous, and consequently you are rewarded. You have never caused me a grief, and now, thank the good God, you are prosperous. She looked at her almost adoringly, and at last, touched the soft, thick grey velvet of her drapery with reverence. "'Do you wear such things as this every day?' she asked. "'Yes,' Law answered, "'every day.' "'Ah!' sighed the happy mother. "'How Monsieur Legrand must adore you!' At length she found time to ask a few questions concerning Valentin. "'I know that he is well and prosperous, as one could expect him to be, but I hope—' Bridling a little with great seriousness— I hope he conducts himself in such a manner as to cause you no embarrassment, though naturally you do not see him often. No, was the answer. They did not see him often. Well, well, began Mère Giraud, becoming lenient in her great happiness. He is not a bad lad, Valentin. He means well. But here she stopped. Law checked her with a swift, impassioned movement. He is what we cannot understand she said in a hushed, strained voice. He is a saint. He has no thought for himself. His whole life is a sacrifice. It is not I you should adore. It is Valentin. Valentin? echoed Mère Giraud. It quite bewildered her, the mere thought of adoring Valentin. My child, she said when she recovered herself, it is your good heart which says this. The same night Valentine came. Law went out into the antechamber to meet him, and each stood and looked at the other with pale face and anguished eyes. Valentine's eyes were hollow and sunken, as if with some great sorrow, and his large awkward frame seemed wasted, but there was no reproach mingled with the indescribable sadness of his gaze. Your note came to me, he said. Our mother... She is in there, said Law, in a low, hurried, shaken voice, and she pointed to the salon. She has come to embrace me to make sure that I am happy. Ah, my God! And she covered her deathly face with her hands. Valentin did not approach her. He could only stand still and look on. One thought filled his mind. We have no time to weep, Law, he said gently. We must go on, as we have begun. Give me your hand. This was all, and then the two went in together, Law's hand upon her brother's arm. It was a marvellous life Mère Giraud lived during the next few days. Certainly she could not complain that she was not treated with deference and affection. She wore a silk dress every day. She sat at a wonderful table, and a liveried servant stood behind her chair. She drove her here and there in a luxurious carriage. She herself, in fact, lived the life of an aristocrat and a great lady, better than all the rest. She found her law as gracious and dutiful as her fond heart could have wished. She spent every hour with her. She showed her all her grandeurs of jewellery and toilette. She was not ashamed of her mother, untutored and simple as she might be. Only she is very pale and quiet, she remarked to Valentin once. Even paler and more quiet than I should have expected, but then we know that 
the rich and aristocratic are always somewhat reserved. It is only the peasantry and provincials who are talkative and florid. It is natural that law should have gained the manner of the great world. But her happiness, poor soul, did not last long, and yet the blow God sent was a kindly one. One morning, as they went out to their carriage, Law stopped to speak to a woman who crouched upon the edge of the pavement with a child in her arms. She bent down and touched the little one with her hand, and Mare Giraud, looking on, thought of pictures she had seen of the Blessed Virgin and of lovely saints healing the sick. "'What is the matter?' asked Law. The woman looked down at the child and shivered. "'I do not know.' she answered hoarsely, only we are ill, and God has forsaken us. We have not tasted food for two days. Law took something from her purse, and laid it silently in a small child's fevered hand. The woman burst into tears. Madame, she said, it is a twenty-franc piece. Yes, said Law gently. When it is spent, come to me again and she went to her carriage. "'My child,' said Mare Giraud, "'it is you who are a saint. The good God did wisely in showering blessings upon you.' A few days longer she was happy, and then she awakened from her sleep one night, and found Law standing at her bedside, looking down at her and shuddering. She started up with an exclamation of terror. "'Mon Dieu!' she said. "'What is it?' She was answered in a voice she had never heard before. Laws, but hoarse and shaken. Law had fallen upon her knees and grasped the bedclothes, hiding her face in the folds. I am ill, she answered in a strange, changed tone. I am, I am cold and burning. I am dying. In an instant, Mare Giraud stood upon the floor, holding her already insensible form in her arm. She was obliged to lay her upon the floor while she rang the bell to alarm the servants. She sent for Valentin and a doctor. The doctor, arriving, regarded the beautiful face with manifest surprise and alarm. It was no longer pale, but darkly flushed, and a stamp of terrible pain was upon it. She has been exposed to infection, he said, this is surely the case. It is a malignant fever. Then Mère Giraud thought of the poor mother and child. Oh, my God, she prayed, do not let her die a martyr. But the next day there was not a servant left in the house, but Valentin was there, and there had come a sister of mercy. When she came, Valentin met her and led her into the salon. They remained together for half an hour, and then came out and went to the sick room, and there were traces of tears upon the sister's face. She was a patient, tender creature, who did her work well, and listened with untiring gentleness to Mère Giraud's passionate plaints. "'So beautiful, so young, so beloved!' cried the poor mother. "'And Monsieur, absent in Normandy, though it is impossible to say where, and if death should come before his return, who would confront him with the truth? So beautiful, so happy, so adored. And Law lay upon the bed, sometimes wildly delirious, sometimes a dreadful statue of stone, unhearing, unseeing, unmoving, death without death's rest, life in death's bonds of iron. But while Mere Giraud wept, Valentin had no tears. He was faithful, untiring, but silent, even at the worst. One would think he had no heart, said Mère Giraud, but men are often so, ready to work, but cold and dumb. Ah, it is only a mother who bears the deepest grief. She fought passionately enough for a hope at first, but it was forced from her grasp in the end. Death had entered the house and spoken to her in a changed voice which had summoned her from her sleep. Madame, said the doctor, one evening, as they stood over the bed while the sun went down, I have done all that is possible. She will not see the sunset again. 
she may not see it rise. Mère Giraud fell upon her knees beside the bed, crossing herself and weeping. She will die, she said, a blessed martyr. She will die the death of a saint. That very night, only a few hours later, there came to them a friend, one they had not for one moment even hoped to see, a gentle, grave old man, in a thin, well-worn black robe, the curé of St. Croix. Him, Valentin, met also, and when the two saw each other, there were barriers that fell away in their first interchange of looks. My son, said the old man, holding out his hands, tell me the truth. Then Valentin fell into a chair and hid his face. She is dying, he said, and I cannot ask that she should live. What was my life, he cried passionately, speaking again, what was my life to me that I should not have given it to save her, to save her to her beauty and honour, and to her mother's love? I would have given it cheerfully, a thousand times, a thousand times, again and again. But it was not to be, and in spite of my prayers, I lost her, oh my God, with a sob of agony. If to-night she were in St. Croix, and I could hear the neighbours call her again as they used, Mère Giraud's little daughter. The eyes of the curé had tears in them also. Yesterday I returned to St. Croix, and found your mother absent, he said. I have had terrible fears for months, and when I found her house closed, they caused me to set out upon my journey at once. He did not ask any questions. He remembered too well the man of whom Valentin had written, the son who was past his youth and had evidently seen the world, the pale aristocrat who had exclaimed, Mon Dieu! at the sight of Law's wondrous beauty. When the worst came to the worst, said Valentin, I vowed myself to the labour of sparing our mother. I have worked early and late to sustain myself in the part I played. It was not from law the money came. My God! Do you think I would have permitted my mother's hand to have touched a gift of hers? She wrote the letters, but the money I had earned honestly. Heaven will justify me for my falsehood, since I have suffered so much. Yes, responded the curé, looking at his bent form with gentle, pitying eyes. Heaven will justify you, my son. They watched by law until the morning, but she did not see them. She saw nothing. Tonight it was the statue of marble which lay before them. But in that early morning, when the sky was dappled with pink and gold, and the air was fresh and cool, and a silence even more complete than that of the night seemed to reign, there came a change. The eyes they had seen closed for so many hours were opened, and the soft voice broke in upon the perfect stillness of the room. The lilies in the garden are in bloom today. They were never so tall and white and fair before. I will gather them for the altar to give to the Virgin at my confession. Mea culpa, mea... And all was over, and Mea Giraud fell upon her knees again, crying as she had cried before, amid a passion of sobs and tears. She has died, my child, the death of a blessed martyr. It was rather strange. The villagers said that Madame Legrand should have been buried in the little graveyard at Saint Croix instead of in some fine tomb at Père Lachaise. But it was terribly sad. Her husband was away, they knew not where and it was Valentin's wish, and Mère Giraud's heart yearned so over her beloved one. So she was laid there, and a marble cross was placed at her head, a tall, beautiful cross, by Monsieur Legrand, of course. Only it was singular that he never came, though perhaps that is the way of the great, not to mourn long or deeply, even for those who have been most lovely and who